After months of delays, it is finally time for my 2022 Blu-ray collection video. Over the last year, I've bought a ton of movies, I've received a ton of movies in my fan mail, so this will by far be my biggest Blu-ray collection video ever. And let's get started. Now as we go into this, I expect this video to be unbelievably long so down below I've got chapter markers for the different letters of the alphabet so you can skip ahead to different sections to find out if I own certain movies or pick up where you left off the last time with that said let's just go for it kicking things off with the numbers section we have three from hell I believe the Rob Zombie film uh, I haven't seen Rob Zombie's films outside of his Halloween movies, thus I have not seen this particular film. The I've heard that some of his other movies are better than his Halloween films, and in particular, I believe that this particular set of films I've heard good things about. Haven't seen any of them yet, but uh, one of these days I need to give him a chance just to see if uh, Rob Zombie can win me over with some of his other work. Then we have... Eight Mile, the Eminem film, and uh, this one I actually saw in the theater when it first came out, and um, it's I, it's not a movie that I would have expected have as much longevity as it's turned out to have, but people still talk about Eminem's films, film eight, or it's called Eight Mile, it came out 20 years ago, people are still talking about it 20 years later, but even given uh, how well it seems to have done in its reputation, kind of surprising he hasn't done more acting. 10 Cloverfield Lane, the second Cloverfield film. And, and I dug it as a nice little paranoia thriller where you don't know exactly what's going on. And then by the end of it, it ties into the Cloverfield mythology in this strange, weird way. And uh, another fun fact, the director of this will be directing the new Predator movie. And they put the teaser out for that just yesterday. So I'm actually excited for it because I thought this is a nice little tense thriller. And so bringing that to the Predator franchise just might work. Moving right along, 10 Things I Hate About You. And uh, this is one of my favorite high school movies, if not my favorite high school movie. Came out when I was a junior, senior in high school. And um, pretty jam-packed cast of like future stars. Obviously, you got Heath Ledger there, but you also have Joseph Gordon-Levitt, who both went on to be in the Nolan trilogy. So just a real fun little high school comedy based off The Taming of the Shrew. Then we have 12 Angry Men, the Criterion Collection Edition. So it's like the fun, fancy version of it. Received this one in my family just a little bit too late because I watched it for my ranking of the IMDb Top 15. So I just watched it and shortly afterwards got like the awesome Blu-ray edition of it. Then we have... 13 Hours, the Michael Bay film based off the real-life events in Benghazi, where John Krasinski transitioned from Jim Halpert to action hero, got jacked for it, grew an awesome beard. I, I think it's a really good Michael Bay film. Just he, he obviously has his faults as a director and made way too many Transformers movies, in particular terrible ones, but he actually can make for visceral, exciting action sequences. So a movie that's all about that, he can do really well. Then we have 21 Jump Street, the reboot remake of 21 Jump Street that nobody asked for that turned out to be actually quite good. And somehow the sequel was also really good. So you just got a pair of really funny, outrageous comedies continuing an 80s TV show that people had kind of forgotten about. Next up, 21 Bridges, the Chadwick Boseman um, action thriller. I actually saw it in the theater when it came out. I believe I have a review of it on the channel, too. I think that's a thing that happened. But I guess one of those movies that um, I enjoyed it enough when I watched it, but I don't remember anything about it actually at this particular moment. It's kind of one of those movies. And we have 28 Days Later, right along with 28 Weeks Later, the twofer of, I guess, zombie post-apocalyptic type movies. Uh, first one with Killian Murphy. That's, I guess, I believe the first thing I saw him in was, was 28 Days Later, and then you had the sequel 28 Weeks Later. I've actually never seen 28 Weeks Later. I need to check it. It's like one of those movies that I like the first one. I think the first one's like a solid little film. And then, for whatever reason, I missed the second one when it came out, and then now I even own it, but I just haven't gotten around to watching it yet. There's always so many things, new things, fresh things, all the reasons to watch things. I haven't seen that one quite yet. Next up, 
30 Days of Night, Josh Hartnett horror one, I believe it, with vampires in it. Well, another one that I haven't been able to catch just yet. I don't, I think I've only heard positive things about it, but um, another one just kind of missed. Then we have 42, another Chadwick Boseman film. This one about Jackie Robinson. And I, I actually like thought, like this was my introduction to him. And I thought his relationship with his wife in the movie was just amazing. The way that they feel like an actual real life couple that are in love with one another, that um, care about each other, that riff on each other, all the fun stuff that real people that are married do. You get that vibe from this movie. And then, of course, it's just the great story of Jackie Robinson uh, as this uh, baseball player that broke boundaries and um, progressed the sport of baseball. Then we have 47 meters down. The shark movie where a couple of girls get stuck underwater. That's actually a pretty effective thriller about people stuck underwater until it gets just goofy at the end of the film where they're trying to figure they're trying to have like a big slam bang finale and there's certain things you want to have happen and the big payoff and shenanigans and the way it actually plays out is like okay you cheated to get all of that you didn't actually have all of that you cheated to do it that was just not as satisfying as one would hope for then we've got the 300 films the first 300 I think is just a great little uh, comic book adaptation that shows the best of Zack Snyder that is an amazing eye, can capture exciting visuals and bring a real aesthetic, a distinct director's vision to a property. It's a very straightforward plot, not a lot of subplots, not a lot of complexity. You just have the battle and you have everything kind of going on with the wife and the politics. That's about it. And it's so effective at pulling that off. And we got our Steelbook version of it right here. So a nice, nice version of it. There's the sequel that came out that I guess is good enough. It's more 300 minus kind of the magic. Like it tries to copy. It's like the sort of thing of Snyder didn't direct the second one. So you have someone else doing it, but you have to fit. It has to fit in the franchise, in which case it feels like a cover song. Someone trying to do Snyder that's not Snyder. And it's, it's a good cover. But it's not the original at the same time. We have The 355 movie came out earlier this year. I didn't catch it when it came out. Then a, buddy, a guy named Daniel Skinner sent this one in my fan mail. He sent me half the movies over here came from Daniel Skinner. So he'd been talking about seeing the movie and I just missed it because I'd been swamped in December because of Spider-Man No Way Home and then Cobra Kai came out and Dexter came out. There's all this stuff that came out right at the end of the year. And so then when a new movie came out, there's this little action thriller that didn't get the best reviews and didn't seem like a lot of people were going to go see it. I missed it. So it's been on my radar to check this one out, but I've just, it's like I've been in a sprint ever since movies started coming out again because all the movies from 2022 got dropped into 2021, back half of 2021 and then 2022. And we're still in that of just like this like sprint of stuff coming out. And so I just haven't had as much time to check out some things. Then we have 500 Days of Summer, just a, a real smart, fun movie about a relationship falling apart and kind of telling their love story and where things fell apart at the same time. It's from Mark Webb and kind of the movie that ended up getting him the amazing Spider-Man films. And... The thing that worked great about his Amazing Spider-Man films was the relationship between Peter and Gwen. And that's that's his thing that he did so well here. And that's if you want a movie that's just has like a lot of the best elements of his Amazing Spider-Man films, check this movie out. Uh, it's it's a good one. Then we have 1408, uh, a movie I haven't been able to check out quite yet. Got it in my fan mail, um, but um, I, I don't have anything to say about it because I have not seen it yet. And closing out our numbers section, 1917, one of my favorite movies from, was that 2019? The years all blend together at this point in time. So just, just a couple years back, 1917, just uh, a special film. Like a, you, with any movie, you want it to be distinct and stand out and be unlike anything you've ever seen before. And that's what 1917 is. It, it plays as a single shot movie of this guy trying to take this message during World War One, And you just follow him in this single take. And sometimes people are like, oh, it's just a gimmick. And like, you, you could tell there was a cut and you know there has to be cuts. What's the point of putting all this effort in if we know that it's all movie magic? Like, 
Yeah, but isn't that true of everything about movies? We we always we know that they're not really doing that stuff. We know it's movie magic. So if one of the tricks of movie magic is to do a single take that just pulls you in and delivers a a unique experience unlike anything you've ever seen before, I'm all for it. Especially like a war movie is a single take. That is a tremendous feat. I mean, it's outdoors, huge sets, sometimes battle sequences with hundreds of extras. That is tremendous filmmaking. And we've made it to the A's. Kicking things off will be Abominable. I really like this DreamWorks film. This one has been played in our house a lot. You know, I didn't grow up with DreamWorks films because you know, the first one came out in the late 90s when I was 17, 18 years old. So I, like, I didn't watch the Shrek movies in my childhood or anything like that because I was a legal adult when they came out. And so for me, there are more ones that I experience with my children, and that's kind of what they're special for me. And uh, this is one that we've had a lot of fun with watching as a family and uh, thoroughly enjoyed. And the way that it uses music, I think, is really neat um, you know, with the way Everest talks and things like that. But yeah, our, our current baby loves that one. Everest, Everest, Everest. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I know what you're saying, the baby. Then About Time. This is one of my wife's favorite movies. She loves this one. Just a nice little rom-com with a uh, a time travel element of sorts, but uh, in, a, in a way that it doesn't try to explain it or anything like that. It's just kind of like, let's just tell a fun story that does wacky wild stuff and just goes for it. And that's what this this movie is. Then <laughs> After Earth, the M Night Shyamalan vanity project for Will Smith or Nepotism the movie, and I actually recently uh, read Will Smith's autobiography and he, and he talks about it a good bit of what what he thought he was doing, his perception on it and like he kind of fully owns like he messed up. Like what he was trying to do, why he was trying to do it. He was just in a wrong place, thinking the wrong way, and the end result was a movie that is fun for no one. It's just none of M. Knight's talent on display, none of Will Smith's talent on display, just a thing that happens to exist. You have American, Sy uh, American Sniper, that's something different. American Assassin, a uh, action thriller with Dylan O'Brien, Michael Keaton, based off of a book. I have read the book, and um, I don't know, uh, enjoyable enough, but also forgettable enough. Um, kind of one of those ones that there's like scenes that are really memorable, but as on the whole, just kind of another movie about a guy with a set of skills out to take out bad guys. Um, and, uh, uh, uh the, yeah. Then we have An American Werewolf in London. I've actually never seen this movie. One of those movies that, like, embarrassingly, I've never seen, and I own it now, got sent it in my fan mail, but I haven't checked it out yet. So I, I need to actually make a list, like, what are the movies, like, I haven't seen that are the classics that I even own? And just once, maybe once a week, watch through one of them. So a year later, I'd made it through 50 of the movies that it's embarrassing that I haven't seen yet. We have an Alfred Hitchcock collection of some of his classics. And, you know, if you guys watch my channel, you know I'm not so much a Golden Age classic film kind of guy. That That's not really my thing. But I, I have seen most of the iconic um, Hitchcock films. The one that's always stood out to me is North by Northwest. It's a little more kind of a political thriller, kind of a little bit more my thing. But yeah, I've, I've seen Vertigo. I've seen Psycho. I've seen The Rear Window. Um, and so one of these days, I probably need to uh, make some sort of series where I do kind of also go through some classics and cover them, probably on my second channel because it's not as much what works well on my main channel. But um, I think that'd be a lot of fun to just kind of stretch me more, help me grow a little bit better and not just lean into what I'm comfortable with as as much. Then we have American Hustle, a star-studded cast based off real-life events of uh, just this wild, crazy scheme of things that, that took place. I don't remember what was that, was it 30, 40 years ago? Um, I don't remember if it's, it looks, it looks 70s, but I, I don't remember. I watched the movie in the theater when it, when it first came out and uh, David O. Russell was on quite the run at the time and so um, they got this whole star-studded cast, but... Um, I remember enjoying it, but it's been a while since I've seen it. Then we have American Psycho and the uncut version. Now, fun fact, I've only walked out of two movies in my lifetime, and one of them was American Psycho right there. And it's not that it was a bad film. It's that uh, I went to go see it on a, as a date with a girl that I met from youth group at church. As it turns out, American Psycho... Not a great movie to take a girl from the youth group to, especially around the time when he hires the prostitutes to have an orgy. 
that got a little bit uncomfortable and we decided to uh, go somewhere else. And so, I, I mean, I've since seen the movie and it's fascinating that like Reese Witherspoon's in the film and it's so unlike what she's normally in. That's a lot of like, Christian Bale's known for doing wild, crazy stuff and Jared Leto's in there and does crazy stuff. But then when you're like, Reese Witherspoon's in that movie? Wh what? Oh yeah, that did happen, didn't it? Oh, there we go. There's our another, another American movie. American Sniper, the Clint Eastwood movie uh, about... Um, real life American sniper who was world class and then kind of died a tragic death. So, um, I, uh, I, I enjoyed the film. It's just kind of an interesting look at this kind of guy that, um, like the effects of war on someone and the journey that that takes them on and things like that. It's another one I saw it in the theater. I haven't rewatched it since then. And so uh, I need to give it another watch to see how, how I feel on it all this time later. We have American Ultra, um, another one that I haven't watched just yet. Got it in my family. It's like been on my radar ever since it came out. I've been curious about checking out this film, but haven't done so yet. And so one of these days I need to make that happen. And Air Force One, the Harrison Ford, I hate this term, but die hard ripoff, die hard on Air Force One with Harrison Ford, Gary Oldman is the villain, a lot of other familiar faces thrown in there as well. And it, it's a, just a great little action thriller. I mean, I, I saw it opening weekend when it first came out, because I saw every movie like this that came out in the 90s. And um, so I've always enjoyed this one. And then we... This is, if you're wondering what was I doing election night 2020 while other people were watching the election results coming in, nervous about who was going to win, I was doing something way more fun than that. I was watching Air Force One and eating that movie up and showing it to my kids because I'm a good parent. Then we've got the Alien Quadrilogy box set. This is a fantastic set right here. This is, you. if you're an Alien fan, you have to have some version of this right there. So right off the bat, amazing packaging, just cool art and everything like that. But it's like the, the definitive history of the making of all the all of the original four films. And so you, you of course have the Blu-rays, but then, I mean, two hours of behind the scenes stuff and the good stuff, like actually, Whatever you're into on the making of movies, you get it with this set. And like, I, I've famously not, or infamously, do not like Alien 3. The behind the scenes stuff on it is amazing. It's amazing. Just all diving into all the versions that could have happened, interviewing a lot of the people that almost made a version of Alien 3. And sadly, David Fincher has disowned the film, so they didn't, weren't able to interview him for it. But just this is the set that you need to have if you're an Alien fan. And so every time I rewatch the movies, which I actually will be doing in the next little window of time for a, a video project coming up in August, um, I go back and I watch all the special features because I just love, love, love this Blu-ray set right here. Speaking of Aliens, we've got the AVP double feature right here. Uh, the first AVP, I, I enjoy enough. Um, as you know, as fan fiction of the Predator and Alien franchises, it's it's fun fan fiction. It's kind of weird with the mythology that they build about these temples and stuff. I dug it. I, don't, I actually don't care that it's PG thirteen. Like I don't need to see blood splatter to enjoy a xenomorph eating people alive. I, I just don't need that. I like it, but I don't need it. The second one, I just find not good. Just a, a movie that I know it's a horror movie, and so it's supposed to be horrifying, but it just goes some places. I just, just off putting and gross what they actually end up doing in the film. So I don't like the second one, and maybe I'll like it more when I rewatch it this time, but uh, we shall see. Then we have Prometheus. I kind of lumped my alien franchise movies all together. So there's P movies in the A. Prometheus, don't like Prometheus. Uh, it's, I, I, I just feel like they lost the narrative, and it's uh, Ridley Scott wanted to make one thing. And then the studio wanted to make an alien prequel. And I don't think they go together. I don't think the movie makes any sense. I think there's just nonsensical plot holes just all over the place. And just such an unsatisfying explanation for where how we got to the xenomorphs while being super pretentious about its philosophy. And then just totally dropping the ball on actual plot mechanics and, and making sense. They have Alien Covenant. Uh, I, I enjoyed it more, but I enjoyed it more simply because it's copying aliens and just throwing in stuff that reminds me of a movie I do like. And so 
It has some of the pretentious stuff from Prometheus that I don't enjoy. Uh, where it goes with some stuff, it feels like they just picked some goofy explanations to resolve the Prometheus stuff. And then it's like a cover of Aliens with 21st Century special effects and the need to crank everything up to 11. Well, it is what it is. Uh, I enjoy it more than Prometheus, but it has all the same problems as Prometheus. Alita Battle Angel. I really like this movie. Um, it has a lot of... It has its issues, certainly. But uh, this is uh, the movie that James Cameron was debating. Will I do Avatar or will I do Alita? Obviously, he did Avatar, but he never stopped wanting to do this movie. So he ended up being one of the people that worked on the script for it, producing it, and then Robert Rodriguez directed it. And Robert Rodriguez, I think, has a very vibrant style for shooting action, and you see that on display here. And so I'd actually much rather have a, a universe of Alita movies than 17 Avatar movies coming out in the next 10 years. But th this is like a, a sci-fi movie, which is like a great mythology. And the lead character, specifically Alita, I love the personality they gave her that she's so childish and naive while being this dangerous warrior. Just a real neat, neat touch. Then we got a pair of Aladdin movies. And when they first announced that they were doing an Aladdin live action remake, I was like, why are we doing this? Then they announced Will Smith is the genie. And I went, that might work. That is a guy that can be just as fun, charismatic as Robin Williams without copying Robin Williams. And I saw the movie and I really dug it. It's a, it's a, it's a Disney movie that I think works to expand in live action. And they did it in some, some fun ways. And then, of course, the original one came out when I was like the fifth grade. I was the perfect age for this movie. I had the tape. I actually had the soundtrack for it, the original version, before when the lyrics were offensive. And uh, so that's the version of the tape that I had growing up. And then, you know, we figured out that certain things were offensive. <laughs> Probably shouldn't do stereotypes like that in your Disney songs. And so they, they changed it eventually. But I, I grew up remembering the ones about cutting off people's hands and things like that. Then we got a pair of American Tale movies, and these are ones that I remember from my childhood. I, my dad's 40th birthday was a wild one, and um, yeah, pretty wild party at my house, and so they kicked all the kids out and sent us across the street, and we watched an American Tale. That's that's my memory of American Tale, was like, my mom's like, you guys can't be at the house while this wild party's going on. Go over there and watch American Tale. So that, that was this one. And of course, you know, I've seen it many times before. And in the, the 80s, Disney kind of slumped until The Little Mermaid revived things with the, the Renaissance. And Don Bluth, who had, had worked for Disney, he left, started Bluth, and he, he put out the actual good animated films at the time. And then the second one, Five Goes West, that one I saw in the theater because um, it, it came out when I was a little bit older. So I remember seeing that one actually in the theater uh, when, it, when it first came out. Here we got American Underdog. This the, was the Kurt Warner story. Uh, I actually saw this one with my mom uh, in the theater last December. And uh, that was a lot of fun taking her to the press screening. Just a nice classic underdog story. And the amazing part, it's a true story. That sometimes... Real stories are even more exciting than the stuff Hollywood screenwriters come up with. So if you're in the mood for just a solid, classic, underdog sports movie, check this one out. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I've been meaning to watch it with my wife. Uh, she wanted to go, go go with me, but we were just too busy at the seasons. That's why I took my mom. Uh, that's why I mentioned taking my mom, because I was going to take my wife. And then I've been meaning to watch it, but as I mentioned before, I get very busy sometimes. Then we have Amores Peros, one of the foreign language films from Alejandro Inarato. I hope I didn't mispronounce this, uh, but one of those films that, uh, foreign language film that won a bunch of awards, kind of got the buzz surrounding him going that led to him end up doing films like The Revenant and becoming this big prestige director, but it kind of started, this is the one that I first remember hearing about with him. Then we have Angel Has Fallen, the third film in the Has Fallen trilogy that, who thought, whoever thought that would turn into a whole trilogy, I guess the fourth one is on the way now. The fun fact about this movie is that I got to interview the director when this movie came out and did a 15 minute interview with him right here on my channel. And that was really cool. I, th I think that was the first interview I ever got to do. And um, talking about real practical stunt work, the guy that directed it was Mel Gibson's stuntman for the Lethal Weapon movies. Just a lot of fun stuff to talk about. So, um, you know, these, they're, they're, I think Gerard Butler is a solid action movie star. I like the genre, so I enjoy these 
they're of course not particularly memorable either. We have Angels and Demons, the second film in the, was it Robert Langdon set of films? Um, feels a bit like a continuing down the same path that the Da Vinci Code was, Da Vinci Code being the first film. I believe in the books, though, Angels and Demons comes first. So I, um, you know, they're, they're, they're like a national treasure that takes themselves way too seriously. So not, not my favorite films, but uh, they, they have some charm to them. We got a couple of Angry Birds movies, and you know, they're fine. My kids enjoy them. They're energetic, and from time to time, the kids are like, let's watch Angry Birds. So they're silly, they're loud, they're easy-to-digest entertainment. We have a movie from last year, Antlers, uh, one that I was invited to, I think, actually multiple press screenings for, but last year got so busy. There was just so many movies coming out that I wasn't able to make it. And I, I heard a lot of people talking about it, a lot of chatter. So someone sent it to me in my fan mail, but I haven't been able to watch it just yet as a recurring theme in here of busy, busy, busy life for me. Man, it's, it's just crazy the way that the little trickle down of 2020 has had where I literally, since March of last year, I've just been felt like I've been in sprint mode constant sprint mode trying to get everything watched for all the new big releases and tentpole films and everything like that and and i guess it doesn't help either that there's a bazil bajillion um marvel disney plus shows and star wars disney plus shows and all this stuff happening dropping in this window of time so huh, i guess of all the things to complain about related to your job that's a good one to have. I have to watch too many movies. Oh man, my life is so hard. That's a good problem to have in life. Then we have the Annabelle trilogy of films. This is such a weird set of, this is a weird trilogy right here because the first one I, is just pretty bad. Totally bland, killer doll movie, all the cliches, tropes and everything like that. And it's followed up by like a period piece, crickety home, like this orphanage that's actually pretty good. And then the third one is then set it kind of in the middle of the Conjuring films as a movie about like a, their daughter and their babysitter. <laughs> They're all like so different from one another, but all about Annabelle. And I think two of them are actually pretty good. And one of them is not. Annihilation. Um, this is one I, I need to give it another watch. I didn't know what to expect when I went into it. And it was a little bit too artsy, a little bit too trippy and weird for me. So I, I was pretty confused by the film when I saw it in the theater. Um, so I need to give it another watch and see if it, it plays differently. I think my wife actually read the book. So that might be fun to watch with her so she can explain to me what's going on since she has read the book. We have Any Given Sunday. This one I actually saw in the theater when it first came out. Uh, fun fact about this one, or maybe not so fun fact. I think it was the first movie in the theater wherever I saw a guy's... Uh, dangling participle, if you know what I mean. Yeah, that was an interesting one. Watching we were like, whoa, that is that guy's thingy-me-doodle right there. That's my, that's my big memory about any given Sunday that tells you my maturity level. 20 years later, that's what I remember. Apollo 13. Now, I, I remember when this movie came out because Tom Hanks was in the middle of just like this awesome run where he had back-to-back -back years of winning Best Actor for Philadelphia and then Forrest Gump. And then the year after that was Apollo 13. And like he was just red hot and everyone was rooting for him. Like, could he do it three years in a row? Can he do it three years in a row? And it was a different era for blockbusters and movie in general because like this serious movie about the actual Apollo 13 mission was a gigantic big hit that was like, had prestige talent to or prestige elements to it, but also everyone went to go see it um, while being serious, like not a jokey movie at all. And just things have changed a little bit. Then we have big old box set for Apocalypse Now, like a, the definitive set with a bajillion discs for all the different versions, all the behind the scenes, all the things you could ever want to dive in and see um, the different, ideas for what this movie could have been, what went on, on during the production of the film. Just one of those movies where the story behind the scenes is as interesting as the movie itself, and the movie itself is one of the great classic films that people are discuss discussed on. Fun fact, in the 70s, before George Lucas's friend Francis Ford Coppola directed Apocalypse Now, George Lucas himself actually really wanted to direct Apocalypse Now. 
the Steelbook for Aquaman. Some pretty designs on there. A ni nice looking Steelbook. I, you know, I've talked about Aquaman many times on my channel and covered it extensively. I have fun with it. It's goofy. It's campy. And that's kind of the appeal of the film. Arrival, the Denny Villeneuve sci-fi film that is just a, a classic sci-fi. Not sci-fi action, not sci-fi adventure, just classic sci-fi about ideas, about technology, and kind of exploring this idea of language, time, perception, playing it out in a really clever way that ties into the plot, but also ties into the storytelling that makes for a finale that pays off really nicely. Armageddon. I've always enjoyed this film. Uh, it came out when I was an upperclassman in high school. It's dumb. It's ridiculous. It's a roller coaster. It's melodramatic. It's manipulative. I, I eat it all up. Everything about that works for me. I'm totally on board for it. A-Team, the remake, revival, reboot, we'll call whatever you want to call it, of the television show from the 80s that I watched quite a bit of back in the 90s. Um... I never. I, this one has never fully clicked for me. I. It's got a great cast with Bradley Cooper and Liam Neeson in there. Fun concept, TV show I enjoy, director I enjoy, but it just never, never fully clicked for me. Then we have the Jumbo Collector's Edition for Avatar with the extended edition, a thousand discs. To, there's like a sleeve and then a booklet and a book in there. So a real fun version of it. Which is ironic since this is a movie that um, I've infamously said that I uh, I saw it in the theater like three times and then didn't watch at home, I believe, until I bought this to, to watch it to cover it for my channel. I am actually excited to rewatch it later this year and I'll, I'll probably do a James Cameron review series and review each of his movies that I haven't reviewed before leading up to the release of Avatar 2, but uh, I'm, I'm excited to give it another watch, and my kids are old enough that they'll, they'll probably watch it with me this time, and we'll see if maybe this time it connects a little bit better with me. That will bring us to the B's, and it occurred to me I took way too long on the A, so I'm going to try and talk a little bit faster here, but that is not my skill set. I like to ramble and tell stories, so... Whew, looks like we're for a very long shoot and video. We got Baby Driver, the Edgar Wright heist movie that is just so much fun. And while the basic premise on paper is the same as any number of other heist thrillers, what makes it special is the Edgar Wrightisms, the lively characters, and of course the way that he incorporated music into the character, the vibe of the movie, and the editing of the movie. It's just true Edgar Wright filmmaking right there. Back to the Future trilogy, we got the 25th edition, uh, 25th anniversary edition right there. And now you think about it, the movie now, this is 10 years old now, they probably have an even better version of it out now with fancier, crazier stuff. But uh, one of my favorite movies of all time, Back to the Future, one of my favorite trilogies of all time. And there's all sorts of fun details about the making of those films and everything that went into it and recasts and things. So nice little set. And what do we have here? We have the Steel Book for Backdraft, the Kurt Russell firefighter movie that came out about 30 years ago now. Wow, the time does fly by. I have not seen that one yet, so I can't say anything interesting or specific about it. We got the Bad Boys collection, all three movies. And I was never like a big Bad Boys fan back in the day. Uh, and then I saw the second one when it came out in theaters because Michael Bay was a big, gigantic deal, and so was Will Smith at the time the second one came out. But I didn't really have big expectations for the third one when it came out back in, uh, was that 2020? It turned out to be the best of all three movies that somehow captured all the things that was good about the first two while adding more kind of layers, depth, and um, emotion to the whole thing. So just a, a really solid addition uh, after... Nearly 20 years. <laughs> then we have a collection of bad Santa movies. I haven't seen the second one yet, but I, I have seen the, the first one. And <laughs> what a bizarre, trashy Christmas movie that can be really, really funny, but exclusively in the most inappropriate of ways. Then we... <laughs> 
we have Barbed Wire, the Pamela Anderson um, comic book movie from the late 90s where she got her barbed wire tattoo and inspired a generation of girls to get barbed wire tattooed around their biceps. I've never seen this movie. I, uh, Daniel Skinner sent it to me in my fan mail uh, about a month back. I, I'm not sure if this is a movie. He's a big fan of or he just saw it. I'm, I don't really know. But uh, Barbed Wire has never been on my radar as a movie like, you know who would probably make for a great comic book movie star? Pamela Anderson. Speaking of movies that Daniel Skinner sent me in fan mail, we have Basic Instinct, the Paul Verhoeven erotic thriller from the early 90s that it was such a different era for films where this movie made an enormous buckets and buckets of movie, and now it's like the type of film they would never even make in the current climate. Now we're going to have about 1,000 Batman movies in a row, starting with Batman the movie. I grew up watching the 1960s Batman films, and, so, and I had this one on VHS recorded off television, so I've seen this movie a ton of times and watched on Nick at Night, the old episodes. Uh, it's fun for me. If you didn't grow up on it, it probably plays very weird and different. Then we have the set of for the... 80s and 90s Batman films, Michael Keaton, Val Kilmer, George Clooney. These were the comic book movies of my formative years, of my my childhood. We didn't have a lot of them. Not not like it is nothing nothing at all like it is today where a new one comes out every two weeks. We got a new Batman movie every three years, and that was very exciting for us. And uh, despite the fact that none of these, I don't think any of these have aged all that well, all of them have their problems. Yeah, some people love Batman Returns, some people love Batman 89. Nobody loves Batman and Robin, not even the people that made it. But, you know, they'll, they'll always have a special place in my heart because they were so pivotal for the genre in my childhood. Speaking of things that have aged well, this one actually has Batman the Animated Series. This is my favorite animated show of all time. And so, naturally, when they put out a Blu-ray set for it, I had to pick that one up. And, um, th like, this is probably the best version of Batman that's ever we've ever had. Uh, just as a continuity, as the storytelling. It's just astounding what they were able to do for a show that was aimed at 10-year-olds. And they had an actual score that was with an orchestra rather than synthesized music. I was just tremendous that Fox allowed this to be created and it's so good it's so mature it's aged so well. if you haven't seen Batman the Animated Series and you like Batman you have to check it out it's it's a tremendous tremendous feat and now we have a great Blu-ray set for it then we have a I think we have two of these Batman of the Long Halloween parts one and two this is a a pair of Films that came out last year based off one of the best Batman graphic novels, The Long Halloween, which also was the one of the big inspirations for The Dark Knight. And this is these animated films they do are direct translations where as much as possible, they just panel is a shot in the movie. The panel is a shot in the movie. The dialogue in the comic is in, in the movie itself. It, it's not an adaptation. It's a translation into film. And so naturally, when you have some of the best source material, you, you have a, a solid product. But you also run into problems when you do that because comics are not written to be scripts for movies. Batman Master of the Phantasm. This is the theatrically released movie from Batman the Animated Series that kind of came right in the middle of the run of it. No one saw it in the theater except my sister and I. We actually went to go see it opening weekend, and it's a great Batman movie. It's got a little bit of origin story in there. It's got a new villain. It's got some classic villains, and it's from Batman the Animated Series, so it's amazing. We have Batman, Mystery of the Batwoman, and this is a direct-to-video film from that continuity. I never thought this one was very good. They, they kind of changed up the animation style. Some things changed as things went along. And by the time they got to this movie, I think this is before Justice League, I believe, and you know, Batman Beyond, I believe this was the last thing they did with that version of Batman before he, he, they did that other stuff. And um, I don't know, I just felt like it had lost something by the end. We got Batman Beyond, Return of the Joker, and this is in the same continuity, but this is like a cyberpunk future version of Batman. And they just found like this really dark way to follow up on some plot lines with some stuff that went down. And um, pretty remarkable how dark they were able to go with that. Of course, we got to have the Dark Knight trilogy. And this is a nice... the At the time I bought it, the best... I think my wife bought it for me, actually. The, the best version of it that you can get where you got 
a nice collector's book to go along with it, collector's packaging, and then the Blu-rays have all of the special features that were available at the time that it came out. And so this is another one, that, especially on Batman Begins, they have some great special features talking about how they wrote it, how they came up with it, and um, what they were trying to do, and even the fighting style that... All that makes the... like I've, I've been pretty critical of the fights in Batman Begins as well as all the Dark Knight trilogy, but you can at least understand where they were coming from. They put a lot of thought into why they did what they did, though I think it was the wrong direction to go. Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice Ultimate Edition. Uh, obviously, a lot of people don't like this movie. A lot of people don't think it works. I've always liked it. I've always defended it. The Ultimate Edition is certainly much better than the theatrical. I, don't, I never watch the theatrical anymore, so I, I probably should watch it again just so I have a point of reference. But uh, the Ultimate Edition is a much better version. But I respect it for what it is, and I think there are a lot of great things in it. A lot of things that aren't so great, but a lot of things that are pretty good. We have Batman Ninja. This is an animated from, from a few years ago. I've been meaning to watch it. Haven't got around to it quite yet. Uh, I bought this actually, I believe, at a Black Friday sale for like five bucks. I was like, oh, I've been meaning to watch it. I'll buy that. And then life happens, and there's just never been that moment like, I want Batman as a ninja. I haven't had that moment yet. We made it past our Batman set. We made it to something just as good as Batman in the Dark Knight trilogy. Beverly Hills Chihuahua 3. The third one, of which is the best of the trilogy, um, as you can imagine. Now, you might think, why do you own that? I bet you never play that. That's never played in your house. You would be wrong. Now, I've never seen it. However, my daughter, Chloe, loves, 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 loves talking dog movies. So, like, when I do, like, live streams, our internet's not very good here, so the kids can't stream, so they have to come up and grab movies from the collection and actually use a disc. What does Chloe grab every time? Beverly Hills Chihuahua. Prior to doing this video, I had to restock this movie because Chloe had pulled it recently to rewatch Beverly Hills Chihuahua 3. In fact, actually, when, um, when she had COVID, uh, when... When she was at, like, we had to lock her up in actually my office because she was sick. She just watched Beverly Hills Chihuahua 3 on loop. All these movies, hundreds of movies. Plus, normally, Disney Plus, Netflix, Amazon, all of it. You got so many, all these things she could choose from. She went with Beverly Hills Chihuahua 3, and she makes that choice a lot. I need to talk with her. A serious talk. This is, this is a problem. Beverly Hills Cop trilogy. Now, the original Beverly Hills Cop is one of the great action comedies of the 80s. Just Eddie Murphy in his prime, full of life, energy, just so witty, so clever, so charismatic, so good. And... It just, like, a simple enough concept that just allowed him to go crazy. And then the, the other one's never fully recaptured that. Second one's a little bit too much of an action movie. The third one is just too much of a not very good movie. It's just cl clearly, like, Eddie Murphy had lost his way by that point in time and um, had, hadn't found, I don't know, well, he lost, he hadn't found, he wasn't Axel Foley the last time he played Axel Foley. Let's just put it that way. But uh, if you haven't seen the first one, absolutely, you got to watch the first one. Big Trouble in Little China. John Carpenter, cult classic from the mid-80s that uh, in certain ways influenced the creation of certain Mortal Kombat characters. It's weird. It's wacky. It's uh, it's like such a combination of so many different things thrown together um, that one of the, that's what makes John Carpenter so much fun that it's not like it makes these totally insane concepts for movies, but he's uh, not afraid to go a little bit weird. Birds of Prey and the Insufferably Long Title or Harley Quinn. I've always dug this movie. A lot of people hated it. A lot of people trashed it, just called it, I don't know, whatever they thought it was. I I never fully understood exactly why people hated it. So you have those movies where you, yeah, I get why some people didn't like this. I understand why people didn't like Batman v Superman. Why that one, people called it pretentious, didn't think it worked convolute I understood that one this one I, I i just always struck me a little bit as is kind of strange the the amount of hate that it, it got um i i always thought it was just a nice change of pace with a certain amount of chaotic energy to it felt like a guy Ritchie movie as a uh in the dceu 
Then we got a pair of Black Christmas movies. I, I've never seen any of them. I received these in my fan mail, I believe, from some neat who will be a recurring name in this video. But I haven't seen any of them, so I can't comment on any of them. Speaking of things I haven't seen, Black Hawk Down. Thinking of movies that's weird, I've never seen Black Hawk Down. How have I never seen Black Hawk Down? But I have never seen Black Hawk Down. Need to put that on that list of movies that I need to watch. Okay. Blade Trilogy. I have seen all of these many, many times. Even the third one that's not very good, I've seen that one a bunch of times, and it's... I don't really have guilty pleasure movies, but I guess you could call that one of my guilty pleasure movies. Um, but move, uh, a set of films, especially the original one, that kind of started to course correct the comic book movie genre. It was a big, gigantic hit, but it was taking this kind of fairly obscure character, certainly not an A-lister, and made a profitable movie out of it by making a, a movie for grown-ups that had cool martial arts and vampires and blood. And then the second one was, was probably even better. Third one wasn't better, but um, movies that kind of helped course correct after Batman and Robin. And we got a couple of Blade Runner films. I actually like Blade Runner 49 more than the, 2049, more than the original one. I, I've, uh, this one's a little bit too poetic, metaphoric for me, and I'm a simpleton that likes things a little bit more direct, and that's what you get in, in that one. But uh, I will be re-watching these ones uh, for something coming up in the near future. So maybe this is the year where I will finally be smart enough to understand Blade Runner. We got uh, The Blair Witch Project. I'm not a big found footage movie, but I think this one's actually pretty effective because it sticks to the concept. So many of them, they're found footage, but they have too much production value. This one feels ultra low budget, feels like it's people carrying a camera. It sticks to the concept. It was early enough in the genre that it was still fresh and original. So I, I think that one's actually pretty effective. Then we have a, a three piece of... Blumkamp films. Now, I, I got this set years ago, meaning to watch them, and I was going to do a, a ranking of all of his movies when his new film came out. And he had a new movie come out last year, and I was planning to finally watch through all of these and do a ranking, and then there was no buzz for his new film, and the early reviews were just terrible, and I was like, okay, this isn't the right time to do that ranking. But I did finally watch District 9. I didn't watch the other two, but I did watch District 9 for the first time. And what a film. Man, that guy started off with something pretty cool. And it was so brutal. Like the first 30 minutes, I was like, what is this movie? And why are people talking about, why are there such big fans of it? This is just like, I feel sick in my stomach. This is, oh, what a brutal, brutal, brutal film. And then the plot really starts to kick in. I was like, oh, oh, wow. This is a pretty cool little movie. Wow. Oh man, what a great sci-fi film. This guy's hopefully going to have a great future. And then he hasn't quite lived up to that apparently. But so as for my, it's a pretty cool little package that it has the, just like, booklet deal, all the films. So nice little set right there. I thought it had a sleeve to it. Maybe I lost that. Maybe I'm lying. Maybe I got confused. Bohemian Rhapsody. Now, good enough little queen movie. Some people absolutely loved it. Some people didn't love it. I was just shocked it got nominated for Best Picture. I don't know how that happened. That I thought that was crazy that this movie's nominated for Best Picture. It's fine. I enjoyed it, but Best Picture, that seemed a bit extreme. Now, these are a couple of fun ones. Uh, Bond Cop, Bad Cop 1 and 2. They're Canadian um, uh, buddy cop movies. And so kind of more regional, more... Uh, and that's one of the things that, like, uh, Hollywood movies these days are made for the global market. And so what that means is that you, you kind of take out a lot of specificity that won't be will be understood by other cultures. So they're designs, they can be hits around the globe. And you lose a lot when you do that because it's no longer like an American film. It's a movie for the world to make tons and tons and tons of money. And so this, what's fun about these is they're actually kind of regional films a little bit that have a flair to them that feel distinct to a place, a location, and a culture. And um, so it's just a nice little, nice little touch there. Okay, then we have a confusing batch of different sets of James Bond movies uh, where I, I have even more, but because I like bought them in batches over years and then finally when No Time Did I was coming out, like, all right, I'm going to watch all of them. I just need to go ahead and get the set. So in here we have 4Ks, uh, 4Ks for Daniel Craig movies, but without No Time to Die because I bought this before No Time to Die. So 4Ks for several of them right there. 
Then we have No Time to Die, the 4K edition. I, I really enjoyed No Time to Die. That was a nice closeout for the journey that they had been taking this version of the character on. And then we have this gigantic jumbo co James Bond collection that uh, has Blu-rays, not 4Ks, for all the movies up until 2015, which now feels like the collection missing one movie. <laughs> like it, could, it would, it's like it's not even a good bookmark for where it's at. This is the tricky thing with these franchises that go on forever and ever and ever. You have to, at some point in time, you put out your collection and then it's immediately uh, out of date. And they thought he was done. They thought he was leaving. Nope, he came back. Um, another one's where we got a little bit of a tricky situation here. We got the Born Films, the definitive spy franchise of the Zeros. This is a fun one. I, it, I, bought the, I bought the collection. Whoops, something fell out there. Actually, I know exactly what fell out there. I bought the, co co this collection came out, it was designed for when Jason Bourne was coming out. And so then it has this booklet with each of the original run of films. And then it has like a section in the back for the new one where they put a fake disc in there. To, to hold the spot for it so that when this came out, you could take the disc out and put it in here, which I think I actually... No, I did not do that. There's something in there. What is in there? So you have so many movies and different versions of them, sometimes you get confused. I do I do have one in there, but... Um, so I guess I have too many copies of it, I guess, but recurring theme sometimes. Um, but anyway, the definitive spy franchise of the Zeros and when they tried to bring it back, it didn't work so well because the zeitgeist had changed just a little bit too much. Braveheart, classic 90s war film, freedom film, Mel Gibson film. Um, just amazing movie. One of the early best picture films I got to see in the theater, early rated R film I got to see. Love, love, love Braveheart. If you haven't seen Braveheart, go watch Braveheart. Bridesmaids, a comedy. I, I love this movie. I like this movie more than my wife does. Um, I just, such a fun, loud movie that actually kind of understands people and has a central character that has an actual arc and journey that she's on. Uh, Bridge to Terabithia. I believe I read the book in elementary school, but I have not seen the movie yet, so can't comment on it. And I actually don't remember what happened in it. We got Bullet to the Head, a uh, Stallone action thriller from, I don't know, around 10 years ago. It actually has Jason Momoa in it in an early uh, movie role where he was starting to kind of get his momentum, but before he was movie star guy. So, um, I don't know, pretty straightforward kind of action thriller type film. Not much to say about it. And then we'll close out our bees with Bumblebee, the last Transformers movie as of right now, kind of a spinoff about Bumblebee with Hailey Steinfeld and John Cena. And I, I think maybe the best of the Transformers movies that was, you know, a a girl and her dog movie, except Bumblebee being the dog, and just a sweet little story that I, I thought worked, had the action adventure he wanted, but more more character-based than the other Transformers films. We've made it to the seas. First up, Candyman. Now, this one was sent to me in my fan mail, as well as the second Candyman from some neat. It was a first time watch for me. I'd never seen this before uh, traditionally. And then I watched it uh, leading up to the remake that came out or reboot cool, whatever that one, whatever category it falls into, really dug it. I thought that this was just a, a nice little film, a pleasant surprise of a movie that had a distinct style was so different from any other kind of slasher with its this kind of gothic romance to it, the way the story worked, the aesthetic to it, the score, everything was just felt so different from the rest of the genre while delivering the things that you want from the genre. So really enjoyed this film. And this is the Scream Factory edition of it. And so then it ha also had some real cool special features. And so I tried to do a bit of a deep dive into it and kind of hear them discussing the making of it, Tony Todd talking about it, reflecting on it, things like that. So that was, that was a lot of fun to kind of d dive into that world. Then we have the sequel to it, Farewell to the Flesh, that was um, more Candyman, just not as memorable. Um, not the disaster that was the third film that uh, I have, a, he, some neat sent me the, the DVD for it, but I, this is just Blu-rays and 4Ks, but um, this one was just forgettable. The third one was a disaster. Now, the remake or reboot, whatever you want to call this one, 
I, I wasn't really a fan of it. And a lot of it came down to the movie was just so heavy handed with its messaging. Now, it's not that the original was subtle, but this one, like literally the movie starts off with people talking about the racial implications of gentrification. Like that's what characters like sitting around in their living room, like talking about racial implications of gentrification, just as one does, of course. It's like, wow, this is heavy handed. And then the lead character is a, uh, paints about social justice. And it just felt like everything was so on the nose and then where it goes in the third act in the finale is even more so like, wow, you, you're just taking any subtlety, anything out of it. And you're just telling me exactly what you think about this. You're not exploring an idea through story. You're just stating it. And I, I just thought that was really disappointing because the aesthetics are, to it are phenomenal. The actual where they kind of went with it. I, it didn't it did not work for me. Here's a fun one. Captain America 1990. As discussed in here before, I grew up in an era where we didn't have a lot of comic book movies. In which case, when this one came on HBO late at night, when we, during free trial weekend of HBO, I recorded it on a VHS tape. So this was one of the few comic book movies I had. I had my Batman movies on VHS that I bought, and then I had this one recorded off of television. So it's, it's like a terrible movie. It is. It's not good. But it... I have so much nostalgia for it. I I enjoy it a lot while knowing it's not very good. And so then this is a, a Shout Factory Blu-ray for it, in which case they got some special features, interviewed the guy that played Captain America, which is kind of interesting. The guy that plays Captain America in this is the son of J.D. Salinger, the writer of The Catcher in the Rye. So his son went on to be Matt Salinger, went to be an actor, and he's, he's still an actor. He still shows up in things, but he played Captain America, the guy that wrote the son of the guy that wrote The Catcher in the Rye, which is... Pretty wild the way the world works sometimes. We got Captain Underpants. And, uh, you know, my kids have always kind of enjoyed this movie since they watched it. But now they're they're old enough that they read books. And so they kind of read the books and stuff. So it kind of has a new extra layer to it now that they're they're diving into that, that world of things. As for me, it's less annoying than some other things that are out there that they could be watching. We got the uh, Cars movies. Uh, second one in 4K because you want only the best quality when watching the best of Pixar films. But yeah, the Cars movies, um, you know, I, I, I was kind of late to some of these movies because you know, in 2006, I was uh, about to get married. I was in college. It's like a pretty just crazy. Or I guess in, two, yeah, 2006, I got engaged. What? Part of the, when did when did it happen? You get old enough, you start getting confused. Yeah, got engaged and married in two two thousand and six. But um, I wasn't rushing out to go see Pixar movies at the time. I was just kind of in that window where I didn't see a lot of animated films, so I was a little bit late to the party on them. So uh, there are movies I've more experienced as someone that has kids and watched them with my kids. And um, because other movies have come out since then, Cars have never been the one that my kids have just rushed towards. The, actually, the thing with them that they, they did dig was the Major's Tales. They watched those on loop for a, a time period. Casino, the Martin Scorsese film. I haven't seen this particular Martin Scorsese film. A bunch of people are trying to get me to do a Martin Scorsese ranking for all the obvious reasons. He's one of the great directors of all time. And he probably has a new movie coming out this year. That's a tough ranking to do because he's got a 50-year-long career and his movies are all heavy and long. Those are those are tougher to do than some other ones. Like slasher franchises, super easy to watch. Even if there's 10 slasher movies you got to watch, they're all short and they're all cotton candy, pretty easy to just put on whereas you got to you got to like process those. So, I really hope to have a Martin Scorsese one when his new movie comes out. I really hope to do a ranking. You guys are sending me the movies we're making it ha like it's it's in the realm. I just need to have a, a long plan. I need to like a six month plan to make it happen. Like watch one per week for six months, something like that. Uh, but even that's tough to do to, to be consistent. That Catwoman. Uh, this is a, a comic book movie that certainly I would say falls into the so bad it loops back around and becomes good again because it's so ludicrous. It's literally about an evil makeup company. Company like that's a woman superhero. She works at a makeup company. Really? That's what you came up with? Yeah, and that's the villain, is the makeup company. She has evil makeup that if you use too much of it, you turn into a supervillain. That's the plot. And from there, it only gets weirder and wackier. So, uh, not good. 
but certainly an experience. Chaos Walking, this was such a disappointment last year. I was actually kind of excited for this one. My wife has, has read this, this set of books, um, but uh, and, and she wasn't a gigantic fan of them, but there's an interesting concept in it that potentially could be interesting. It's from Doug Lyman, who did Born Identity, Edge of Tomorrow, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. He, he's done a bunch of really good stuff. And of course, you have Tom Holland and Daisy Ridley, and then the movie sat on the shelf for years. And not just because of COVID. And the rumors were like, this movie's unreleasable. And they just, they can't figure out what to do with the concept. Because the concept is, basically, it's a planet where every guy's thoughts are just on display behind him. Whatever he's thinking, it kind of appears as this noise behind him. And there's no girls on the planet. Or, is there no girls on the planet? There's not, maybe there's no girls on the planet. I think there's no girls on the planet. In which case, then Daisy Ridley shows up. She's a girl. And so then you have this young boy that sees his first girl... And so how do you do that in a way that's not annoying? How do you do that in a way that rings true but doesn't make your movie rated R or worse? And the end result was not great. It has some moments, but it's not great. And you also you're watching it, and it's pretty clear that they thought they were going to make three movies, and then they went, we can't make three movies. I don't think this is going to work. And so in reshoots, they just changed the ending. To resolve everything. It leads up to this point in time where it's supposed to set up the second book and instead everything's just resolved. With the most obvious reshoots you've ever seen in your life. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, the Johnny Depp version of the film. This one I only saw, I've only seen it one time. And I don't know, it felt like it was trying too hard to give Willy Wonka daddy issues and explain him like not everybody needs an origin story not everybody needs to be explained and apparently next year we're getting another origin story for Willy Wonka so okie dokie that'll bring us to a couple of amazing Charlie's Angels films I, I don't think I saw either one of these in the theater um, they, they kind of came and went and then I've watched them a few, few times over the last 20 years and did a ranking whenever the remake came out they're they're stupid they're fun and entertainment in the background. Nothing terribly memorable. Chasing Mavericks. This is one I just got in my, my fan mail this last month. Uh, so I haven't had time to check it out yet. I don't know anything about this movie. I don't think I'd heard of this movie until I opened my fan mail and it was in there. So uh, I'm curious about it simply because it is a movie that has Gerard Butler in it. And I have no idea what it is, but that's what I, I just received. <clears throat> We have Chef, a film from John Favreau, where after he had spent like a decade doing big franchise films and kind of having some significant disappointments in there with Iron Man 2 and then, of course, Cowboys and Aliens underperforming dramatically, he went and did Chef and did this real small movie about a great chef that had been getting great reviews and then kind of lost his way and started getting bad reviews and needed to do something smaller and more personal to remind himself what he loved about cooking again, which is like what John Favreau was doing with filmmaking. Great little film. Uh, this John Favreau is one of these guys that he doesn't necessarily have this one distinct style for how he directs, but he is like, he's like a journeyman director. That's really good. at A lot of things. He did elf iron man, the jungle book and something like chef, all of them really good. There's several of them aren't so good, but just can do so many different things and be successful at it. Then we've got the Chucky 7 movie collection. And this is one that I didn't really watch these growing up. They came on TBS and they kind of freaked me out a little bit. They're like my big memories of like, I believe the opening sequence of two I saw on television a few times. I just really remember the opening kill in the backseat of the car and the bag over the head and stuff like that. But, um, I hadn't watched a lot of them until I had my channel and I've kind of watched through them and kind of started to enjoy the, the Chucky character quite a bit more. And it's a weird franchise because it just changes so dramatically over the years from where it started to what it turns into with Bride and then where it goes from there gets even weirder and wackier. We got the remake from a few years back. I, I dug it. I think the biggest thing holding it back is actually it was called Child's Play. If they said, hey, we're, we're doing kind of like an homage film, heavily inspired by Child's Play, taking the concept in a different direction, but a killer doll that very much has that similar vibe to it, as opposed to being an actual remake, I think it would have been better better received because I think it does bring a lot of new stuff to the table and it's it's a very different concept of what Chucky is. Whereas Ch Chucky and this is a, is an actual serial killer that's in a doll through voodoo, 
that's not what it is in this. It's that it's a very very different setup that has the Chucky doll killing people. So I think that was the thing that really worked against that one. Christmas Story, the classic Christmas movie. Uh, you know, I, I I've mostly watched it every Christmas for the last my whole life, so 40 years now. So one of those movies, you've seen it 30 plus times or something like that. So many memorable little sequences, so many iconic moments, um, and a good time. Speaking of Christmas movies, a Christmas Vacation, and uh, another one of those movies that you put on most Christmases. My, my wife hates Clark Griswold, so she doesn't ever want to watch it, but she doesn't like him because he's always checking out the the ladies and doesn't like that about him. So she's not a fan of those. So we don't we don't watch it all that often. But um, I've always gotten a kick out of the the vacation films and Chevy Chase in his prime. Christopher Robin, the Winnie the Pooh continuation with a grown up Christopher Robin. Uh, it, it's a good movie. It's sentimental. Has, has a lot of the feels. I feel a little bit like it has the problem of taking something that works great at one runtime and then trying to make a movie that's twice that runtime. Uh, you look at the classic Winnie the Pooh movies, they're, like, they're literally like an hour and five minutes, and then you make this movie that is, uh, instead of that, it's 104 minutes. So 40 minutes longer than those other ones, and you just kind of feel feel that a little bit in there. So I, I know some people absolutely love this one. Maybe it's because I'm, I'm not a gigantic Winnie the Pooh person that it wasn't necessarily for me, but um, not crazy about that one. Cinderella, I thought not a nice little... Live action remake from Kenneth Branagh that just captures the magic, the energy, the, the, everything like that, while properly updating it and ha having its own story to tell. Cliffhanger, classic, uh, Stallone uh, action thriller. In that category, I don't really like. Die Hard on a Mountain this time with a mountain climber. And it has uh, Michael, uh, Michael O'Rourke in it, Yondu. A young version of him working with Stallone, which is fun because it makes Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 actually a reteaming of the guys from Cliffhanger. John Lithgow is just this villain that just chews up every scene. Because Stallone is so known for Rocky and Rambo, it's easy to forget he's got some other ones in there. Cliffhanger, he had, he had a little bit of a lull in the late 80s, early 90s, and then with Cliffhanger, Demolition Man, he had a real strong comeback. Uh, if you haven't seen that one, it is Rennie Harlan directed it in Rennie Harlan's prime. Clockwork Orange, classic, disturbing Stanley Kubrick film that really messes with you a little bit um, with what it does with its characters, the journey it takes on, and what make what it makes you feel by the end of the film. Uh, just you're disgusted by these characters at the beginning, and then it makes you kind of feel sorry for them at the end. Just I, I need to rewatch it. It's been a long time since I checked it out. And movies play differently you with, with different with you at different phases of life. That's one I, I really need to check out. Needed I need to do a Stanley Kubrick ranking at some point in time too. It's just tough when there he's obviously not going to have any new movies coming out. And videos do best when they're tied to something that sparks people's interest in that category. If I drop them just randomly, they can kind of disappear into the algorithm. And so that's one of the reasons why something like that, I haven't done it because there's no particular time to do it right now versus a year from now versus three years from now, but someday I need to. Cloverfield, the original one, another rock solid found footage movie, probably because it's directed by the great Matt Reeves, the guy that just did The Batman, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, and the movie that kind of really put him on the map as a director is Cloverfield. A lot of people thought it was a J.J. Abrams film because it was promoted using J.J. Abrams' name and his Bad Robot studio. But the actual guy behind it is Matt Reeves, which ironically now, Matt Reeves is kind of loved by fandom for Apes and Batman. J.J. Abrams is kind of on the outs with them because of Rise of Skywalker. Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Never seen it. Um, which is funny because it's a Lord and Miller film. And I praise the Lord Miller animated films. I've only heard great things about it. My kids have seen it. They have said great things about it. But I haven't actually watched it yet, which is silly because it's right there. And um, there's only reasons why I should have. Coco, the Pixar film. My wife loves this one. She's, this is one of her favorite Pixar films. Maybe her favorite Pixar film. I, I, I thought it was a little bit predictable. I felt like I was guessing what was happening ahead of time. You know, obviously I'm not the target audience, so maybe there's a lot to that. But um, yeah, rock, great little film though. I'm not not knocking some people. I can I can have it like mid middle of my Pixar ranking, and people get so how dare you have this? Like it's Pixar. Seventy five percent of their movies are B pluses or better. It's a great studio. It's in the middle of the pack. I still think it's very good. How dare you? 
Cold Pursuit. Now, this is a, on paper, it's just another Liam Neeson revenge thriller. But it has this really bizarre, like, self-referential humor to it that just makes it... It's And it's also done in chapters. It's stuff to describe. Like, you have to watch it to really understand what it is because it has this very dry sense of humor as a film. Where it, on the one hand, it plays like a straight revenge movie and then a guy will like use a parachute to go from one mountain to another and accidentally land in a wood chipper and then it'll like just move on it, it, it like it, that'll happen and then a card pops up like referencing the character died like it, it just kind of happens it's so bizarre but a nice little addition to the um liam neeson revenge thriller genre collateral i haven't seen this movie Another one. Like, I can't believe I haven't seen it, but I still haven't seen it. I need to fix that. Collateral. Another movie I still haven't seen. Actually, I'll pull this one out. I didn't realize we got a... Sometimes as I do these, I realize I've got the 4K in there. So people are really trying to get me to watch this movie. And so they sent me the Blu-ray and then they replaced it with the 4K. So we'll keep the 4K in the collection and the Blu-ray is right over there. And then speaking of movies, I need to watch that... This is one that... Uh, Cody Leach has been telling me about for years the collector and the collection and it's from some of the guys that worked on the Saw movies and not some of the better Saw movies and then they went on and did these that Cody has said are quite good I had not watched them yet they've been on my radar forever they almost did a third one and then COVID happened and, and apparently they they don't think they're actually going to be able to finish it which is unfortunate but one of these days I just need to sit down and make that happen Commando Peak Campy Schwarzenegger just one-liners over-the-top ridiculous action every 80s cliche thrown into one movie in the best way possible if you haven't seen Commando you're missing out Commuter a super duper duper generic um Liam Neeson thriller this one it's from the same director that did what's the plain one I'm blanking on the name of the plain one it's unstoppable is that something different non-stop and uh, it's from the same director, and it's the same basic premise, just a different vehicle. I just, I, I don't understand why they made the same movie twice in like two years. It was very weird. Got a couple of Conan films. I almost was going to do a Conan ranking last year. I was in a Conan move, mood, and so then watched uh, Destroyer and Barbarian, the original Barbarian with Schwarzenegger. And um, then I tried to, I didn't, I just did, decided not to do it, but bought all of them to make it happen and it didn't happen but you know the the Schwarzenegger ones are classics the movies that really launched him into stardom and then the remake or readaptation with Momoa should be so much better than this I got Stephen Lang as the villain great choice Jason Momoa as Conan also great choice movie itself didn't really work Con Air great little stupid 90s action movie with Nicolas Cage. After he won an Oscar, he did a trilogy of action films. The Rock, Face Off, Con Air, all three of them, 90s action movie classics. All three of them very different from one another. The one that I've watched the most times is in fact Con Air, not The Rock. The Rock's probably the one that's best remembered. Um, that's the one I've watched the most. And a large part of that is that my mom really likes Con Air. She apparently doesn't understand the plot of the movie and thinks he's just trying to get home to his wife and daughter, which he is, but then he doesn't get off the plane because he's trying to help his friend. The plot of the movie is about him trying to help his friend, not about trying to get wife home to his wife and daughter. So, Anyway, but yeah, my mom... We actually have pillows of his face when he gets off the bus and he kind of does this in the air. We have pillows of those in our house, actually. That's how important this movie is to us. We got uh, uh, a trilogy of Conjuring movies. I think this is just a great set of horror films that the thing that elevates them, two things that elevate them. James Wan is a director. The Warrens is lead characters. They just feel like real people. I mean, obviously the Warrens are real people. They're based on real life events. How true? I don't know where they con people. I don't know. But they're real people, but... Um, it, it, they just play that way in the film, which doesn't always happen. And then James Wan, of course, as a director, uh, is top notch. 
Copland. This is a James, old, early James Mangold film with a phenomenal cast with uh, Stallone playing against type in it as kind of a loser cop. He decided to, he gained like 40 pounds of fat for the role. And he said it was the, the easiest diet he ever went on because he just ate ice cream all day long. And he's, and he's um, playing in this town where he's the sheriff at a town of cops and they're corrupt. And he realizes he has to take them down and finally be the hero. And if you haven't seen it, that's one to check out. Cowboys and Aliens. We just talked about this one recently when Chef came around. A movie that it's from John Favreau. It has James Bond and Indiana Jones as cowboys battling aliens. And somehow it feels kind of dull, kind of lifeless. Doesn't really work. So one of those movies where everything about it seems like it should come together. And then it doesn't. Crank. This is the other movie I walked out of. Same basic concept of why I walked out of American Psycho. I went to go see it thinking it was going to be like The Transporter because it stars Jason Statham, took my wife while I was in Bible college, and we were expecting PG-13 Transporter, and instead we got Grand Theft Auto the movie on Red Bull. <laughs> so we left. I've re rewatched it since then. I was like, okay, I kind of appreciate this, but still not really my thing. Crawl. Now, this is a, a nice little self-contained thriller about people trying to survive what is it I don't remember, was it alligator trying to eat them in the basement of their house in the crawl space while a flood is coming in and just simple concept effective thrills um trying to survive and all the little things that kind of go could go wrong in that situation do so just real simple concept done right crazy rich asians uh one of the Maybe the best uh, rom-com of the last five, ten years. Just solid film. And I think the thing that kind of elevates it is that it it the conflict in it isn't based off of a silly, goofy premise like so many rom-coms of the 90s and zeros. It's based off actual kind of cultural differences and misunderstandings of different generations. And it just makes it ring true while still being romantic, still being funny. Crazy Stupid Love, um, uh, top-notch top cast for, I don't know, it's kind of romantic, kind of sad, a bunch of different things together, all about this idea of love and love falling apart, love being found in strange places, and midlife crises, young love, all of it thrown together, um, and this thing that is love that we all experience in different ways. Creature from the Black Lagoon, one of the classic 1950s monster movies. I believe I saw it way, way, way back in the day that um, I used to read the books on them. I'd get them from the library and read about the monster movies, but I actually haven't seen all of the ones that I even read books about how they're made. Crime Wave, the second movie from Sam Raimi and uh, probably his worst movie that he ever did. And... Um, by the time you watch this, I will have put out my Sam Raimi ranking. I've already shot it, but I think it'll come out the day after I, this food video to shoot is obviously going to obviously going to take a very long time, and so it's going to take up my whole day. So I couldn't finish getting this one edited to be posted today. So it'll post tomorrow. But for you, that will be in the past, or maybe you're watching this a year from the future, in which case it posted a year ago. Regardless, bought this one to check that one out and um, got the. Uh, Shout Factory edition, so it has a bunch of fun special features about... Well, actually, it doesn't have that many special features. It has a few interviews on it, a couple behind-the-scenes things, but it's kind of a movie where it was a big learning experience for Bruce Campbell and Sam Raimi as they realized, oh, movie making with a studio is very different from movie making when you're a 20-year-old that raised money on your own to make a Cabin in the Woods movie about people getting possessed. Um, and yeah, it's, it's like a slapstick movie about hitmen that... Just doesn't really work. We got Crimson Peak, the Guillermo del Toro film, and this is the Criterion edition, so nice and fancy. Some people are trying to get me to do a Guillermo del Toro ranking. Hopefully that will happen whenever I think Pinocchio is his next movie. Hopefully that can happen if the timing of its release is quite right. I have not seen Crimson Peak, so I can't comment on it. We got the uh, uh, Crocodile Dundee trilogy. Now, the first two movies in there are just 80s classics. I've never seen the third one where he goes to L.A., but I've seen the first two so many times. I watched them all the time back in the 90s. We got Kronos, an early Guillermo del Toro film. Once again, Criterion Collection Edition. Another one that if this Guillermo del Toro ranking happens... Be checking that one out, hopefully, sometime in this next year. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, the... Uh, 
prestige martial arts film from about 20 years ago that um, uh, kind of brought to the mainstream the wire foo work that was so prominent in the 90s of uh, Hong Kong cinema. And it was used in The Matrix, but you didn't play differently in The Matrix because of the sci-fi concept. And then this was kind of a very much what a lot of stuff in the, the Hong Kong had been like, but as a prestige film that got Oscar buzz nominations, stars Michelle Yeoh. And um, so was, this was really exciting for me because I was really into Hong Kong cinema at the time and loved Chow Yun-Fat's movies with John Woo's action movies, and then Michelle Yeoh with her work with Jackie Chan and the Big Unit Bond film, and then they got prestige love. Then we finally have The Curse of La Llorona, um, one of the random Conjuring spinoffs, not one of the better ones. Raymond Cruz is the standout in it as this guy with this dry sense of humor, but mostly a forgettable Conjuring spinoff film. That'll bring us to the D's, and we have Daredevil, the Ben Affleck edition, and this is the director's cut. There are two different versions of this movie, and they are very different. It is very much comparable to, like, Batman v Superman, where the Ultimate Edition very much changes the feel of the movie. This one even more so, because they cut 30 minutes out of this movie, and the movie was like two hours, 10 minutes. They cut it to an hour, 40 minutes. And so that 30 minutes, it's like a third of the runtime. And it's like whole subplots that add detail about Matt Murdock and him actually being a lawyer trying to save Hell Kitchen as a lawyer, <clears throat> not just as the devil of Hell's Kitchen. This movie gets hated on a lot. Um, I think a lot of that's undeserved. It's... It was never great. It's still not great. And it hasn't aged well because the genre has gotten a lot more sophisticated. But at the end of the day, I don't think it's nearly as bad as people make it out to be. And I think it has a lot more to offer than people give it credit for. And the things people normally pick on are normally the wrong things. Like the playground fight, that's stupid, but it's not that big of a deal. Or Bullseye, which who cares? Like what I get it. They're cheesy, they're dated, they don't they don't hold up well in the current climate of where the genre's at. But those aren't even the problems with the movie. Those are just superficials. Those are stupid scenes, little stupid choices. But um I, I think it works better than most people give it credit for. <clears throat> We have Dark Man. Actually, let's go with the Dark Man and Dark Man trilogy. Got that Raimi ranking we just talked about just a couple minutes ago. So I bought the actually the Shout Shout Factory. Is it Shout Factory? This one's Scream Factory. Scream Factory edition to kind of get the special features and everything. Do a deep dive into it. You know, I, I've seen this movie a number of times before. It's the Sam Raimi superhero story with his original character. It's got Liam Neeson in it as the lead guy. Um, but for whatever reason, this time I just like really got into it and decided to buy the direct-to-video sequels where they got Arnold Vosloo to be Darkman to replace Liam Neeson. And Arnold Vosloo, The Mummy, and Liam Neeson do not have the same screen presence, energy, or accent. So it's kind of weird, but I didn't think that actually the, the direct-to-video ones were all that bad. Um, you know, maybe it's because I, I watched a lot of direct-to-video movies and 90s nostalgia and stuff like that, but... Um, I, I, I kind of dug them. I didn't mind them at all. Um, nothing, to, nothing to make fun of or anything like that. We got Date Night. Just a, a fun little date night comedy about Steve Carell and Tina Fey as a married couple to go on a date night and get wrapped up in this whole spy thing of misunderstandings and stuff like that. That uh, is not quite as good as you'd hope for a movie where that stars... That, that pairs Steve Carell and Tina Fey, and then has like Mark Wahlberg in the back background. It also has a, gal, a young Gal Gadot in it too, but uh, not as exciting as you'd hope, but not bad either. And then the Da Vinci Code uh, 4K, as I mentioned before, these always feel kind of like National Treasure minus the fun, taking themselves a little bit too too seriously. They're, they're good enough. I actually read the Da Vinci Code book in a single setting, which that is not a thing I normally would say, do, or experience. But when um, I was in college and I was flying back to where I was going to college from Texas to South Carolina and I got stuck overnight at the Atlanta airport and they actually did put us up in hotels, but I was, I don't know, like I was too nervous or too shy or whatever. So I, I didn't even figure out how to go to the hotel. So I just slept on a bench at the hotel, uh, at the airport and because of the nature of it, I was kind of got freaked out by all the people that were kind of there and um, I guess it was kind of, so I didn't want to sleep. And so I ended up just listening to reading the Da Vinci Code. I didn't listen to it. I actually read it. And um, I, I didn't, and I couldn't charge my laptop to play music anywhere 
or I probably could have. I just chose not to. I don't know. It was kind of weird. I was stupid. It was also like five in the morning. It was stupid. And so like my music stopped playing. So I was just sitting there reading this book in one sitting, trying to figure out what, what's the secret? What's going on with this Da Vinci Code? And uh, the movie didn't capture the magic of that evening. Anyway, that was a rabbit trail. Days of Thunder, the Tom Cruise race car movie where he met Nicole Kidman, directed by Tony Scott. I saw this one in the theater when it first first came out, so way back in the day. I need to give it another watch. I I, I need to check that one, especially now that I'm in big Tom Cruise mood with this uh, Maverick movie coming out. Dazed and Confused, the Richard Linkletter Austin, Texas classic that launched the career of one Matthew McConaughey with a not-so-big part that turned into big gigantic things for him and this is cool packaging right here this is like the jumbo edition one where even the faces are popping through on the, the sleeve on it and you got the booklet for it all sorts of details production information everything you could want about dazed and confused all right there and as an austin boy um it's always fun to have movies shot right around here where i live and criterion collection edition so much, much fancy. Ah! Whoa, that was exciting. Mike's still recording. This is still there. Okay, nothing broken. Just made a bad choice there. But this is a much more exciting packaging than most of these Criterion collections we've looked at in here. Dead Zone, Stephen King adaptation. Got this one in my fan mail. Watched it for the first time. Um... Oh, about a week and a half ago, uh, Firestarter came out this past weekend. I was thinking about doing a top 10 Stephen King movie, so I tried to find out what are some of the, the ones I hadn't seen before that might make my top 10, and then Firestarter clearly wasn't going to be a big release, and I'd I just been too busy. I couldn't get enough watch, so I watched this one for the first time ever, And um, but I just kind of stopped after this one in Carrie. And actually, we watched the original Fire Shorter as well. But uh, nice, interesting concept. I think it would be a better TV show than a movie because it's kind of episodic. And the, kind of the idea this guy's in a coma and he wakes up and he has the ability to see how people are going to die and see their future and stuff. And there's a lot of th directions you can go with that. And the movie goes in a lot of different directions with it. But more so than you can really do... It, it just felt like we're having these little 20-minute episodes and then finally we have to have a, a conclusion to it. So I think it would have worked better as a TV show, but uh, a nice, nice film nonetheless. Death Wish, the remake from a few years back with Bruce Willis in it. And, um, you know, I like these kind of movies, so I dug it. It worked well enough for me. Mostly got terrible reviews. And it's, just, it's like a dated throwback film that they just don't make movies like that anymore, so they're not very well received, but... As a guy that likes revenge films, I dug it. Then we have The Debt. Uh, I haven't seen this one. I guess I got it by fan mail. I'm not familiar with it, so nothing I can comment on it just yet. Hopefully I can get it watched. Demolition Man. I talked about this one just a little bit ago when I mentioned Cliffhanger. Another one of these movies that came out in that 1993 era where Stallone had a bit of a revival and put out a couple of solid films. This one in particular, I think, has... Uh, aged really nicely because it kind of predicted a little bit of stuff about the future and... Um, political correctness, corporations taking over to a comedic level, and it just kind of intertwines that into the story while being... all the, has all the stuff that you wanted in the early 90s from a Stallone film, and it did a bunch of stuff that just aged really well. Got Wesley Snipes in there, uh, a young Sandra Bullock right before she really took off with Speed the next year. Despicable Me 1, Despicable Me 2, Despicable Me 3, right there. Uh... Simple, light entertainment. They're they're entertaining enough. Rely a little bit too much on dancing and farts for for my taste, but they're entertaining nonetheless. And Minions, the the new one comes out. It was supposed to come out two years ago. It got delayed. COVID. It looks like it's actually finally gonna come out in a, in a couple of nut, uh, months. Detective Pikachu. By the time this movie came out, my kids were huge into Pokemon, and so this was a ton of fun to take them to it. We've watched it a, multiple times at home, and they explained to me who all the characters are and everything like that. And uh, as a f adaptation of a video game, because it is based off of a Nintendo game called Detective Pikachu, um, it's one of the better ones. It works well, because you got Ryan Reynolds doing PG-13 Ryan Reynolds, cute animal, and uh, fun creatures, and so that's a winning formula. Speaking of these Guillermo del Toro Criterion Collection ones that I've been sent in my fan mail in preparation for that theoretical Guillermo del Toro ranking, we've got The Devil's Backbone. Haven't seen it. Can't comment on it. 
Dick Tracy. I bought this one a, a month or two ago as actually when I was watching the Dark Man movies and uh, the Danny Elfman score in those movies and has a certain aesthetic similar to a little bit of Batman 89 in there. And that era, there were certain movies that came out. One of them was Dick Tracy. Kind of a certain vibe to him with the Danny Elfman score and everything. And so I, I, I want to watch this one. It got, got me in the mood for it. Because I, like, I, I was so into Dick Tracy when it came out. Once again, we didn't get a lot of comic book movies back in the day. And Dick Tracy was one of the ones that we did get. And it's very colorful. It's like a comic book brought to life. But I haven't watched it in a long time. So I bought it and um, have been too busy to actually check it out again. As an old man that I am now. Then we got... Die Hard. They got the 4K. One of my favorite movies of all time. Best action movie of all time. If you remove subgenres like sci-fi and time travel, just the classic formula that spawned already in this video. Multiple movie movies I've discussed that are Die Hard on a movies because it's so good that every movie in that even ballpark is compared to it. John McClane, the definitive action hero, as the guy that doesn't want to be the action hero, but he has the skill set to be one, the reluctant hero that just makes it a little bit more interesting, compelling, and Bruce Willis is so good at being able to play the everyman that is actually the action hero. And then we have the collection with the other movies in there. Uh, I think two's a perfectly fine continuation. Bit of a rehash, but a rehash that still has the magic. Rennie Harlan directed it, so it's got a little bit, a little bit more spunk to the violence to it. And he's not John McTiernan, but he's he's a good follow up. And the Die Hard with Vengeance is a great Die Hard sequel. I like the fourth one. I I have no big complaints about the fourth one. I guess this only collection doesn't have the, this collection doesn't have the fifth one. Oops or not oops. Uh, and then the fifth one is terrible. Django Unchained, the Quentin Tarantino revenge western with, of course, a phenomenal cast. And, um, yeah, I, you know, Quentin Tarantino is, is amazing. And so he always is able to bring something to whatever he does and make it memorable and over the top. Dirty Dancing. I, I've seen a few Dirty Dancing a few times over the years. Haven't um, seen it recently. And I, I guess we bought it from Best Buy at some point in time. And haven't watched it because it's still sealed. But, um, you know, the big gigantic hit from the 80s. Not a movie that was uh, one of my films of my formative years, I guess you could say. Doctor Sleep, the follow-up to The Shining. And I, I prefer this to The Shining. I I've said it before, but The Shining's a little bit too poetic, metaphoric, allegorical, weird for me. And I like things a little bit more straightforward. And Doctor Sleep is, is that. And also it... it it really explores the alcoholism that was prominent in the Shining book. I haven't read Doctor Sleep. I have read Shining, the book, The Shining, and that's not as prominent in Kubrick's film. And it kind of goes into this the uh, generational trauma, the way that so much our parents can trickle down into our lives, and the way that Danny is copying what his father did. Uh, but with also having a redemption side to it, it's also a bit of a superhero story, sort of, while being through the mind of Stephen King. I, I, I just, I think it's a really special film and takes all the things that are good about The Shining they resonated with and does even kind of more with them and has these themes that resonate with me as someone that had an alcoholic father and then turned into an alcoholic myself, got myself into some trouble and I needed my own redemptive past to, to follow my father's path that my, my dad drank himself to death. And so the naturally stories about that um, resonate with me quite a bit. Doctor Strange, the animated movie. I, I saw this one for the first time just a couple weeks back to do a Doctor Strange ranking. I'd heard about it, never watched it, and then bought it. And um, it's actually from uh, one of the, it's like five directors. One of them is Jay Olivia, who did a ton of the DC anime movies over the last 10 years. And I've seen a ton of those. Hadn't seen this one. And it's very much same vein, same kind of quality. Classic Doctor Strange story about arrogant surgeon origin story where his hands get messed up and he needs to find a way. So very similar to the 2016 film, except it came out nine years before that or yeah, nine years before that. So I, 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 I enjoyed it. Uh, didn't blow my mind or anything like that, but a solid one. Dr. Strange love or how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. I wanted to make sure I got the title right on this one. One of my favorite Kubrick films because it's a comedy and so it, it's so wacky and weird, but through the mind of Kubrick. So fun from the mind of this bizarre guy that's known for a lot more serious films. And then in the midst, he has this wild anti-war one. Doolittle. Robert Downey Jr.'s follow-up to Iron Man that 
turned out to not be so great. Um, in fact, the the big finale, what, how, what are we going to have our climax for the film? A dragon farts in his face. That's a thing that happens in that movie. Cool. Cool. Glad we got that. Glad that was a thing that happened. Don John, the Joseph Gordon-Levitt Scar Joe uh, rom-com of sorts about the different ways in which men and women uh, have different fantasies about what relationships would look like that aren't realistic or healthy and the way they cause problems for humans. Don't Breathe. I think this is a, a great little... Actually, we've got both of them. Don't Breathe 1 and 2. Uh, Don't Breathe, just kind of... Cla- uh, not classic. Really good home invasion type film that kind of turns the formula on its head and just does a number of things that just... It's great at building the tension and thrills, but also like just gross, weird things that are like, oh, wow, I wasn't expecting that to go there. That the sort and the types of twists and turns you just don't expect at all. Then you have a follow up to it, Both Breathe 2, that a lot of people really didn't like because it turns the blind man into an anti hero. And I, I can get that. I, I can see why that wouldn't work for people. I'm just a sucker for this genre, and they do just enough to not actually make him a good person, not even try and defend him at all, and make it clear he's a bad dude, and he, he's kind of figuring that out about himself. So I I actually really dug this film as someone that, that likes the genre. Got Dragon the Bruce Lee story. I saw this one in the theater when it first came out, and it's, it's certainly like a fictionalized version of Bruce Lee's life that kind of hits real stuff and then adds a lot of fairy tales into there to um, make him seem like even more of a legend than he actually was and uh, reduce removes a lot of the things about him that weren't so um, weren't quite as inspiring we'll say um, but I, I think uh, I always enjoy this movie great score a score that was actually used in a ton of trailers Drag Me to Hell this is the first time watched for me uh, just a month back in prep for my Raimi ranking and um, yeah just a, a nice Nice find, because, um, not find, it's not like I did, I didn't knew it existed, it's not like it was a, this hidden gem or anything like that, I just hadn't seen it, but it was Raimi at the peak of his career, and then he had the freedom to do what he wanted, and he wanted to do a horror movie, and so he had the budget, creative control, a lot of fun stuff, it's just this wild, crazy movie. Dread, a, a movie that was painfully underwatched, not enough people saw it, and everyone that did was like, that's a really good little action film, well, we need another one of those, but unfortunately, it didn't make enough money, so we, that almost certainly never happened, but just a solid sci-fi action film based on a comic book. Dune, 1984, the original one, and what a what a bizarre watch. Uh, from the costumes to the just unbelievably condensed way it te- decides to cover the whole book, and then even the way it decided to condense everything that was filmed... Clearly, they shot a movie that was this long, and they went, nah, we can't put out a three-and-a-half-hour movie, so let's put this out. It said, it is a weird, strange thing to watch. Um, I, I watched it after having seen the, the new one. Oh, there we go. forgot this happened. Uh, Mr. Skinner sent me the, the Blu-ray for it, and then he sent me the 4K for David Lynch's Dune, so we can pull this one out of rotation for the moment, but... I guess whenever the new Dune comes out, I will watch the old one again in pristine 4K, which it'll be fascinating to see how all of those costumes and prosthetics look in that form. Mr. Skinner also sent me the Dune collection. If you don't know, there was an additional adaptation of Dune as well as some of the sequel books for the Sci-Fi Networks that has one James McAvoy in it. So that's pretty exciting. Um, so I've never seen any of these ones. I had an idea to do a Dune ranking, but it didn't seem like enough people have probably seen the sci-fi ones and there's enough other stuff going on in October that didn't happen. And then we have the 4K for the new Dune. And uh, I, that was one of my favorite movies of last year. I just thought it was great sci-fi, great world building, uh, absolutely perfect on technical levels. So 
thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed that film. And closing out our D's, Dunkirk, Christopher Nolan's a World War II film that is told in three classic Nolan fashion, told in three different timelines that all kind of merge together at the end of the film. And some people just thought it didn't like it because they thought it was too light on character. And I think that's fair enough. But I think what it does so well is put you in the experience of this rescue, three different timelines that are all working together. And that's what it's about, putting you in the middle of it with the urgency, the tension. And I thought it was just great at doing that. So I, I thoroughly enjoyed Dr. Kirk. We're kicking off our E's with Edge of 17, a movie that I loved the trailer for when I first saw it. Went, oh, I want to see that. I own it. I still haven't seen it yet. Uh, it's one of those movies that somehow just slipped through the cracks of, like, legitimately interested in seeing it. Seemed like something I would enjoy. Trailers, uh, the, all the reviews weren't really good. I just haven't seen it. Then we got... Live, die, repeat, edge of tomorrow, or all you need is kill, depending on what kind of mood you're in and which title for this movie you want to go with. Great sci-fi time loop movie that finds a way to progress a story forward and just have a ton, a ton, a ton of fun while killing Tom Cruise a bunch of times and having Emily Blunt kill a bunch of people as well. But just a movie that had bad trailers that did not capture what the movie was like and then everyone that saw it was like, this is really good. Elf, one of my absolute favorite Christmas movies, one of my favorite Will Ferrell movies, and it's a John Favreau film. This is kind of what's really launched him as a director. It's not his first movie because he did Made before this, but this was the one where he did this little Christmas movie that ended up being this massive, massive, gigantic hit that became a Christmas classic that uh, I find hilarious every single time I watch it. Electra, the spin-off follow-up to Ben Affleck's Daredevil that is not very good. And it's like a movie that tries a bunch. It's like a generic hitman movie with weird mythology, but it's an Electra film and has the mythology surrounding her. Just doesn't leave much of any mark. Nothing's particularly memorable about it. It's from a director, Rob Bowman, who did a bunch of classic X-Files work and then made a not-so-classic and not-so-memorable Electra film. Emma! Movie came out last year. Just not really my thing. Uh, type of movie. It's tough for me to review because I'm just not into period piece films and this particular branch of them anyway. This sort of film my, my wife's really into, but she watches them when I'm not around. As I, it, like you, It's like when you watch something that like you can see all the talent involved within it, but it is just not how you are wired or what the sort of thing you enjoy. Encanto! The 60th Disney animation film that uh, I did this gigantic, massive ranking of all 60 films when this movie came out in theaters. And this movie did not make a splash when it was in theaters. It was like, oh yeah, that did fine. And then a month later, it dropped on Disney+. Plus. And every kid under the age of 10 that has Disney+, Plus discovered it. Started watching it on loop. And so six weeks after the movie came out, six weeks after I did that massive ranking... This movie turned into this cultural phenomena that if you're in my phase of life where you have three kids under the age of 10, you've heard the soundtrack for this movie 1,000 times. And I have heard the soundtrack for this movie 1,000 times. And uh, yeah, <laughs> my kids watch the movie a lot. They listen to the music even more. Enchanted. I have always thoroughly enjoyed this movie. Just such a, a fun take on Disney princesses. And brought into the real world that so it feels like a live action cartoon except in a, in a real world. And uh, Amy Adams just does such a fantastic job of playing that part. And you even got some catchy, memorable songs in there too. Next up, we have The Equalizer 2. No Equalizer? I guess must oh, just a little out of order. Two Equalizer films right there. We got the... Well, okay. So we got... The 4Ks for both of them. I guess that means we can pull this out of the stash. So, learning things as we go along. Equalizer 1 and 2 and 4K. As uh, someone that likes good old-fashioned throwback action thrillers, I enjoy both of those movies. That, uh, you know, of course, Denzel Washington is endlessly watchable. Antoine Fuqua is just a consistent, solid hitter when it comes to action thrillers. He's not getting home runs, but he gets singles and doubles whenever he does action thrillers, and that's what those movies are for me. Just not adding anything new to the genre, just good ones. Aragon, the 
adaptation of a book written by a 16-year-old that's basically just Star Wars with dragons. It's <laughs> When you realize, like, wait, this is just Star Wars, it's really overt how much it's portrayed with the movie. I haven't read the books myself, but how much it seemed like a guy watched Star Wars and was like, that was cool, and then just rewrote it with dragons. Uh, my actual memories for this is that right after we got married, my wife and I went on a cruise. Our family paid to take the whole family on a cruise, and they had a channel that played movies, and by movies I meant, I mean, Aragon. It just played Aragon 24-7. So when you're on a cruise for five days and you go back to your cabin, it's got one movie to watch. So we watched Aragon like three times a week. <laughs> E.T., the classic family movie in beautiful steel book right there and a 4K. Uh, this is one that I grew up loving. My, my wife grew up being freaked out by it because of the part where E.T. is in the creek and he's all white and pale and everything she hates that part so she doesn't like et but i like et so i showed it to the kids one day when she was either out of town or she'd gone to sleep and so she wasn't gonna let him watch it was like they have to you have to watch et so showed him et what a classic now we got our set of evil dead movies where we got Evil Dead 1 and 2 right here in this fancy little case right here. Tons of special features in pristine 4K. And then multiple different versions of Army of Darkness. Um, got this one with the... I, I guess... I probably could pull this one out of rotation because this one I think has all the things that you could want. But that's a, this is one of these movies that has 1,000 releases. There's... Four different cuts of the movie, 1,000 different special features. And so you don't know, like, do I need to keep both versions to make sure I have all the special features and all the different versions? I'm not really sure, but I'll keep them there for the time being anyway. And then the remake, which is an interesting remake because the original Evil Dead is mostly just a serious, just brutal horror film. But because Raimi's a bit of a quirky guy, there's a little bit of that quirk in there. But it's a straight horror film. And then by the time you get to Army of Darkness, it's like a screwball comedy. And this is just a brutal, brutal, brutal film. Ex Machina, this is a movie I have not watched yet. I have been meeting and meeting and meeting, 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 meeting to watch it for years, and it just hasn't happened yet. We'll follow that up with a trilogy of Expendables films. And these are movies that for some people, they're underwhelmed by them because it, they just, they were expecting, I think, a little bit more by putting all your favorite 80s action movie stars and 90s action movie stars into a movie together, and then it's just a straightforward action movie. But I think that's kind of the point. Like that, they, It made a movie like the movies that those guys did, just they're all in it together. It's not trying to reinvent the action movie. It's just an action movie. So I enjoy them enough. That's not the second one, I think probably captured it the best because it seemed to know what it was and how silly it was. And then the third one kind of went too far and like, let's just throw everybody in there, including Kelsey Grammer. Kelsey Grammer? Action star Kelsey Grammer? What are you talking about? But um, we got a new one coming out soon, so that's kind of fun. Last one in the set, we got The Exorcist. And uh, yeah, this is a... Uh, I'd seen this movie 20 years ago, rewatched it last year for the 31 on 31 and that, that's a movie that is just still so effective, despite tons of movies copying it, tons of movies ripping it off, more movies in the genre, advances in special effects. That movie knew how to just creep you out with weird, weird images and mythology and a characters that you care about. We're kicking off our Fs with Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, the Harry Potter spinoff that is a... Uh... It's fun enough, but just totally inconsistent. Like, they couldn't decide if they wanted to make a cute movie about Fantastic Beasts and where to find them, or make an epic story about Grindelwald and a dark story about this orphan boy that's being abused, but it's really powerful. And so, in which case, it feels a little bit uneven, but uh, there's a lot of fun to be had in it. Fantastic Four double pack from the Tim Story version of it. Now, I don't think these are awful films, but like the first one, it feels like a TV pilot, like for a nice Fantastic Four TV show, not a movie. It's the, like the tone, the look, and just the scale, the size, it just feels like television. And then the second one has like 1,000 subplots, and the movie's only 90 minutes long, which is weird. Steelbook 4, the Fantastic Four stick. <laughs> like, of all the movies you get a... Steelbook awesome packaging. 
Fan Four Stick, one of the worst comic movies of all time, of just a, a disaster of a production, where they probably hired the wrong, or they hired the wrong guy. That his take um, sounded kind of interesting. He wanted to do like this body horror movie that just tonally, that's probably not what Fantastic Four should be. And he just matched him up with the wrong property, and then. They decided to cut the budget at the last minute, so they had to rewrite the script to cut action sequences very, very late in the game. Then the director had a meltdown where the, where they were filming it, and then someone else reshot it. And it's just the movie has like no middle act. It's like a very long uh, first act, and then they get their powers, and then covers the middle act in ten minutes, and then suddenly we're in the third act having a fight. No development. There's one. There's a ton of deleted scenes in the trailers and behind-the-scenes footage for stuff that's nowhere to be seen anywhere. Just a mess, a mess, a mess of a movie where so many bad choices were made all along the way. Then we got our fan, uh, Fantastic Four. That's what we just talked about. Fast and Furious Collection. Right in here. So we got the eight-movie collection for the first eight right there. Then we got the our Hobbs and Shaw 4K for the spinoff. And then the F9 director's cut. I don't know what's in the direction. I haven't watched it yet to see what. Do we get extra cars driving in space? That would be something to hopefully so. Almost certainly it's like 30 seconds of dialogue that was trimmed. But I, I don't actually know how big of a director's cut that one is. But uh, it's what a bizarre franchise. It starts off as kind of like just a middle of the road knockoff of speed. That somehow turned into Cars in Space with spinoffs with robot suit guys and The Rock and Jason Statham. Bizarre franchise and the, the direction that that thing's gone. A Few Good Men. Actually, this is the very first 4K I ever bought right here. Uh, I didn't mean to buy it in 4K because I didn't have a 4K TV or player at the time. But this was the only way to buy A Few Good Men. And of course, it has the Blu-ray in it. This, of non-Mission Impossible movies and non-flashy ones, this is one of my favorite Tom Cruise movies. Just a great little courtroom film. Aaron Sorkin script. And um, just witty dialogue, great characters. Pays off really nicely in the end. If you haven't seen it, highly recommend it. And whenever I, about 10 years ago, I watched it with my wife. And my wife said... This guy that Tom Cruise is playing, this is like the most I've ever seen a character in a movie that seems like you. So if you're wondering what I'm like in real life, apparently watch this movie and I'm like a military lawyer. Whoa. Field of Dreams. A Kevin Costner baseball movie that created the ever quotable, if you build it, they will come. So I saw this one way back in the day. Always enjoyed it. Need to rewatch it now that I have kids of my own and as we've discussed in here, movies play differently in different phases of life, and uh, a movie about fathers and sons probably plays a bit differently when you have a son. Fight Club, I came out probably at the perfect age for this movie, as it's about disenfranchised youth without purpose that are angry, and it came out right as I was entering that phase of life where I was disenfranchised, confused, and lacking in purpose, and then a movie came out, and this one is a beautiful four, or a beautiful steelbook, it's not 4K, steelbook co collector's edition deal for it, but uh, just a movie that has all of David Fincher's directorial style while also... Um, pulling from source material that kind of explores some interesting ideas. We got uh, the fighter David O. Russell film that uh, I, I saw this one way back when it first came out. I haven't watched it in a while. I need to give it another watch, but uh, um, was ones that you know, showed how crazy Christian Bale is in his commitment to his roles. Fighting with my family. This was my introduction to the Florence Pugh, who isn't entirely obvious that it's her because she colored her hair a different color for this movie. For She's playing a real-life person. I really dug this movie. I, I don't know the wrestler that it's based off of. I don't know any of the history, any of that stuff. And so just uh, watched it because it was the new movie that came out. And I just thought it was a great little sports family dramedy where the tension and conflict all felt earned and it rang true rather than hollow we got our final destination films i guess we can pull this one out of the mix we have another one right there no i guess it looks like we don't uh, fun little concept that found a creative way to kill people off probably went on way too long and way too many in too short of a time period but the original in itself was just a, a, a 
fun new way to do a horror film that created all these creative, clever kills. Finding Nemo, a movie I was 10 years late to. I didn't see it when it first came out. I didn't see it right after it came out. I didn't see it until I had a kid that was one year old. So the movie plays very differently if you watch it as an adult with a newborn child. Given the plot line, you very much feel that journey that Marlin is on. And that's why this has always been a special film for me, why it's always at the top of my Pixar rankings. Because it's a it's a movie that meant a lot to me and came out at just the right time in my life. The Firm. Now, Tom Cruise has been known for the last 20 years as mostly like an action guy and spy movies. But he, the first 15, 20 years of his career was much more about more of a dramatic actor. And big hit films back in the 90s were very different from big hit films in today. So these John Grisham courtroom dramas were massive hits. And one of those was The Firm. Uh, back in the day, my, my family would go on these these car rides. Uh, by car rides, I mean we would go on vacations. We would go on six-week car trips with my mom, my sister, and I. And we'd just drive around in the van go to 10 different states and different places. And we would listen to audiobooks. And we'd listen to a bunch of the John Grisham books. So always very fond memories of those. Then that'll that'll bring us to this behemoth right here. That This is, this is cool. This is the Friday the 13th. Scream Factory Collector's Edition for uh, Edition, what, whatever the name is. I said that all funky. Friday the 13th Collection Deluxe Edition from Scream Factory it came out. I think it's only a couple of years old, and this was sent to me in my fan mail from some neat. This is the slasher franchise that I watched most um, prior to Scream coming out. Like, my, it was my introduction to slashes. It was Friday the 13th on TBS, TNT. And I had to, you know, start watching in the middle of it late at night after my kid, uh, my kids, my parents went to bed. And um, so these ones are the ones I had the most kind of nostalgia for. And then opened my fan mail and this behemoth was in there. So I think I'm going to have a rewatch of the Friday the 13th movies coming up in September and October. And so I'm excited to watch through this with all the special features and, and doing it right. So this this is cool. So thanks again for sending this my way. Not to most of you. Most of you didn't send it to me, but some neat if you're watching. Thank you. Then we have First Man, the Damien Chazelle story about the trip to the moon. And um, I, I wasn't impressed by this movie. I thought it was awfully lacking in energy. For being about something super interesting and super interesting characters, this one felt like just, I don't know, just kind of lifeless. And Damien Chazelle's movies are always about people that are just driven towards greatness in their careers. And so it's great in that in that sense and fits uh, thematically with his other other films. But uh, I thought it was just, just too slow. That first reform, this is actually one of the very first movies I received in my fan mail. Unfortunately, I haven't watched it yet. I, I've heard good things about it, but um, just one that I, ha I haven't had that moment to, to check it out. Uh, so hopefully one of these days. Then we got Jackie Chan's First Strike. If you don't know, my very first movie webpage was a Jackie Chan fan webpage. And uh, they first adapted his... or took his Hong Kong movies and dubbed them. And one of those early movies was First Strike. So I remember when that movie came out, seeing the trailer and everything like that. And that, I've seen the movie a, a bazillion times. For the love of the game, Sam Raimi's baseball movie that's actually a Kevin Costner baseball film. Watch this one for the first time, actually just about two days ago, three days ago for my Sam Raimi ranking. And um, it's a weird movie because it's like, it's about a guy playing a baseball game thinking about his love life. That's the whole movie. It's like him playing one game, thinking about the last five years of his life with this this girl. Flags of Our Fathers, a uh, Clint Eastwood film. Haven't watched this one yet. Um, and it's, he did two movies back to back, um, kind of telling the same story from two sides. I, I haven't seen it, though, so I can't comment on it. We have The Flash, a Lego film. And uh, my, my since I have kids, we, we buy a lot of these Lego superhero movies and watch them have fun with them they're simple 
They don't demand much of you. Easy to put on, watch real quick, and move along with your day. Then we have following Christopher Nolan's first film, the Criterion edition for it. This is actually a gift from some of my friends for my 39th birthday. Um, as I was did a review series talking about the Nolan films, and I said I didn't own this one, and so then they sent me the Criterion edition for my birthday, which was very thoughtful of them. The Fly, uh, a film I haven't watched yet, but I've like even yeah I, I haven't checked this one out yet but it's like been on my radar it's on that, that list of movies that i need to write down of like classics that everybody's seen except me that one feels like it should be in that list frank and weenie tim burton's movie there was actually i think an adaptation of one of his earlier works or something like that another one i haven't checked out yet a whole a story about a dead dog is one that normally by default uh, scares me away free guy what a pleasant surprise like this movie was so much more fun and more emotional than it had any right to be. It explored the human experience. It's like a double rom-com while being a video game movie that's not actually a video game movie. I just had a blast with that one. Ford v. Ferrari. Great little James Mangold film. To me, this is this is like a classic old school Best Picture nominee. It just happened to come out just a few years ago but just really well made about people striving towards excellence based off a true story, amazing performances, but also really entertaining at the same time. The Foreigner, 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 The Foreigner, a Martin Campbell revenge thriller starring Jackie Chan in a much more serious film. He gets to use his skills, but it's a much more dramatic role, but it's also a Pierce Brosnan film. It's, there's a lot of layers and complexity to it. Pretty neat little film. I I enjoyed it. Forgetting Sarah Marshall, comedy from a few years back. Or like 15 years back now. Well, the time flies by. I, I had fun with it. Not one that I rewatch all that often. I was like, okay, that was amusing enough. Don't need to watch that again. But I bought it, so I can watch it again if I want to. Four Christmases. Now, this is a Christmas movie that seems like a lot of people hate because it's kind of mean-spirited. Not really the most Christmassy of Christmas movies, but for whatever reason, my wife and I have a lot of fun with this one. Probably because of the cast and just there's just enough things that make us laugh. But at the same time, you stop and think about it, yeah, it's, it's probably not a it's probably not a great Christmas movie. People tell us that all the time. Freaky. Now this is a, a fun one that came out and it was um, tragically underwatched because it came out fall of 2020 when not a lot of stuff was coming out. But it's Freaky Friday, except as a slasher movie, where a girl switches bodies with a serial killer. And so the serial killer's in the girl's body, and the girl is in the serial killer's body, and the serial killer is played by Vince Vaughn, who himself, you know, the six foot five guy, and in which case you, he could play the Jason Voorhees esque killer, and then at the same time, he could be really funny playing a high school girl. Uh, I, the the guy that did it uh, is the same guy that did Happy Death Day, and he's just he just has a knack for let's take this classic trope of this other genre and mash it with a slasher, and they work. And I, I really enjoy his stuff. Then we have Frozen Two, no Frozen One, but Frozen Two, the well the follow up to the massive cultural phenomena. As someone that has three kids under the age of 10, I, of course, have watched the Frozen movies a million times and listened to the soundtrack just as many times, or more so. And uh, I, I think they're both really good movies. I like the second one a little bit more, though. Finally, we have The Fugitive. A great, great little thriller. If you haven't seen The Fugitive, you got to go check out The Fugitive. Just um, such a great example of... Um, they, they adapted this old 1960s TV show into a film and just took it to all new heights with what they were able to do with it. Phenomenal cast, phenomenal concept, everything. Got to check this one out. Moving right along, we've made it to our G's and we've got Galaxy Quest. Just one of the great comedies of all time. Basically a perfect movie. It works if you haven't watched Star Trek. It's just funny. It's clever. You can track along with the story and laugh with it. If you are a Star Trek fan, if you've been to Star Trek conventions or comic cons, it is just a gift to the fans. 
The Gallows. Now, this is one I've had people talking to, to me about this one for a while. Kind of, a, I guess, a smaller horror film. And I know some people that I guess kind of worked on it and know the people that made it. I haven't been able to check it out yet. I got it recently in my fan mail. They've been talking to me about it for quite a bit. But I, I don't know. I, I just haven't had the time to watch it yet. Game Night. This was such a pleasant surprise. I like, I like the trailer. It seems simple enough, like, okay, people have a game night and they get wrapped up in this actual kind of little murder mystery. And then I, I just thought it was so fun as this comedy adventure with an amazing cast. It actually had, like, real nice directorial style to it with the way that it filmed either the action or the transitions and just a bunch of just, like, Jess Plemons and the Neighbor, just amazing, amazing side character. But then our lead, so charming, pleasant. So, man, just a, a movie that was... I thought it was going to be good, and it turned to be so much even better than that. Got the gentleman, um, Guy Ritchie's return to the genre that made him so famous, and turned out to be one of his best movies in qu quite a while. And it was like like his movies that he made when he was younger, but a much more mature version of them, where he's older, he's more mature, and kind of reflects on things a little bit differently, and you see that even in the film. We have Get Out, Jordan Peele's first movie, and I thought this one was just a, a nice breath of fresh air of just a movie that had social commentary, had thrills, it had humor to it, it had a distinct style, and it kind of reminded you like some Twilight Zone and some other things, but was also its own little movie. And obviously it's it spawned a ton of knockoffs over the last uh, several years and people from the same studio trying to copy the success of it but I don't think any of them have matched what he pulled off with Get Out and I don't think that, I mean I didn't think his follow up matched it either so hopefully the next one will we have Get On Up the James Brown movie starring Chadwick Boseman I haven't been able to check this one out yet but uh, uh, one that because I like the Jackie Robinson film 42, I, I've been curious about it ever since he was announced to be in the film, which was quite a while ago at this point in time, but ha haven't seen it. Get Smart. The I grew up watching the Get Smart TV show on Nick at Night and had a lot of fun with that one. And when this came out, I didn't watch The Office yet. I just went, oh, Get Smart. I'll, I'll go see that and went to go see it with my wife. And we had a lot of fun with it. And afterwards, we're like, doesn't that guy have a TV show called The Office? And this movie right here, this is how I started watching The Office. And it became the, the show I've rewatched the most times, at least the first four seasons, not the rest of it. But the first four seasons are the four seasons of television by far that I've rewatched the most. It all started with Get Smart. That I need to rewatch that one now with my kids and see if they have fun with it. Coast Rider, the two Nicolas Cage films, they're... Uh, well, the first one's a product of its time, and the second one is is a movie that it does exist and was made and has been released. But, uh, you know, as you're making movies, they're trying to figure out how to do the tone of comic book films, and they didn't quite figure it out with Ghost Rider quite yet. Then we have Ghostbusters 1 and 2. Got this little fun packaging right here with a, a book in there, some backstory on everything, some special features... The original Ghostbusters is one of just an amazing 80s film with a great concept, perfect cast, just absolutely knocked it out of the park. Second one, you could just tell the magic wasn't quite there anymore, unfortunately. They just didn't, didn't, it tried to do all the stuff that made the first one great and it just didn't work. But then we got Afterlife this last year. I loved that movie. I thought it was just such a respectful way to, to honor what came before, do something new and different with it. And just have a lot of heart. And, you know, some people have criticized it for, you know... I saw some people saying, oh, it's just a beat-for-beat beat remake of the original. I was like, I know what you're saying. I know what you're referencing. But it's not. It's it's like a dramatically different story that at, does have some, some, some of the same beats. But it's really, really different. Then we have G.I. Joe Rise of Cobra and G.I. Joe Retaliation. Two G.I. Joe live-action films that didn't quite capture the magic. Uh, the first one has a bunch of just, it's like taking this cartoon, well, an, a literal cartoon, adapting it, and instead of taking all these wacky cartoonish characters from the show and adapting those, they give these new characters and like robot suits and characters that like aren't wearing robot suits in the cartoon, giving them robot suits. Like, what are you, what are you doing with it? And then the second one captured the vibe better, captured it, but somehow still the story just 
seemed like it was disjointed and going too many directions. And so for whatever reason, they're just really struggling to make a G.I. Joe movie, which seems like it should be much easier to do. The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, David Fincher film that's an adaptation of a book that was previously adapted in a different language. Haven't read the book, the movie itself. Uh, I watched, I've only seen it one time whenever I did my David Fincher ranking, and um, I, I really enjoyed it. It was just like a, a, I didn't know what to expect going into it, and it, it gave me something that well, was very David Fincher, had layers, complexity, and made you, made you think about a bunch of different stuff. Gladiator. Now, this came out when I was a senior in high school. And so I, you kind of like the perfect age to love this brutal gladiator film with heads getting chopped off and things like that. And, you know, one of those movies that kind of transitioned me into watching R-rated movies. They're up for Oscars and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm not I'm not a huge Ridley Scott fan. I'm, not that I'm not anti-Ridley Scott. I like Tony Scott's stuff more, though. But this is one of the ones that I definitely like from Mr. Scott. Glass, the... Long delayed sequel to Unbreakable that is also a sequel to Split that is a spinoff from Unbreakable and a movie that has a lot of things I love about it. A lot of things done right. And then, oh, M. Night. Oh, M. Night. Sometimes you make very bad choices and that movie just goes off the rails in the third act and just ru- just kills itself, just ruins it. Godzilla, I, I like this movie. I, I have always enjoyed this movie, love the aesthetic for it. When Godzilla shows up, when you get some awesome, cool Godzilla mayhem taking place, probably should have more, but oh well. Um, you get that in the other movies, but I, I dig this movie. Goodfellas in Steelbook. Right there, fancy and 4K Steelbook as it is. Once again, I, I've seen this movie before, but it was like 20 years ago. And so hopefully I'll be watching it again in the next six months and we will have ourselves a Martin Scorsese ranking. Got the Godfather trilogy right there. Now, I'd, I'd seen the first two before back in the day, but I'd never seen the third one before. And a couple years back, I did uh, a ranking of the, the Godfather trilogy and finally watched the third one and watched the first two as an adult, as a movie critic guy. And man, I think that it's you just have these movies that even though they're old, they have different pacing, but they just tell such a compelling story that just um, have been resonating with people for a long, long time. Oh, these are out of order. What is, what is going on here? Then we get to two more Godzilla films, Godzilla King of the Monsters, Godzilla vs. Kong. My wife loves movies about monsters destroying things, whether they're dinosaurs or Godzilla. So... These are her event films right here. Add to that she really likes Kyle Chandler, so throw Kyle Chandler into a movie about a dinosaur or Godzilla destroying cities, and uh, that is a date night in the Chandler household. Gone Girl, the David Fincher thriller from, what is that now, eight years ago with um, Mr. Affleck in it, and my wife had read the book before we saw the movie, and so she knew what was going to happen. I didn't know anything. I didn't know what to expect. And this movie has like two or three, like, what just happened, Twist? And it was fun to just watch the movie, but it was also fun to watch my wife's reaction to my reaction to the stuff that started taking place. Like, what's going on? And then she's like, just waiting to see what I'm going to do. And then apparently I did have a good enough reaction. The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. The epic uh, Sergio Leone spaghetti western with Clint Eastwood. And uh, the magnum opus of the man with no name trilogy of films i've always been partial to a fistful of dollars but this is probably one has the most acclaim to it and is because of its large scale and everything like that but i I love those uh clint eastwood uh spaghetti westerns with sergio leone good time got this one in my fan mail people have been telling me to watch it especially with the batman coming out it just hasn't happened yet. But I've, I've just only heard amazing, amazing, amazing things about this film, but haven't haven't gotten around to watching it. Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> the reason we own this is because we were in Denver and at my brother's house. They bought it for the kids to watch. Got home and realized they didn't have a Blu-ray player. And I guess at the time, I mean, this was like 10 years ago, I guess my sister-in-law didn't know there's a difference between DVD players and Blu-ray players. And so it was like, oh, I didn't, I just didn't, it was a movie and it was a disc. I just thought it would work. Like, no, no, it would not work. Actually, it says it has a DVD in there, so 
What, what even did happen there? I went, did she not have a DVD player? What an odd story. What happened? Interesting. Huh. Now I'm curious what really did happen with that, that incident. Why couldn't we watch Nomeo and Juliet back in the day? What happened? Grand Budapest Hotel, the Wes Anderson film. I haven't seen it yet. I was going to do a Wes Anderson ranking, but then his new movie came out right as 1,000 other things came out. And I was just trying to watch these Bond movies, Halloween movies, 31 on 31, Denny Villeneuve. Something had to give, and it was Wes Anderson. So I have this one. I've never seen it. I've heard amazing things about it. I heard it's maybe his best movie. So I, I wanted to check it out, but it was it was just too much to get watched. And also, Wes Anderson is so distinct in his style. Watching all of his movies, like binging through his movies, is like eating the same meal three times a day for a week straight. It's just tough to do. The Greatest Showman. Now, this is a movie that opened, uh, when it came out, it opened like very lackluster and then it just never left the top 10 for like months and months and months, which is pretty uncommon these days for that type of type of reaction to a film. And that's because of people like my wife who went to go see it. And then my wife went to go see it every week for like two months straight and took a different friend every single time. And then she would come home and listen to the soundtrack. So I've seen this movie a million times and listened to the soundtrack two million times. Green Book, the Best Picture winner from a few years back, and a surprisingly controversial film in, because of that, where a bunch of people are just like, how on earth did that movie win Best Picture? And it's funny because this is like such a... This minute movie had won Best Picture in 96. It's like, yeah, every Best Picture winner in the 80s and 90s is a movie like this but just the the way of taste change or understanding of race issues and things like that changes and what what makes for prestige in the genre so all of a sudden it was like really why did that movie win how what how what happened there so i i didn't watch i saw it after i believe i watched it after it won best picture maybe that's not true maybe i i don't remember if i was able to get all the best pictures watched before it, it didn't ask us that year but um i was like oh that's Cool, that's good. Feels like a throwback prestige Oscar bait movie, but throwback, not current. And then it won, and it's like, okay, that's, oh, whatever. The Green Knight movie from last year that, uh, it's a movie I can respect it for all the talent on display, but it's so far from my thing. It's so metaphoric and poetic, like visual poetry that I don't, my brain's not wired that way. I didn't get it. I was confused. Greenland. I talked before about interviewing the director of Angel Has Fallen. This is from the same director and totally different film, much better film. Like he's buddies with um, Gerard Butler, who he calls Jerry. I know that because I just talked with him. He's like, yeah, and Jerry did this. And Jerry did like, oh, we call him Gerard Butler. We call him by his first and his last name when we call him Gerard. You just call him casually Jerry. That's a fun thing to know. People that know Jerry, call him Jerry. They did, those that don't know him, call him Gerard Butler. But uh, it's like an end of the world film that's just a real, it plays it serious. It's not play, It's not played like a rock and roll movie like Armageddon or anything. It's like, like what desperation, would, what would you do to try and save your family? And so I, uh, I thought it was, I was thought it was really well done. I thoroughly enjoyed that one. Um, we got uh, Gremlins 1 and 2. Now, Gremlins 1, I, just a classic little Amblin entry-level horror film. Like, if you're trying to get into horror or something a little scary, a little bit fun, Gremlins is a good entry point. Zega 1 is, like, a, one of the weirdest sequels of all time. It just goes bananas. And I saw the second one in the theater when it first came out. I was like, what on earth is this? Even as a kid, I was confused as to what I watched. As I didn't watch it again until a couple years back when we did a 31 on 31 um, creature features. So it's the first time I'd rewatched it in literally 30 years. And as an adult, I also went, what on earth is this movie? Grudge Match. Now, this is a fun one because it teamed up Stallone and Robert De Niro, Raging Bull vs. Rocky in a boxing movie. And it's not nearly as good as the concept sounds, but it is fun. Uh, I saw it in the theater when it first came out uh, opening weekend because of obviously big Rocky fans. Like, oh, i got to go check this out. And I guess this was also my introduction to, to Kevin Hart. But uh, it's not the most memorable of films, but it is fun that it, something like that exists. Then we have The Guardian. This is the first movie I watched after I got married. Uh, my wife and I, um, I don't know what other people do on their honeymoons after they get married, but we went to a hotel and watched The Guardian on the television there. I don't know what 
you kids are up, like, probably not you kids, what you other adults did on your honeymoons, but uh, we watched The Guardian. That's my story for The Guardian, what I remember about The Guardian. Um, I, I mean, I remember, I enjoyed the film too. It's also, it's from Andrew Davis who did The Fugitive, so he's, he's, he's good at making t- intense thrillers and that's what that one is. And so I enjoyed the film, but most importantly, first movie I watched while married. And that's what I did on my honeymoon. So after all of that, we have just now made it through the first row of my Blu-rays, which means we are one third of the way through this video. I have been filming for four hours now and we are one third of the way through the video. But that means we are at one of the mile markers for this project. And if you're still watching, join me down below in the comment section and we will call row number one, Red Apple. If you've made it thus far, put a red apple down below in the comment section. If you can do the little emojis, put a little red apple in there. If you gotta write the word red apple, write red apple. But you are a red apple member of the viewers of this video, you've made it one third of the way through this massive collection video. We've made it to our H's as well as row two and we've got Hacksaw Ridge, Mel Gibson's return to directing that turned out to be a prestige film, but um, he's one of these guys that his directing track record is pretty phenomenal in regards to either prestige or connecting with audiences, but he himself, um, well, he's alienated some people. Let's just put it that way by making some very, 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 very bad life choices. And he's also never been someone that's been terribly prolific as a director. So while his track record and acclaim and awards are, are many, His filmography is not so vast. Then we've got The Hangover. Just such a pleasant surprise when this one came out because the stars of it weren't stars yet. And so it's kind of this movie like, oh, that's like a funny trailer. And then it just made bukus of money and led to a pair of sequels that tarnished the reputation of the the franchise overall because it's one of those ideas that probably shouldn't have been a franchise, probably should have just been a one-off. Then we got our Hannibal Lecter films. First one in here is Manhunter, Silence of the Lambs, and Hannibal, which uh, Manhunter is the same story as Red Dragon, just two different adaptations of the same story. And uh, so it's like this long lost Hannibal Lecter movie where Hannibal Lecter is a very small part of the story. And then when they they remade it, Hannibal Lecter had a much bigger part in, in that one. And then you have Hannibal Rising, which I thought was a terrible prequel that dramatically misread what makes Hannibal Lecter interesting. But well, all that said, Silence of the Lambs is still amazing. We got Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters in 4K. I still haven't checked this one out yet. One of these movies, I haven't heard anyone talk about it, say it's amazing or anything like that, so I haven't taken much time to, to check it out. That'll lead us to my collection of Halloween, ha- Halloween, Halloween Blu-rays and 4Ks. Of course, we got the original one in 4K, classic slasher that obviously kicked off this franchise that has had a very long-standing um Connected with people for now over 40 years, which is pretty remarkable. Kickstarted the career of Jamie Lee Curtis, and uh, she keeps coming back to it every 20 years or so. And uh, then I've got my collection of movies right there for all the ones in the middle. And I, I so I'd, I've seen the original one going back in the day because I was a big John Carpenter fan and like Slashers well enough, but I hadn't seen all the stuff in the middle really. I hadn't I hadn't seen most of that, and so then whenever I decided to watch through them and rank them for my, for my channel, that was a as a fun one. And then now I actually look forward to it now that we're having this current franchise that kind of done some deep dives into the franchise and listened to some books about the making of the movies and all the movies that almost happened, and so that that's always a fun one for me because it's. Um, you can dive in the mythology, anything. And then 4Ks are the, the last two movies in the series, including the extended cut of Halloween Kills. Haven't checked it out yet. I haven't seen the, I mean, I've seen the movie, but I haven't seen the director's cut yet to see if if it's better, how different it is, all that fun stuff. I have, do not have answers to those. The Happening, an M. Night Shyamalan film that is at times so bad it is good. 
it is so strange how quickly this guy went from like, wow, that guy has such amazing attention to detail in his visual style, his storytelling, his twists, his turns, to then also putting out The Happening in the same decade. Woo! Happy Death Day to you, the second one. I really enjoy both of these movies. First one is much more a time loop slasher. The second one is more just having fun with the time loop aspect of it and the mythology. Um, but uh, just the, as I talked about before with Freaky, the guy that makes these, he uh, just has an amazing ability to take these familiar beats, concepts, genres, and mashing them together with slashers and uh, I look forward to see whatever he's going to do next then we got uh, a pair of movies I haven't actually seen any of these that they have been next to each other but the Happy Feet movie and then what is it George Miller right yeah the George Miller Mad Max Fury Road what else has he done Happy Feet of course and then the Harold and Kumar movies that I for whatever reason I just missed all of these I, I haven't seen any of them up to this point in time in my life That'll bring us to a big stack of Harry Potter films. And, you know, I've, I've done reviews of these. I've posted a bunch of rankings, so I don't need to go into too much detail about them. But um, they get plenty of mileage in my household. I'm not, not from me so much, but from my wife and pretty soon from my kids, who are also big Harry Potter fans. The Hateful Eight, uh, Quentin Tarantino's second Western. This one plays more like a play to me. And maybe that's intentional on his part, but... It, it's like single location, dialogue heavy. And uh, I think for that reason, it, it just felt too long to me. For the amount of plot that it has, I don't think it feels like it needs to be three hours long. And if it was shorter and it would have, could have played like Reservoir Dogs as a Western, I think it would have been nice. But at three hours, it just feels, feels maybe a little bit self-indulgent. We got Haunted Mansion, a Eddie Murphy at a of a theme park ride. Haven't seen that one, so can't comment on it. The Heat, the Melissa McCarthy pairing with Sandra Bullock, directed by Paul Feig. I tend to like Paul Feig comedies. I, you know, there's a couple of them that are not good, but uh, The Heat, I, I've always kind of... Um, has been the one that didn't really connect with all that much. Like Bridesmaids really dug it. Spy's amazing. The Heat, given that I like the genre and the two leads and the director... Uh, has always kind of fallen a little bit flat for me. We got Hellboy. I actually only watched these for the first time when the um, uh, new movie came out a couple years back, a few years back. Before that, I hadn't seen the the actual Guillermo del Toro um, Hellboy movies, and so that was a nice, fun adventure into this kind of very rich mythology. Heat, the Michael Mann film that's actually a remake of a different Michael Mann film that turned out to be a major influence on The Dark Knight. Now, I, I've seen it a few times before, but it has been a little bit. I need to, it's one of those ones I definitely need to rewatch because I don't think I really appreciated it at the time that I, I first watched it. And so then people ask me about it all the time and I, I don't have meaningful things to say. These are out of order. We got Hellboy 2. I don't need to much say anything more about it. I said, talked about, like the first one, I hadn't seen that one until the new one came out. Hercules, the animated film. Now, I'm not a big Hercules fan. I feel like this movie should be so much better than it actually is. I don't like the songs in it, really. And then, given that it's about Hercules, I feel like that should be much more exciting than the movie turns out to be. Like, it's energetic, but it's just the, the direction they go with the story and everything. I don't know, it just falls flat for me. Then we have another Hercules This one with Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I haven't checked this one out yet. It's been curious about it because it's Hercules, it's The Rock. You'd think that that would make a bigger splash than the movie did, but it's you know one of these movies that just kind of came and went, and people don't really talk about it all that much. It's like, oh yeah, he was Hercules once, wasn't he? Got Hidden Figures. I, I thought this was a neat little film uh, about a number of women that worked for NASA doing calculations and all the, the racial issues that kind of like went along with that, and just a, a, a story that's able to tackle things, but in like an inspiring way uh, that could point towards the flaws of the fast past and the ignorance and the stupidity while at the same time celebrating something and um, and looking forward. And I, I thought just it was really well done. Thoroughly enjoyed that one. We have uh, The Hills Have Eyes 1 and 2. Haven't seen either one of these movies. Got them in my fan mail. So one of these days I'll make a, a trip through the world of The Hills Have Eyes. 
The Hitman's Bodyguard. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this is the first movie ever that I was invited to a press screening for. This is the first one right here. I believe that is the case. And um, of all the movies, very random one. It's uh, fun enough based purely on the charisma of the leads and just being a fun genre. I thought the second one went too far and just relied entirely on that and was too too much. But the first one, I, I dug it well enough for what it was and just kind of being this uh, a movie that let movie stars be movie stars. Hocus Pocus in 4K. The previously mentioned Daniel Skinner sent me three copies of this movie last year, two Blu-rays and a 4K, as well as the book itself. I was the perfect age for this movie when it came out, and I never saw it until October of last year because Daniel Skinner sent me a thousand copies of him. My daughter really dug it for me. I, I guess I was just too late to the party. Um, I, I, I didn't... I, <laughs> I I know people love this, are very fond of it, and very excited for the new one. For me, it's like, okay, that's that's a thing that exists. Okay, okay, okie dokie. Home Alone 1 and 2. Home Alone, we got this one in our fancy steel book case right there. Perfect age for Home Alone and Home Alone 2. Actually, I believe maybe I either had one of my birthdays or went to a friend's birthday that we went to go see Home Alone 2 for. I love both these movies. Home Alone, the first one, probably one of the movies I've rewatched the most in my life. And that's only escalated over the last 10 years as I've had kids. And they'll just, it'll be like June. And they'll be like, hey, let's watch Home Alone. It's just that rewatchable. It's that charming. It's that funny. Which is strange because a bunch of the, the characters, not actually all that charming. Kevin and his parents, kind of the worst. But somehow it's just got that magic. Hook. The Peter Pan movie about a grown-up Peter Pan that goes back to Neverland and has an adventure. It's got a top-notch cast. It's directed by Steven Spielberg, and I had all the toys when it came out. I was, like, 10 years old or whatever, so we bought all the toys, and I was obsessed with this movie back in the day. So I need to show this one to my kids, see how they respond to it, and, uh... But I had, a, I had a lot of fun with that one growing up. We have The Host. This is one I received in my fan mail. Uh, it's from Bong, the guy that directed Parasite. And so it's one of his one of his early films, of course. But I haven't been able to check this one out just yet. Hot Tub Time Machine. I've seen the first 10 minutes of this movie. And then whatever it was, I was like, I just wasn't in the mood for that type of movie. It was a little bit too too raunchy and crass for whatever mood I was in. It was around the, around the time someone was like getting peed in, in their face or something like that. I was like, not today. Not today. I got to be in the mood. Uh, the mood to uh, be into the pee in the face humor. That's, uh, that's not an everyday thing for me. So I haven't seen the whole thing. So one of these days I got to finish that one. That'll bring us to a whole collection of Hotel Transylvania films. I'm new, well, I'm not entirely new to the franchise. I hadn't seen the first two ones, and I got invited to a press screening for the third one, took my kids to it, and I was kind of like afterwards like, eh, I wish I hadn't brought my kids to this one. This one's a little bit too weird, creepy, crass, farty uh, for my kids. And then I rewatched all four of them when the new one came out this year, and they seemed to dig it more than I did. I was like, I don't know that I want my kids as much into this much... Uh, fart humor and everything like that. But they, they, they are the charms. I think the first one in particular, with the third one is like the weakest of the bunch, and that was the first one that I saw. So it's not a great entry point into the series. We've got Howard the Duck in 4K. Um, not a fan of this movie, even though George Lucas presents the movie, as it says right there. Not a fan of that movie, but uh, have it in 4K because sometimes in my fan mail, people like to send me things they know I'm not actually excited about. We got a couple of different versions of How the Grinch Stole Christmas. We got the classics one that I grew up with with all the fun songs that is, of course, amazing. And then we have the live action one that I find creepy, really creepy. And um, it must be like an acquired taste or whatever, because I know people that swear by this movie. And I, I watched it for the first time a couple years back when I did a Grinch ranking, and I was like... What is this movie? I'm not getting this. This doesn't fit the spirit of the original at all. I don't like any of these subplots that are supposed to add depth or whatever to this. This only makes everything much worse. Then we have a trilogy of How to Train Your Dragon films. Great trilogy. Great family entertainment. 
Great world, great characters all across the board. Just a real achievement. I'm a big fan of these movies. Um, there's a TV show. My kids watch the TV show too. So the, this world and Hiccup and all them, my family spent a lot of time playing in that realm. We got Ang Lee's Hulk on 4K. Uh, you know, a movie that... I can appreciate what Ang Lee was going for, wanting to make this movie exploring anger and what that really means and how do you, like, really visualize comic book panels in real life. It was one of those movies that probably, uh... It was when they were trying to figure out how to do comic book movies still. And they hadn't cracked the code quite yet. So they brought in this literal Oscar-caliber Oscar director to do Hulk and made a not-so-great film. Then we got the Humanity Bureau, one of these uh, Nicolas Cage thrillers from the last decade. And I uh, ha haven't checked this one out yet, but I have seen a number of those those ones. We got a couple of... Okay, we got the four-movie collection for The Hunger Games and then Catching Fire, which means I can pull that one out of rotation. Uh, yeah, they're all... The other, uh, yeah, they're in there, so we'll just keep this one in here. So Hunger Games, I've always had an interesting relationship with those ones because I, I wasn't a big fan of the, the book because I just, even on the concept, I just thought it was so dark, kids killing each other, but it was like this, yeah, teenagers, check this out. I was like, wow, that's a really dark story to give to teenagers. And then the movies came out, and they're PG-13, and it's still kind of the same feelings. The second one, I think, is my favorite of them, but uh, kind of ends at a weird point with the other ones. So I guess there's like a prequel coming out next year or something like that. I'm curious about that, and uh, yeah, I'll rewatch all of them and do an updated ranking, maybe review them, I don't know. Something like that, but it's coming. The Hurt Locker. Haven't seen this one yet, so can't comment on it, but um, you know, one of these prestige films that... Uh, really kind of launched the career of Jeremy Renner, but haven't seen it, so can't say much about it. Kicking off the eyes is I Am Legend, the second adaptation of a book that was previously adapted back in the 70s with Charlton Heston and made for, this time made for a movie that made a big impact on me the first time I watched it, but also made me go, I never want to rewatch that um, without wanting to go into too much about the plot of the movie, in case you haven't seen it, what goes on with Will Smith and his best friend um, was too tragic for me to be able to rewatch, too traumatizing. But otherwise, I actually dug the movie, and there's two different endings to it, and they're apparently talking about doing a sequel to it, and with the to do a sequel, you have to use the ending that they didn't actually put in the theatrical version, which is kind of funny that way that that's all playing out then we have the ice age films now i hadn't really seen any of these until january of this year when i did a ranking of the ice age movies but i, I just missed them um they came out when i was like 23 why would i go see ice age when i'm 23 years old and so these movies that for some of you are a big part of your childhood for me, my memory of Ice Age is just they, they marketed them using that squirrel trying to get the acorn, what is it, Scrat or whatever, and those are memorable because they're just like little shorts, and so it played as a very memorable trailer for the franchise, but I hadn't actually watched any of the movies from beginning to end, I don't think. Maybe I'd done some events when I worked in Church World when we showed one of them. Maybe my kids watched them when one was in the room, but I hadn't really watched them, so watched them. There was some fun to be had. Especially, my, my kids were actually really on board with it. They were like, let's watch the next one. Can we watch the next one? I was like, oh, cool. Sometimes they, I try and watch stuff with them because I'm excited about it. Like, you want to check this out? And they're like, no. Okay, kids. But that one, they, they were totally down for it. Have Inception, the Christopher Nolan dream heist movie that uh, uh, blew my mind when I saw it. it just, I just thought it was so smart, so clever, and they pulled it off. And... They take this idea about dreams and have fun with it, but also make a very accessible film that makes you think afterward and you can debate it. That's I just thought it was so cool what they pulled off with the film. Independence Day, I was the perfect age when the original one came out. Uh, I, like I'm from the, the era of Will Smith's rise to fame. Everybody at my age just loves Will Smith because the back-to-back -back years of Independence Day, Men in Black... And then just had a string of hits for the next 20 years after that. And he was just so cool, so fun. And Independence Day was the start of that, where at the time he was just the Fresh Prince. He was just on the sitcom. He was a rapper. 
And it's like, okay, but it's leading a blockbuster. Wow, is really, can he do this? And then it was right after Jurassic Park, and Jeff Goldblum was in there, and he was doing the same shtick, and it was amazing. And then, 20 years later, we got a sequel that I don't hate as much as most people, but they had 20 years to come up with something clever, and they did not. <laughs> they did not. And some of the stuff they did come up with, very weird. We got the Indiana Jones, The Complete Adventures. Pretty cool packaging here. You got the sleeve, and then on the inside, you got this little booklet deal. So, fun, fun times. Obviously, some of my favorite movies of all time. And next year, we finally are going to get another one of them when Harrison Ford is literally 80 years old. He turns 80 in just a couple of months, which, wow, Harrison Ford, 80 years old. Wow, where does the time go? Uh, Incendies, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but the one of Denis Villeneuve's non-English speaking films. I did a ranking of his movies in October when Dune came out, but I didn't include his foreign language films uh, as per the reason I mentioned before about Wes Anderson movies of I just ran out of time. There was too many things I needed to watch, too many ideas I was excited about and couldn't do all of them. And unfortunately, uh, I didn't get this one watched. Now, from your perspective, all I did was throw a movie at the table. There was no reason to, to, to be act weird about it. But what you don't know is I also have candles on my table to create a soothing atmosphere while filming this video for, I don't know, I guess the rest of my life. And so I actually threw the, the Blu-ray just then when I put it down into the candle and could have set this room on fire, which would have been awesome because I'm filming so you could have seen my house burn to the ground. Um... That would have made this one of the most memorable videos I've ever put out. Maybe the most memorable Blu-ray collection anyone had ever put out if they actually burned their house down. And by, by they, I mean me. You can tell my brain's not doing well because I don't know who, which tense to use for myself and pronouns to use for myself in this rabbit trail. That's not good. We're not even halfway done and my brain is frightened. Injustice, the... Animated DC film from last year based off the comic run as well as the video game, and it is not good. It is unfortunately not good. It is... It takes what should be like a safe, fun bet of let's... What if Superman went cuckoo and the rest of the Justice League had to try and stop him and you know your own little civil war of them breaking up. And then it just adds in... It makes the mistake of giving them an actual villain into it that didn't need to be there. And then it just does some weird stuff where they literally go into the afterlife and bring someone back. Weird. Not a good idea. In the Heights, one of the musicals that came out last year. And uh, what, one of these movies that my wife loves musicals. We, we talked about this before with um, uh, Greatest Showman. And I couldn't take my wife to the press screening of this when it happened. So I took my sister and she had a lot of fun with that. And I think my... Uh, my sister has a, a daughter that's in high school and it's in musicals. And I think she was like, her daughter was jealous. That's so that's kind of fun. Um, and then my wife was jealous because she didn't get to go. And literally the day that it dropped in theaters and on HBO Max, I had like a press screening or something. Something I went, I went to the movies, came back and my wife is watching it. Like she couldn't wait to watch it. And then she watched it immediately the next day. And then it was only on HBO Max for 30 days. And then as soon as it dropped off, my wife's like, when does it come out on video? When can we buy it? She literally wanted to buy it immediately. And then they do the two, two weeks before they come out, they do, release them on digital before you can buy the disc. She's like, can we just buy the digital? I want to watch it again. I was like, no, no, I, I want to have the physical copy. And she's like, yeah, but I want to watch it right now. Just wait two more weeks. So that that's what my wife is like. Every year she picks a musical. Like it wasn't West White Side Story. She didn't go for West Side Story, probably because too tragic, too sad, uh, too Romeo and Juliet. And so then In the Heights is like much more inspirational. And so, uh, yeah, she, she ate that one up. Then we have our, we have, do I have it? We, Insidious 2, 3, and 4. We don't have the first one, but we have 2, 3, and 4. And these are, uh, I don't know, they're, they're not the best of uh, James, the, the first one was directed by James Wan, but that's the best James Wan film. Um, kind of like a prototype for The Conjuring a little bit. And it was kind of his, another partnership with Lee Winnell, who directed one of them, wrote them. And there's a really neat idea, and there's some fun characters, but also a franchise that just kind of felt like it was going on a little bit too long. And um, 
I was a little bit late to the party. I hadn't seen any of them until I saw the last key. And that was actually a fun story in the theater because by fun story, I mean one of the worst theater experiences I ever had in a certain sense. It's just a group of obnoxious high school boys sitting right in front of me. And before the movie starts, they're watching pornography on their phones. Like... <laughs> just like, guys, this is uncomfortable. Like, what? Are you are you seriously like we're this is a crowded theater you freaking weirdos, and then in the movie as you move in the back half there's a part where a girl gets knocked out and she's laying on a table and she's not like wearing an inappropriate outfit she's not it's not designed to be enticing it's just a normal t-shirt that's a little bit tight and girls have certain curves to their bodies, and so it it cuts this one angle just the way the shot was. One of these curves is on display. Um, not even really all that provocative, just that's a part of a body that a girl has. And <laughs> as soon as that starts happening, every time this girl appears on screen, I start hearing this noise in front of me. Like, And it turns, and I was trying to figure out, like, what is this? Someone's like alarm on their phone. And I realize, oh, it's these guys in front of me. Every time the girl shows up, this guy's playing some meme that's just, it's just crass. It's like, ugh. High schoolers, why are you doing this? Inglorious Bastards, the uh, Quentin Tarantino World War II fan fiction that uh, is just a classic example of a movie only Quentin Tarantino could make. Just wild, it's crazy, it's clever, it's exciting, it's funny, it's tense, it's all of the above. Inside Out, I just thought this was such a clever idea and a movie that took the, takes this abstract concept about cognitive development in the developmental phases and finds a way to visualize them for children and tell a story that my children can enjoy, but also can teach them about themselves and the way that their brains are developing and things like that. Interstellar, one of Christopher Nolan's most ambitious films, you know, one of his more flawed films, I'd say, that kind of doesn't quite know where to go with everything, gets a little bit weird in the third, a little bit weird, gets pretty weird in the third act, but a bunch. I love a bunch of things about this movie. Not not quite one of his masterpieces. Not an Interstellar, but still very good. Iron Giant, the Brad Bird animated film that really put him on the map, that led him working to Pixar, that nobody saw when it first came out, but has become a beloved classic that is widely regarded as one of the greatest animated films of all time. And it is a very cool film. Iron Mask, a movie that stars both Jackie Chan and Arnold Schwarzenegger and is a bizarre, bizarre, bizarre film. I don't know how it got made. I don't know what it was supposed to be, but I... What a... Yeah, it's something. Isn't it romantic? A deconstruction of rom-coms from Rebel Wilson that I just got a big, gigantic kick out of. Like, it, it's poking fun of all the, the tropes while having fun with them, too. Then I'm running out of time before my camera kicks off, so I'm going to do these real quick. It, a great adaptation of the first half of It. I love this. This is one of my favorite Stephen King adaptations. Um, just scary, spooky, and nailed teenagers and their awkwardness and everything. It, the miniseries, I didn't see it way back in the day, but I did watch it leading up to the release of It Chapter 2. It's fun I'm watching it. I also watched it with my kids because I'm probably either a great parent or a terrible parent. It's a Wonderful Life in Steelbook. Never seen it. Need to watch it. Really need to watch it. That'll bring us to the Jays. And just so you're wondering, as I was filming this, they dropped the first trailer for She-Hulk. So there was actually like a 20 minute pause right there where I decided to shoot a video in the middle of shooting this video, edited it, posted it. Just a short one take, nothing too fancy about it, made a thumbnail, <laughs> but yeah. Making this epic magnum opus wasn't enough for me. I decided to also to post a video. <laughs> Probably not my best choice. Jackie Brown, the Quentin Tarantino film that's his only movie that is based off of someone else's work, overtly based off someone else's work. Obviously, has lots of homages and similarities, but this one is based off of a writing of Elmore Leonard. And uh, I, I think that always kind of hurt this film a little bit in Quentin Tarantino is so, so distinct in his storytelling and with his characters and his dialogue that when you try to do it with these kind of Elmore Leonard plot with his own style and way of constructing things, I I didn't I wasn't quite feeling it. Um, it's still good, it's still a good movie, but I, I thought it kind of meandered a little bit and wasn't didn't work as well as it should have. That'll bring us to Jack Reacher one and two. 
And they are, I guess, good enough little Tom Cruise vehicles, but pretty bad adaptations of the source material as Tom Cruise is just horribly miscast. And I've heard some people like, try and defend it. I mean, the whole point of acting is to be able to disappear into different roles, and he does a great job, and I really like the movies, I really like him in the films. Jack Reacher in the novels, like this defining, the defining characteristic of Jack Reacher is that he's gigantic. That he's six foot five, 240 pounds, just like this hulking mass of a dude. And Tom Cruise is five foot seven, maybe only five foot six. He's a very short dude. And uh, as like to be it, like this hulking action star, he, he's short for that. He's just not Jack Reacher. He just is not. And he's also too much... You know, Jack Reacher isn't like this talking person. And Tom Cruise is this charismatic movie star. It's just a terrible fit. They launched this TV show on Amazon a few months back. Much better adaptation. It's a direct translation of one of the books. Adaptation of one of the books with Alan Richardson as the star. Much better. Much better. Um, Jack Reacher. Classic example of... Sure, of course, Tom Cruise, better actor, better movie star, amazing screen presence. Alan Richardson, though, is just much better for the part. Just obviously. Jack Ryan. Now, this is a franchise I, I kind of grew up with because Clear and, clear and Present Danger. Why, why are these in this order? Clear and Present Danger came out when I was in, what, middle school, you know, peak Harrison Ford fame. Of course, peak Harrison Ford fame lasted for about 20 years. But um, so I saw that one. That's always been my favorite. But um, they just had a string of these thrillers back in the day. And then uh, the most recent one with Chris Pine, directed by Kenneth Branagh, for whatever reason, just didn't work. I thought it just kind of fell real flat. It just kind of was missing something. And then they got this John Krasinski TV show that I actually kind of like out of it. But uh, a fun world, not always the best movies. Then we got our Jaws selections. Jaws is one of the great thrillers of all time the movie that kick-started Spielberg's fame and kind of kept him on top ever since and then we have two three and four right over here and um there's some fun to be had in these four is a shockingly awful film Joker in fun steelbook fashion right there every time I have a steelbook I feel like I have to do this the same exact opening motion but uh, I thoroughly enjoyed this film. It's brutal, it's tragic, but it's a comic book movie that's not an action film. It's not a sci-fi film. It's like a, a serious movie about a guy's descent into insanity. His pursuit of his confidence turns him into a true monster. John Carter, the adaptation of the, what is Edgar Rice Burroughs novels from a hundred years ago that were a big influence on Star Wars from the same guy that came up with Tarzan. From one of the stars of Pixar, and for whatever reason, the movie was the wrong movie at the wrong time with the wrong marketing and the wrong title, and it just, it didn't work um, with people. It's not a bad movie at all. It was just, for whatever reason, didn't catch hold of the where popular culture was at. It's kind of disappeared. So I, I've, I've seen it. I've only seen it once. I need to watch it again and see how I can kind of connect with it if I like it a little bit more. And um, But yeah, one of these movies was just odd the way that it should have been better. It should have been better received. And for whatever reason, it wasn't. So what I just got in my fan mail this past month, John dies at the end. I think I know how this one ends, but I haven't seen it. So maybe, maybe my prediction that John dies at the end is... Faulty, and I just trusted the title a little bit too much. Then we got a trilogy of John Wick films. Now, of course, this is one of the premier action franchises of the last 10 years that reignited Keanu Reeves' career, just established him as a powerhouse, as an action star. And what's so fascinating about this is the first one legitimately came out of nowhere. No one was talking about it. No one had heard of it. And a month before the movie came out, this trailer dropped that was like, he's mad because his dog was killed. And that's what people were talking about. Like, what a weird concept for a movie. But it also, it looks kind of cool. It looks like it might actually be good. But this, what is this premise? And then it turned into this franchise that has been a really big deal, obviously. And uh, launched two different directors' careers as directors with the guy that directed these, the credited director of the first one, and then also David Leach, who was the 
uncredited director of the first one and then turned these guys into like you refer to them as the John Wick stunt crew whenever they do something so um, we got a fourth one coming out soon Juliet Naked this is kind of like an indie rom-com of sorts I don't know if indie's the right word to describe it kind of offbeat rom-com and it's a rom-com but not in the traditional sense and I really enjoyed this movie just a, a nice uh, set of characters interesting scenarios and it's funny without just being overt joke setups. And so um, if you're in the mood for um, a rom-com that's not, you know, like Matthew McConaughey, Kate Hudson type rom-com and check it out. Also, it, it is rated R and it does have naked in the title. It's not a raunchy movie. Like I'm sure, sure there's some crass jokes in there. It's like it's it's like it's like made for adults, but it's not like naked people running around as the title. The naked refers to an album in the movie, in which case it's it's acoustic is what it's referred to, not actual naked people. Um, whether that was something you wanted or didn't want from the film. Then we got some Jumanji's. I guess we're missing the, the one that goes there in the middle. Um, the I guess less, got lost somewhere. That's been watched a lot. So 1995 original Jumanji uh, came out when I was in middle school. And I'm sure I went to go see it. But actually it wasn't like a big movie in my childhood or anything. Like, I mean, I saw it. I remember. I remember everything like that. But I didn't think too much of it at the time. It's from Joe Johnson, director I, I, I'm a big fan of. And then uh, we had the, this new continuation of it that is, a, that is a continuation, but it's mostly a reboot. And the original one was like so much better than it had any right to be. Like, doing another Jumanji, really? Is that a good idea with The Rock? What are we doing here? What a good movie. What a great adventure film that's really re rewatchable. Sequel, not so much. I, th I thought they really missed the mark with the sequel. I just kind of, something wasn't quite right about it. Then we got The Jungle Book, the live action remake that was shot entirely on a soundstage. And it's literally just this little boy running around on a green screen and blue screens. And everything else is CGI, which is just such a tremendous achievement. What technology can do these days, it is wild, wild, wild what they can do. That'll lead us to our Jurassic Park movies. First off, we got Jurassic Park, one of the best sci-fi adventure films of all time. I actually just started re-listening to the audiobook uh, a couple days ago. And um, both the book and the movie are both great at what they're trying to do. And, you know, of course, the... The book is able to have more detail and it's a little bit more cynical and the movie's a little bit more maybe optimistic and naive uh, in, in, in a certain sense. Both of them are really good. Um, both of them use their mediums to great potential. Lost World, I've always felt like it was a underwhelming sequel. It has its moments. It has great sequences in it, but the overall, it's like a movie that has some fun characters, amazing set pieces but with a, a story that just doesn't tie them all together and then all of a sudden we're in San Diego and it's a Godzilla movie with the T-Rex running around. Durr. Jurassic Park 3, Joe Johnston movie once again and uh, a very thin Jurassic Park film. Just shockingly thin plot to it. It's fun to go back to an island. It's so great to have Alan Grant back but just not enough substance. It's a movie that had a very troubled production and all sorts of stuff happened and the end result is, well, thin. Jurassic World, great Taco Bell movies, I, I call them. Um, cinematic junk food, cinematic fast food, and this is one of the great ones of all time. It's stupid. The original Jurassic Park is smart. C clever characters, great mix of characters that could explore ideas. And so even when dinosaurs aren't eating people, you love to hear the characters talk about the idea of bringing dinosaurs back. And then this is just a dumb movie where Chris uh, Pratt rides a motorcycle with Velociraptors. I'm totally fine with that. I am totally fine with that. I'm hoping that's what we get in this new one. If, even if it's dumb, I don't care as long as it's fun. And we have Fallen Kingdom, which is dumb, but also not fun. I didn't mind it when I first saw it, but it really sat poorly with me with time. It aged really bad. Just a sour film about dinosaurs going extinct. The whole fun of the franchise is that they're brought back. So the idea of them going extinct and dining on the island, why would I want to watch that? Justice League Dube, one of the animated DC films from the last decade. And I've seen a whole bunch of these ones, done some rankings about them. And they're, they're fun watches that are able to be a little bit more comic book accurate, a little bit more nerdy, have more kind of side characters. 
And in the way that, you know, when you make a $200 million, $300 million Justice League movie, you're trying to be mainstream and make it for a very broad audience. These are really made for people that want to get comic book nerdy. And so I, I have a lot of fun with those. Another one of those ones. Actually, this one, I enjoyed this one so much that I went and rewatched the whole continuity. So Apocalypse War is actually the last one in this about a like eight year continuity of movies that started with Flashpoint Paradox, which is the the first one and the last one are like the two best ones. I love the the idea of Flashpoint and um, the timeline changing in um, Thomas Wayne Batman, and then but so I watched Apocalypse War, which is like super duper dark end game for the DC universe, like bleak, bleak, bleak. And watching, I was like, man, that was awesome. I got to go watch all these again. So I watched all of them, put out a video about it. It was pretty cool. <sighs> Justice Leagues. One of the most colossal disappointments of all time, Justice League 2017. And a movie that, when I first watched it, I was like, that was weird. It's kind of nice to see everybody, but that was kind of weird. What's, what's off with this? What's going on with this movie? And then afterwards, you heard all the rumors of everything that kind of went down and how WB just ruined the film and the original cut was much longer. And then they demanded a two-hour runtime and reshot enormous chunks of it and leveraged the death of Zack Snyder's daughter to, to boot him out and bring Joss Whedon into fix it and every change they made made it worse and I just assumed that Justice League, Zack Snyder's Justice League was going to be like Batman v Superman, ambitious but flawed um, trying some stuff but not really able to pull it all off and then we got it and it was actually really good, they actually did it, they pulled it off and Zack Snyder was allowed to tell the story he wanted to tell and, you know, the one we would have gotten in the theater if he'd been able to finish it, it wouldn't have been three hours. So I don't know what that would have been. But when he got to tell his his magnum opus, I thought it was something really special and I, I really enjoyed it. We've made it to the K's with Karate Kid. And this is a fun one right here because this is a collector's set of Karate Kid 1, 2, and 3 that they put out this last fall. And Sony actually sent this to me. It was with Sony, right? Yes. Whoever it was. Sony sent this to me for free, and that was cool. As someone that Karate Kid is a major part of my childhood, and now with Cobra Kai and everything, now a part of my adult life as well, and got the fancy collector's edition 4K with special features and pristine picture quality, fun packaging and everything. So got that one from them, and uh, thank you guys for sending that to me. It is greatly appreciated. And I guess that'll mean I can remove this one from this stack. We got Karate Kid, the remake. A lot of people not crazy about this movie. Um, I, I've always enjoyed it. I thought they did a good job with it. You know, you can criticize it for calling it the Karate Kid when he should be called the Kung Fu Kid because they're not in Japan. And Jackie Chan does not do karate. And um, if you want to complain that it's a stupid title and kind of an offensive title that people are like, well, it's the same thing. I, I know what you're saying, but yeah, you know why they call it Karate Kid. We all know why they did that. That's a major brand and, and people know what it is. And as soon as you change that, then you lose that. So did you not want Jackie Chan to be the star of it as our new version of the Mr. Miyagi character? Or did you want to change the title of the movie not do it? I, we know why they did it. It's branding it's marketing it's that stuff but uh and i just thought it was great to see jackie chan in that kind of role um and jaden smith uh, sure it was a project that will smith used to try and launch his kid's career and bought the producing rights so i, I believe will smith is a producer on cobra kai even though he has nothing to do with it just because he controls some of the rights to karate kids so that he could make a movie with his kid but you know jaden did fine I, that's not the issue with the movie or anything like that so i, I dug it well, we got uh, uh, Kick-Ass. I've actually only seen this movie one time. I was I was hoping to watch through it again and do a Matthew Vaughn ranking when King's Man came out, but it was just such a busy month that that just wasn't a possibility. So I don't have much to say about it because I saw the movie 10 years ago just one time, so I need to watch it again. The Kid Who Would Be King. I thought it was a fun little uh, fantasy adventure that came out a few years back for the whole family. Nothing too memorable, but good nonetheless. And... Um, 
you know, felt a little bit different. Didn't feel like most other movies like that. Then we got Kiki's Delivery Service. One I got in fan mail. Someone trying really hard to do me to do a Studio Ghibli ranking. And uh, maybe someday. But uh, I haven't seen a lot of Studio Ghibli. But they're not on my wavelength what I have seen. That it's like something I can watch and be like, well, this is really well done. I can see why other people love this. But this is not my thing. This is not the sort of thing I naturally gravitate towards. So I'm not sure what to make of this. Kill Bill 1 and 2. Ooh, we got a few different versions. Okay. This is a tricky one. We got the two for pack and then we have the individual ones. These ones have the special features, but these ones are an individual pack. Let's keep all of them in, in here. But uh, Quentin Tarantino's Martial arts film that's also a bit of a Western and told in epic fashion. Um, it came out right as I was kind of exiting my, my being into my Hong Kong cinema phase. And so maybe the perfect time for me to be into it because I was also really into Quentin Tarantino, of course. And uh, I, I don't know. I, I always they, I never have, have loved it as much as I thought I would in light of how much I love all the ingredients to it. I think maybe it's because it's 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 probably too much of he's taking a, a, these series of genres and these types of stories that are normally not epics and making an epic out of it. And I don't know if that was the right way to go. And I thought the second one was a little bit, well, it's all about killing bill. And that, that section was not as spectacular as one would hope. Then we got our King Kongs. We got, King Kong 75, and we have got King Kong Ultimate Edition, Peter Jackson's King Kong. And uh, I haven't watched this one yet, but I've seen the King Kong from Peter Jackson a few times. And it's one of these movies that there's some things that I think maybe are a little bit funky about it, maybe spends a little bit too much time meandering at the beginning. But when it does something well, it does it really well and like manages to make you really care about the relationship between this woman and this very, very, very tall ape. And then the action scenes, some of them are just phenomenal. The King Kong versus the T-Rex is, is an amazing sequence. We got our Kingsman films. The first one was such a... Oh, we got Steelbook. Ah! We got uh, um, just such a fresh and exciting spin on the spy genre that was so exciting and so much energy and everything, the dialogue, the characters, the action sequences. And it feels like the, the franchise hasn't been able to catch capture that again. Golden Circle, I wasn't really a fan of, like at all. <laughs> it's it like let, you capture all the aesthetically, the energy of the first one, but have a story that just goes in all the wrong directions, picks the wrong characters to kill off and the wrong ones to continue and the wrong mix of everything. Then the new one came out, King's Man, and I really dug it, but it seems like most other people did not really dig the film. And that was like, it was one of those movies you watch it and it was like, man, that was a great story about a father and his son and his worldview and trying to be a different type of man. And um, then people saw... That's not what other people's on the film. That's so I, I really dug it. Here's what I really need to watch. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. The Shane Black film that was in many ways kind of responsible for the resurgence of Robert Downey Jr.'s career because he'd been, um, had all these issues with the law, drugs, and then he does this one as kind of his comeback film and it, it started to spark something. And this is the movie, the partnership of them working together led to Shane Black directing and writing uh, Iron Man 3. I've only heard amazing things about it from people that know what types of movies I would like. They're like, oh, of course you'd love that one. You'd love that movie. And I just haven't watched it yet. So I, I, I've got to fix that one one of these days. I need to find some way to just slow down on all, a bunch of this stuff and, and get it watched. Knives Out, the Ryan Johnson whodunit. I, I think this is a great little film that uh, is fun, lively characters. Of course, an amazing cast, but a whodunit where you're really trying to figure out who done it and you care has all the twists and turns and it's just a fun movie um, that especially as a follow up to all the drama surrounding Last Jedi and then he does this one it's like that's just a good one no reason to argue fight about it just a good movie we got Krampus the Christmas monster movie haven't watched it yet almost did I was I was going to be on a 
podcast talking about Christmas horror movies and bought it. And then they changed up what we were going to talk about. We were talking about Gremlins or something like that. So I, I didn't end up watching it, but I have it. And it was so close to watching it, but it didn't happen. And finally, we got Kung Fu Panda. Uh, a set of movies. I didn't watch them when they first came out because they're too old. And then watched them over the last few years with my kids for the first time. I was like, man, those are those are really good. Like, they, they're as silly and they're good in the ways you expect them to be good and entertaining. But then they're also a little bit, a lot more heartfelt than you're expecting. So I thought that was a very nice, pleasant surprise. So we're right around the midpoint of this video and we've made it to the L's. We got LA Confidential, real nice cop detective noir film from the late 90s with Russell Crowe right as he was transitioning into the A-list. Um, just Real solid film. If you haven't seen L.A. Confidential, I do highly recommend that one. Got Layer Cake, a Matthew Vaughn film I haven't seen yet. Been meaning to watch for almost 20 years now. <laughs> this is the movie that like was the movie that came out right before Daniel Craig did James Bond. Actually, I guess maybe it... Like, I think I might have seen it, like, right way back in the day, but, like, a long time, maybe. But I don't even know if that did happen. Like, I don't remember if it happened or not. But, um, like, one of these movies, I haven't had a good watch of it. Certainly not in a very long time. But uh, with the way the world has played out with him being Bond for 15 years, Matthew Vaughn going on to have a nice career. And then before that, he worked on Lock, Stock, and Snatch. And so that's kind of why I first initially came on my radar. It's like one of the guys that worked on Snatch and Lock, Stock has another movie kind of in the same ballpark, but a different director, not Guy Ritchie, and then haven't really watched it. Still haven't really watched it. And then almost did that Matthew Vaughn film. It was going to give me my good reason to watch it. And then I didn't do that video. The Lego. Uh, these are these are out of order. Throw this guy right down here. Lady and the Tramp. The uh, Disney classic that I don't know that it's actually one of the classics. But it's old and it's Disney. Therefore, it's a Disney classic. And it's got some iconic shots. But I it's kind of dull. It's kind of like, I guess it's nice to do a dog romance. But... Whatever. Lady in the Water, um, for me, this is when M. Night jumped the shark. Uh, the Village, I thought was a misfire, but at least I saw what he was doing with it. Like, I was like, okay, there's a lot of talent here. And then Lady in the Water, I was like, this is just pretentious. This is ridiculous. This is not a good idea. I do not like this. La La Land. Um, the movie that was a uh, uh, Damien Chazelle musical about people striving for greatness in their careers. And a um, bunch of people and, and critics absolutely love this movie. I thought it was good. Uh, I get it. Uh, I don't know about calling it the best musical in 50 years or anything like that. Seems like a movie that really plays to the, the Hollywood crowd of people in Hollywood really love movies about people in Hollywood. And so then it really resonates with people pursuing their careers in Hollywood because of the nature of the story and um, and it is well done. Last Boy Scout, the Arnold Schwarzenegger action film, sending up Arnold Schwarzenegger action films. There's a lot of really fun commentary in it. Um, it doesn't all work, doesn't all come together, but a movie, and it's kind of like a movie couldn't decide if it want to go PG-13 or rated R, and are we making an action movie or are we making fun of action movies? It never fully nails all of that. But it gets enough of it right to be a good time. Leap, a animated film. Uh, my daughter had a lot of fun with this one. Used to watch it quite a bit. I think she forgot about it. Hasn't watched it in a while. But she used to we used to watch it all the time. Legends of the Guardians. The Owls of Gahul. The Zack Snyder Owl movie. That I, I watched for the first time when I did my Zack Snyder ranking um, last year. And... Uh, I, I, I didn't think it I didn't think it fully worked. It didn't come together entirely for me, Pro largely because it's um it's like a PG animated movie for kids, and then when it does violence, it's like Zack Snyder vicious. Like you just feel the claws and the danger surrounding all of it. It's like I don't know if that's the right direction to go with this particular property. Then we got a bunch of Lego movies. The original was just such a fresh, funny film that was like Lego well, that's a terrible idea for a movie and then it just really worked they found the right way to do kind of this matrix meta thing that just brought it all together really well and then with the second one they did took it to this whole other level made it a musical and I don't know that it all works I still have some issues with it but 
I, I love that how bananas and weird and bonkers they went with it and this the direction that they took it. Um, the more time passes, the more that I appreciate the Lego movie too. And it also doesn't hurt that my, my kids um, listen to the soundtrack a bazillion times. The Lego Ninjago movie. Now, this is a one that was a bit of more of a misfire um, for me that they... My kids watch the Lego Ninjago show. They seems my son used to watch it all the time. It seems like he forgot about it. So whenever this came out, it was a pretty big deal and went to go see it and everything. Um, but it's like a, they took a show that had its own mythology and then they're like, okay, here's the stuff that worked in the Lego movie. Let's try and mash them two together. And you don't, you don't need to do that. You already had a you had a story of mythology that worked. You didn't have to reinvent it and fix it. Lego Batman movie, the spinoff from the Lego movie involving Batman that turned out to actually be a really good Batman movie as well as a really good Lego movie that was kind of heartfelt, funny, chaotic, all of that fun stuff that you want from one of these while having a bazillion Lego cameos. Batman, Family Matter. As I mentioned here before, we've got a whole bunch of these Lego movies that are superheroes that we, we we throw on from time to time. I guess that the Lego Flash movie should be in this section, I suppose. But oh well, fix that in the future, maybe. Probably forget to. But yeah, we got a ton of them. Watch them pretty regularly. The Leprechaun complete movie collection. This is one of the few, very very few franchises. I tried to do a ranking of it. For St. Patrick's Day, I was going to do a leprechaun-a-thon and rank them. And then I got to like the third one. I was like, none of these are good. I can't do it. Can't do it. And so just at the best, I wouldn't give it a positive review. And that's not what I want. My, I don't want my rankings to be. And here's why this one sucks the least. Still sucks, but the least suckage. I don't want to do that. doesn't feel like the, the right vibe and energy. Got the Lethal Weapon Quadrilogy. The quintessential buddy cop franchise and um just uh I, I think these are all good all of them are enjoyable the first two are like special the first one is like very serious about a suicidal cop the second one's like the rock and roll fun version of it and the other two are still enjoyable they lose a bit of the edge and kind of go on maybe a bit too long but they continue the arcs of the characters and the family that they form through the the police force and everything is like, oh, that worked life now this was a uh, Kind of like it's kind of like Alien. Uh, it's a lot like Alien, um, just with a more c closer to Earth and closer to our reality, not so distant future, but the same kind of thrills of in a space station and there's an alien on it that's killing people. Great cast, but not necessarily a script that gives them a whole lot to do anything with the great cast. So I remember enjoying it, but I haven't. I, I probably need to rewatch it. I didn't watch it with my wife, and I wonder. If, I wonder if she'd like it. I wonder how she'd respond to that. She might like it. Got the lighthouse. I actually saw this at a film festival, a uh, fantastic fest, like a month, two months before it, it actually came out, and it was a surprise screening. We didn't know we were watching it, so we were like, "Hey, what are we gonna watch?" And then the director of Locked Out and Eggers, and he's like, "Hey!" And every, everyone that knew who he was was like. Oh, we're watching the lighthouse. I was like, oh, with the black and white thing with the with the Willem Dafoe and and Batman. Uh, well, okay, and uh, then then I saw it, and not not really my thing. A little bit more metaphoric, allegoric, poetic, and trippy. Not sure what's real and what's not. Not really my thing, but. Fair enough. Sometimes not every movie is supposed to be for me. Limit Knitless. I thought uh, a fun little concept for a thriller that its biggest problem is that the, the basic premise is about these pills that make you super smart, but the script itself doesn't feel that smart. And that gets you into trouble when you're supposed to have a bunch of characters that are super smart and they keep being outsmarted by things that shouldn't outsmart them. Um, I thought that was like a, a strange oversight. And instead of using the seems like you just come up with the basic idea of like it amplifies your brain, but that doesn't overcome your personality flaws, your character flaws. And so you can still give it the temptation. You can still be impulsive. You can still be reckless. That's not how people are defeated. It's like they, they just make stupid mistakes while being on pills that make them super smart. Then we have Lincoln, Lincoln, the Steven Spielberg film about Lincoln. Haven't watched it yet, so can't comment on it, but uh, you should probably check that movie out. We got a couple of Lion Kings. Now, the original Lion King is my favorite animated film of all time. And this past year, I was sent an updated version of this one. Um, in last year's collection, I discussed how the version I had of it was like this 20-year-old, or not 20-year-old Blu-ray, because I don't have 20-year-old Blu-rays, but it was like an odd shape in some version when the 
did it wrong. And so it didn't fit on my shelves right. It was too tall. And so someone was paying attention in last year's Blu-ray collection video and sent me one that actually will fit properly on my shelf and is the right height so that my favorite animated film of all time can properly go on my shelves. And then um, the remake that I, I enjoyed it when I saw it in the theater. The first time I saw it on like true IMAX is massive. I Bob Bullock here in town. It's a true IMAX is incredibly tall. So it's an amazing experience seeing it in the theater and the source material brought all the right nostalgia. But one of those movies, it was also like, why would I ever watch this again at home? I don't, I would never choose this one over the, over the original animated one. Little Women. I actually went to the press screening to see this one when it came out and I took my mother-in-law. It was kind of fun to take my mother-in-law. She's a big fan of Little Women. Um, the, the, the book, not actual Little Women. That would be weird if she was. Because I just think she has some friends that are Little Women too. But I, I am not a fan of Little Women. As I've discussed before, these types of period piece stories aren't really my sort of thing. So uh, I don't. I can like watch them and be like, this is well made. Not for me, but well made. Lock up the Stallone vehicle about him being locked up in prison, but not escape plan, a different one from 20 plus years before escape plan came out. And um, I, I've seen it before a few times over the years, but not one that, that stuck with me much. Then we have a steel book. Woo! For London Has Fallen. Of all movies to get a steelbook for, London Has Fallen. Part of the Has Fallen franchise. It's good. It's enjoyable. Nothing particularly memorable. Nothing particularly amazing, but enjoyable enough. Then we have Lone Survivor, a movie I've had for a while, been meaning to watch. One of those Mark Wahlberg, Peter Berg team-ups. And I just haven't had that moment where I've watched it yet. Uh, probably because I know that the basic ti the title of it means that it's probably going to be very depressing and tough to get through but haven't checked it out yet. Then we have The Long Kiss Goodnight, Shane Black script, Rennie Harlan direction, and a concept for a movie that uh, any of these I mean, usually action thrillers, I'm always a sucker for those. I've never been crazy about this movie, though. Never, never liked it as much as I feel like I'm supposed to. Long Shot, a political rom-com that actually didn't make me mad. I, I assumed because it's like a Hollywood doesn't know how to have restraint and tackle politics in a way that's not off-putting to half the people that might watch their movie. I assumed it was going to be more alienating than it was and actually did a really good job of um, going into the realm of politics in a way that wasn't designed to take cheap shots at people that disagree. It was, I, like, I was like, oh, wow, that handled that in an awfully mature fashion for Hollywood. Well, well done. Wow. I, everything doesn't have to be about winning and stepping on toes. This is incredible. Now we have Looper, the Ryan Johnson sci-fi time travel hitman story that got him the job directing Last Jedi, which most many of us would say was not um, the best course of action. But as for the movie itself, this one, uh, just a real unique film that takes familiar elements and makes something fresh, exciting, and uh, tragic at the same time. There's some sequences in it that are, are really, really cool. Then we have the Lorax from Dr. Seuss adaptation from Illumination. And uh, I don't... Illumination seems like such a strange company to have control of all these Dr. Seuss properties because they... I don't know. They seem like they're known for, like, lowbrow fart humor and pop music. And that's... Dr. Seuss is known for wit cleverness so the, they don't match in my mind but oh well then we have the lost i um i, I believe i got a box of from a, a company that uh, a subscription service that sends you horror films and so they sent me one and so I, I got a few movies in it that um I, I haven't been able to check out yet but one of those was the lost then we have the lost boys a movie i watched for the first time in february when i went to go uh, meet Cody Leach in person for the first time. And actually, I will uh, see him again in two days. Two days from now, I'll be hanging out with him in person, uh, which will be for you guys several days in the past, or if you watch this a year from now, a year ago. But um, one of his favorite movies, but I've never seen it. So when I was out at his place in February, we watched this one. So it's not for the first time. And the fun, uh, interesting little experience to have this movie that you've heard other people talk about. You don't really know what to expect. And then it's such a product of the 80s. It's such a so distinctly a product of its time and has a distinct flavor and vibe to it. So that was kind of fun. Then we have the Lord of the Rings, all six movies, theatrical cuts, Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, uh, 
Ironically, I watched Fellowship of the Rings last night, but I want to watch the jumbo cut, so I watched the extended cut last night, preparing for a video that is coming on uh, May 31st to 31 on 31 on fantasy movies, and Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit are part of that, so watched that last night. But um, just uh, the classic efficiency economy version of these ones that only has the theatrical versions of, um, you know, one of the great... Fan, or maybe the great fantasy trilogy of all time, and then the prequel trilogy that should not have been a trilogy of films because The Hobbit certainly does not warrant that. Then we have Love and Monsters. This was my favorite movie of 2020. Now, 2020 only had about three movies that came out, so there wasn't a ton of competition, but I went into this one. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what it was going to be. I hadn't really seen a trailer for it. And then I just loved it. I thought, I thought the characters, the world, the tone. There's an optimism to it while being about the world ending. It was just they, they captured this this the, the right spot, the right energy. I thought it was something special. So if you haven't seen Love and Monsters, um, I need to, you need to remember that. Like people ask me, what you, what movie do you recommend? And whenever they, they ask that, I want a movie that a lot of people can probably like. That's pretty accessible, but that a lot of people haven't seen. Is underwatched. That's Love and Monsters. I need to remember to Warrior and Love and Monsters. We've got our M's. First up, Machete. Now this started as a with a fake trailer in Grindhouse between the two movies. People responded so well to it they decided to actually make a movie out of it, and we got this one in. Probably works better as just a two-minute trailer for a fake movie than as a real movie. Nonetheless, I'm so glad that this bizarre thing exists. Then we've got our set of Mad Max films. The names are kind of out of... See, my movies get messed up because I have kids, and they come in and move things. In particular, the baby comes in and just pulls stuff out and puts it back and does not put it back in the right place. But we have all four Mad Max films right there. And, you know, I grew up watching these ones on cable and everything like that. And then Fury Road came out. I was like, I'm going to be able to pull this off. And, like, I know it's got a budget, but how will this play? And then it was one of the best-reviewed, wide-released films of 2015. And so I just want a pretty cool little franchise, the way that it's all played out. But, um, yeah, just the standard Blu-rays for each of these. Um, if you like post-apocalyptic films, they're classics. We got Madagascar 1, and I have kids that love animals, so they, of course, love Madagascar. And, uh, you know... Not not a movie I naturally gravitate towards, but the kids have a lot of fun with it. Then we have Magnificent Seven, the Antoine Foucault remake with Chris Pratt in the lead and Denzel Washington. And I, I thought it was a, a great little continuation, modern day Western with current aesthetics, editing, pacing, all that fun stuff. I, I really dug it. Man of Steel, Zack Snyder's reboot of Superman that... Split audiences, I've always been a defender of it, and the more time passes, the more and more I enjoy it. Then we have The Martian, a sci-fi movie that's not like a fast-paced blockbuster, but a really fun movie about this guy trying to survive that's just, like, smart and, um, yeah, like, not about big action sequences, but still thrilling and exciting and engaging in ways you would expect. Mary Poppins returns the continuation of Mary Poppins with Emily Blunt and um, a movie that uh, um, did a better job than expected capturing the charm of the original one and feeling like they, it actually fits and didn't step on toes but at the same time it didn't seem like it uh, connected with people as well as you'd expect. We got a Martian 4K in here which means we can Pull that one out of circuit. Oh, this is the extended edition, too. Pull that out of circulation. Then we got Major League, the Charlie Sheen baseball movie that is a really fun baseball comedy that uh, I've seen it a number of times over the years. And it's uh, it's silly. It's a product of its time, and it is a lot of fun. Masters of the Universe, the Dolph Lundgren He-Man movie. I've always enjoyed this film. And I think the biggest thing working against it is that it's Masters of the Universe. If it wasn't He-Man, if it wasn't a bad adaptation, and it is a bad adaptation, whether the comics, the toys, whatever you want to talk about, it's not a good adaptation, but I think it actually is a pretty little fun little 
weird sci-fi film that has some thrilling, exciting music, a great score from the composer of the Rocky movies. So I think it works. It's just not very good as a He-Man movie. We got a bunch of Matrix right here. First one is The Matrix in a Steelbook. One of my favorite sci-fi movies of all time. It's just a great mixture of Hong Kong action, Hong Kong martial arts, anime mythology, combined with some Terminator mythology in there, thrown together to make something truly unique. And we have The Matrix Resurrections. This is another one I got sent to. The studio sent it to me for free to do an unboxing on it. And they sent me up like a whole box of stuff, like the the uh, pinch your nose, sunglasses and everything. And it was, it was pretty cool what they said. But I got this one. I, need to, I really need to rewatch it. I saw, only saw it the one time in the theater when it came out. And I didn't know what to expect. And you just like there's so much to process with a movie like that that I, I need to give it a, another watch at home and see how it, how it plays with me now. Then we have The Maze Runner, The First two of them, okay, there we go. There's the third one, the Maze Riddler trilogy. I didn't, I haven't read any of the books, have no ties to the mythology, so I just watched through them whenever the new one came out. And I guess they were fine. Didn't make, leave much of a mark for me, but um, they're fine. Okay, that'll bring us to my MCU films. I'm gonna fly through these really quickly since I've talked about the movies. You don't need to hear my opinions on those for the most part. So I'll just show you which versions I have. The Steelbook. And it's the 4K Steelbook for Iron Man. What a great movie. Another John Favreau film that uh, he just knocked it out of the park. Then we got Incredible Hulk Steelbook. The disc has popped out. Snap that back in there. Steelbook for the Incredible Hulk. I think this is one of the most underrated MCU films. I, I don't think it's one of the best MCU films, but I think it is highly, highly, highly underrated. Okay, mm, so uh, this is not a 4K, but I have a 4K. Do I go with the 4K or the steel? Let's keep both of them. We'll keep both of them. So all kinds of different ones for Mr. Hulk. Then we got the 4K Steelbook for Iron Man 2, a movie that when it came out was a lot of fun, but as time passed and we've had Iron Man in a thousand things, the novelty of just more Iron Man faded, and then you looked at the plot and you went, this isn't a great plot. We got Thor... Regular edition, Captain America, regular edition. Then we go, okay, that's different. 4K for the Avengers. Then Steelbook 4K for Iron Man 3, the one from Shane Black that works better as a Shane Black film than as an MCU film, but it's still, uh, I think it's better than people give it credit for, another underrated film. Thor The Dark World, a movie that people don't give credit to because it does not deserve credit. Then we have Captain America The Winter Soldier, one of the most praised films in the MCU, just the classic original version when they released it. Oh, I'll say this about Thor The Dark World is the only MCU film that I did not see in the theater and still have not seen in the theater. Every other one I have watched in theaters from the beginning. This one came out when I had a one-year-old, so missed it. Then we have Guardians of the Galaxy, one of the most pleasant surprises I've ever had in a the theater. Then we've got two, okay, we got, we can pull this, my Blu-ray of Age of Ultron out because we've got a 4K of Avengers Age of Ultron. Then we've got Ant-Man in a Blu-ray, Civil War, Blu-ray, Doctor Strange, Blu-ray, Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 2, the most, uh, the hottest of takes on my channel, the one that got me the most heat. Maybe turning red got nastier heat, but that's not lingering. That one didn't, because maybe it will turn into something that lingers. This is the one that's lingered with me for years and years, and I still get people like, what? How dare you not like that movie more? I don't know how turning red, uh, how that one will sit with people long term. But Spider Man Homecoming, regular edition, Blu ray, Thor Ragnarok. Uh, okay, yeah. okay, we got Black Panther 4K, Infinity War 4K. And I'm in the Wasp, just the Blu ray. And then one of the first 4Ks I bought, Captain Marvel. So we got nice, amazing, amazing images for a totally mediocre movie that made a ton of money. Then we have Endgame. Steelbook 4K. This is one of those ones that I, uh, even before, like, it was like a year, two years before I bought a 4K TV and I was still like, I'm gonna future-proof my collection. Definitely need to get that one in the 4K. Then we have Spider-Man 4 Far From Home 4K. 
and Spider-Man No Way Home 4K. Apparently all of the steelbooks for this one sold out way before the movie came out, so I only could get the 4K on this one. And apparently I sat out on all the other releases that the MCU put out last year. Whoops! Then we got The Meg. This was a fun one um, when I saw it because it was a uh, one of the first press screenings I got when I got onto the press list, and they showed it a, a week early. It was the first public screening of the movie, and it was on water. We were in floaties watch on, on a lake watching the movie on a, a big, gigantic screen. That was cool. And it was also when my wife was eight months pregnant. So <laughs> that's a weird day. Like watching the Meg floating in water with a very, very, very pregnant wife. That was... That was that, of course, was memorable. Megamind, a DreamWorks superhero movie, a little bit ahead of its time. I didn't see when it came out. I've only watched it one time. Memento, a movie that was actually foundational for me in uh, introducing me to indie cinema. There's this new up-and-comer named Christopher Nolan put out this movie that's told backwards, and uh, I saw it at like, the Art House Theater in Austin and checked it out very early on. And it was one of the people that was like, you got to see this movie called Memento. It's this new director. He's super clever. Like, not a lot of places where I can say this, but I was an early adopter for Christopher Nolan. And right around the same time was also John Favreau as a director who put out a movie called Made that I saw at that same art house theater movie. It came out in the same ballpark of time. And that guy also apparently has had some success directing films. We got men in black. How many men in blacks are we gonna we have here? Okay, we got three men in blacks. We're missing men in black too. Got the original one. This one was huge when it came out. Like if you're young, don't realize just this one, when it came out, people loved this movie. They loved the song and just made everyone fall in love with Will Smith. And it's been followed by a series of lackluster films that have not captured the magic. So I don't even have the second one. Third one was a, an improvement over two and pressed to the sequels. And as a time travel, I think in the end, they tried to be so clever with it and give it this heartwarming conclusion that tied everything together. And, and it didn't work for me at all. Um, and then International, I didn't like dislike this one the way most people did, but it certainly is missing the magic of the original film. Middle School, the worst year of my life. Uh, movie got this, I guess I got this one in my family. I haven't seen it yet. There's a lot of movies like this that... Um, I, I'm not super familiar with the, the book that it's based on in the movie because it's just too old. And then my kids get into the books and my and so that we loop back around on them. That's kind of happened with several things. And so I'm wondering if that'll happen with this one. Uh, Million Dollar Baby, the Clint Eastwood uh, film that won a bunch of Oscars and got a bunch of nominations. And um, so, uh, um, yeah, one of those movies that uh, if you see it, it's... Uh, it leaves some impact when you get to the end of that one. Then we have Mimic, an early Guillermo del Toro film. I believe his first English language film. I, I could be mistaken about that. I remember when this one came out, and he wasn't a guy that anybody knew who he was, um, you know, in the because he was brand new to, to Hollywood. So I remember just Mimic as this random um, horror film that came out, and then. Later, obviously, he went on to become this in incredible prestige director that's been celebrated and has done mainstream things. And, of course, he's done Oscar-winning things. And so then you, you kind of look back on it. This one's a little bit differently in that light. We have Minority Report, the Steven Spielberg, Tom Cruise vehicle based off of Philip K. Dick writing. And Philip K. Dick is the guy that did Blade Runner. Uh, uh, total Recall, and he's just great at coming up with these interesting ideas of like, of these what-if scenarios of um, thinking about it, like the human experience and dreams, and if you could see the future, and they all have this great hook to them, and they've several of them have been turned into really good films that kind of take that hook and expand it into a great adventure. Then we have uh, Misery. I've never seen Misery. I almost watched it a couple weeks back because I was looking to do... We talked about. I guess we talked about this earlier. I was like, uh, was, was that a couple days ago? No, it wasn't a couple days ago. That's just how long this shoot is. That that felt like a couple days ago when I was talking about Dead Zone. But I started watching through a bunch of Stephen King films that I hadn't seen before. Misery is one of those ones that's like, how have I not seen Misery? So hopefully I will have seen that by the next time a major Stephen King film comes out so I can do like a Stephen King top 10. Then we have Missing Link. This movie got a really good reviews when it came out, but I missed it because a lot of stuff came out and I wasn't sure what to make of it, so I didn't see it. I bought it because I'd heard good things about it and still haven't watched it. Then we have my Mission Impossible films. So for the original run, I've got the trilogy. I've got this set right here, kind of generic 
calls it the Extreme Blu-ray Trilogy. I don't know what's extreme about this. But, um, so there's the first three. And then we have Ghost Protocol. Ghost Protocol, that, that sequence on the Dubai Tower was the best sequence I've ever seen in a movie on the th big screen. I saw it in true IMAX, the Bob Bullock, where I talked about Lion King. Same theater where I, I saw Ghost Protocol. And, um... I never experienced anything like that. It's just an amazing, true theatrical experience. Uh, like you can't experience what you experience in the theater at home the way in the same way. Uh, that's what you really you, like. Everyone tries to do big CGI spectacle and try and outdo each other. And Brad Bird figured it out you don't need CGI. Just do something that really immerses the audience in something incredible to get you on the edge of your seat. Rogue Nation, and then we've got a. Steelbook for Fallout. What is we got in here? Oh, we even have like a little booklet in there too. That's fun. That's nice. That's kind of them to give me that. Whew. Okay, moving along. We got Mo Anna, the Disney animated film. And um, this has been played in my household like a bajillion times. My wife loves that movie and so do a bunch of the kids. Monsters vs. Aliens, DreamWorks movie about... Well, monsters and aliens. I, uh, I I don't know. I've never I believe I went to go see in the theater. I don't know if I went like saw my nephews or what. I don't know why I would go to the theater to see this film, but I know I saw it way back in the day and have forgotten about it until I did a DreamWorks ranking a couple years back and then watched it again. I was like, oh yeah, I've seen this before, haven't I? When did I watch this? But um, a movie that I don't know. I, even having watched it within the last couple years, I don't even remember what why it didn't connect with me, but it didn't really resonate with me all that well. Then we got some Mortal Kombat films. First off, the 1995 film that I think is one of the best video game movies of all time, which isn't saying a lot because none of none, there's there's not a lot of great ones, but uh, still one of the best ones because it was just a fun piece of 90s cheese that, while it should have been rated R and been more adult to match the video games a little bit better, it still captured the idea of the video games enough. And then we had the movie that came out last year that aesthetically captured the video games better, but then missed the mark on the story by making a new character the lead character, weird choice, and not making it about the actual tournament, but about being able to get people together for the tournament, weird choice. And then we have Mortal Kombat Battle of the Realms. I believe this is the second one. Um, is this the second one? Let me watch. Anyway, they've come up with a couple of the animated films over the last couple of years, and um, they're they they they're, they're fun because they're just so excessively violent and just uh, like unbelievably gory unnecessarily, which is absolutely perfect. We got Moneyball, um, based off it was it Aaron Sorkin, right? Yeah, Aaron Sorkin script. Yeah. Steve Zalian and Aaron Sorkin. Wow, that's a that's a nice double feature there. Based off of a book. Actually, I meant to meant to check out the book. I need to get that for my Audible collection. I'm about to go on a trip, so maybe. Well, I actually got two Jurassic Park movies. I'm not going to have time to go through Moneyball too, but I need to buy that one and listen to it. It's really been on my mind to do that. Also, really want to rewatch the movie. Has a uh, Chris Pratt one of the first movies where he got in shape because he was so famous for being chubby on 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 Parks and Rec. And then he got Moneyball and Zero Dark Thirty, where he had small parts, but he had to look fit. And so he dropped the weight for those movies and put it back on. And then he got Star-Lord and had to drop it again. He was going for a couple of years. Mr. Peabody uh, and Sherman. Um, so I grew up watching the the famous shorts uh, or car cartoons with the one on Bullwinkle, I think. And and didn't forgot about it for 20 years until this movie came out. And didn't know what to expect. Watched it. And I thought this was a great little film that was clever. It was witty with the dialogue and a time travel story. And I'm a sucker for time travel, so that worked for me. Mrs. Doubtfire. Now, this movie came out for me. On the one hand, I was the perfect age for it of, you know, being in middle school. It's probably the age that they're kind of aiming for with a, with a lot of it. And also the worst phase of life, because this came out right after my parents got divorced. Like, one of the first movies we went to go see with mom after my parents got divorced was this one. Wonderful timing universe, a movie about parents getting divorced. So that was uncomfortable and probably added all kinds of extra layers of, like, emotional trauma. I think, I don't remember who I was talking to recently, but some people said that the movie plays differently when you're older and you, you just resonate with the idea of divorce differently. And, and I heard that and um, 
I didn't. I don't think that I would have that same feeling because legitimately, I watched it while my parents were getting divorced, so I was feeling the weight of the divorce product way heavier back then than right now. Um, so, uh, but yeah, it's really funny movie. Kind of Robin Williams at his prime in a movie where he's super funny, but also a movie that is very sad at times. And I don't know how it plays in the per- current climate with a bunch of the humor and jokes in it. Then we have The Mummy and The Mummy Returns, some throwback adventure films that uh, are very Raiders of the Lost Ark-esque. They, they, I, they're movies I always feel like I should like more than I do. I've never been a gigantic fan of this franchise. I always enjoyed them. I don't, I don't even think I saw the first one in the theater when it came out, Like, which strikes me as really odd that I wouldn't have seen it. I don't know why, I, but I don't remember seeing that one. I, I know I definitely saw the second one in the theater when it came out. And I remember having like conversations afterwards, like, what are those the deal with that CGI at the end with the with that Scorpion King? That looked bad. But um I d I didn't see the first one in the theater. So I don't know and I, I don't know why. I don't know why. But um also uh The Rock's first movie, so that's fun. We got Mulan in there, the original Disney animated film that uh got live action reboot last year. Great music, great adventure story, fun times all for all. Murder on the Orient Express, um, based off the Agatha Christie classic. Kenneth Branagh, of course, knows how to direct and bring some pizzazz to it. Uh, I um, I don't know, I think by the end it rang a little bit hollow for me. It didn't have as much spunk and pizzazz at the point in time where it's supposed to be like, wow! But maybe that's because I knew the ending going into it. My wife, who didn't know the ending going into it, had a little bit more like... She said it was very moving for her. Then we have My Little Pony, the movie, a movie that's uh, actually better than I was expecting. You know, I'm not, this might surprise you, I'm not actually a brony, not a big My Little Pony fan as a grown up or as a child or a teenager at any point in time in my life. So I went to go see the ones just because I'm a movie review guy and I, I believe I took my daughter with me. And it's, it's, it's more fun than expected. And then, um, like, four years passed and we, my oldest, older daughter kind of phased out of My Little Pony. And then my youngest daughter discovered My Little Pony, which is actually really funny right now. Even while we've been filming this, I went downstairs and my wife and kids, they went out to get pizza and and do some shopping. My daughter came home with a My Little Pony toy. She goes, look, My Little Pony. I go, oh, cool. That's My Little Pony. Which one is it? She goes, no, My Little Pony. Like, yeah, My Little Pony. Like, no, My Little Pony. Like, look, Your Little Pony. Yeah. Chris, is it My Little Pony? No. Pony. No, it's it's My Little Pony. That's the no, name of it. No, it's My Little Pony. Yeah, it's My Little Pony. We're saying no, the same no, thing. It's My Little Pony. We're so close. And she's learning grammar and tenses and things like that. And so if I say My Little Pony to her, she gets mad because it's My Little Pony is in her little pony, not my little pony is in Sean's little pony. That's it's the cutest thing ever. It's a kids are the best. They are so fun and so stressful. They're the worst and the best all at once. All of the highs and lows of the human experience. That is parenting. It just elevates everything. It makes every day an adventure. Then we have my neighbor Tor- uh, Totoro. As we talked about before, some people have been sending me Studio Ghibli films, hoping I will do a Studio Ghibli ranking. Maybe someday. I ne- I definitely need to watch more of them, and I need to expose my kids them and see get them into more different things see if they they resonate with them a little bit more but as i mentioned before not specifically my and we've made it to the ends and i'm looking at my little display preview monitor over there and i'm realizing that the way i did my lights in here i've got all these lights on the ground that were shooting up on the blu-rays and made them glow red and then as i've taken them away all the glowing red has disappeared so it's just a wall of blackness behind me now which kind of visually does uh, have a certain thing about that that works really nicely. There's a lot of fun. And there's another sense in which it's like, oh, there's just just darkness up there, too. <laughs> I guess that's kind of fun. It's all right. Anyway, I'm rambling. First off, Napoleon Dynamite, one of the quirkiest, weirdest comedies of all time that has very little plot. Has some really good laughs, though, and incredibly memorable sequences that uh, I, I worked with middle schoolers when that came out, and every middle schooler absolutely loved this film. It's so offbeat. It's so different, but it is, 
it's it's like the, the sort of thing that can't be replicated. It's, uh, it's so bizarre on so many levels. We got uh, National Treasure 1 and 2. And these are movies that when they, the you know, first one, when it came out, was like, what's well, this? Nicolas Cage is going to steal the National, or steal the Declaration of Independence. What a weird concept. It was like a really fun movie that everybody enjoyed. The reviews were actually weren't that good. But it's like the sort of movie you look back and like, what? Critics are crazy. That, of course that movie's fun. What are you guys talking about? You guys being too stuffy and cranky. Of course it's stupid, but it's fun stupid. And the second one, another just good time of the movies. My wife loves these. At any point in time, you can just put on National Treasure and she'd be totally fine with it. Um, but, you know, any sort of adventure like Indiana Jones and that's lighthearted, she's going to have a good time with it. So those ones, it's crazy they never did a third one. That would have just been printing money. For whatever reason, it never happened, but... Oh, well. Newsies, a movie that I've never really watched, but both my sister back in the day and my wife now is really into. So whenever I'm not around, like if I'm working upstairs, I might come downstairs and I'll hear, I'm the king of New York. And my wife's blasting Newsies. And the fun thing about this one is that that gentleman right there, if you don't know, is one Christian Bale, a 20-year-old Christian Bale singing and dancing in Newsies. Then we have The Nice Guys, a Shane Black film from a few years back that uh, teams up Russell Crowe and Ryan Gosling. And I need to watch it again. I, I watched it whenever it first came out. Maybe it was overhyped to me. Maybe I was in the wrong mood. But it didn't wow me the way that it wowed a bunch of other people. So I need to give it another try. But here's one. I got my fan mail, Night House. Came out last year, um, kind of one of these busy months. I was invited to a press screening and everything, and it got good reviews. I heard good things about it, but I just didn't happen to catch it in time. And sometimes it's tricky with movies like that, that you just kind of miss it. And when you do what I do, it's all about urgent, first to it. And if you fall behind, there's almost like no point in covering it in terms of, um, you know, getting views because they just the there's just a drop off in interest once something's been out for a couple of weeks. I haven't gotten around to watching it yet. Then I have my seven movie collection efficiency pack. Seven movies in this very small package right here of A Nightmare on Elm Street. Now the first one is an absolute classic of the slasher genre. Just such a clever idea and gave us one Johnny Depp. Third one is another great little taking it to the, the idea of it to this whole other level and like what if, if there were people that could use their go into dreams and what if they had powers in there uh, and a bunch of other ones are not as good went some weird directions got Nightcrawler great little thriller with an amazing performance from Jake Gyllenhaal like this guy is crazy versatile and can just disappear into roles and He's done, you know, several over the last couple of years where he just kind of like does these very um, uh, boisterous, loud villain type characters like Mysterio when he's in villain mode. In this movie, he just did Ambulance for Michael Bay, which is loud and fun. And then he does Nightcrawler, where he's just playing this super creepy guy that is preying on like committing crimes to be able to cover them for the news and just... He can do all of it. Here's a fun one right here. Nobody, uh, where we get the action hero we never knew that we needed, Bob Odenkirk. And I don't know what it is about Bob Odenkirk, but he's just one of these guys that it feels like you're always rooting for him. You just want him to succeed. And in his, his late 50s, he decided he wanted to do an action movie, trained for two years to do it, got the John Wick crew to... Uh, do the stunt work and train for two years with the one of the lead guides on the John Wick stunt crew, written by the guy that wrote John Wick and made a movie that is just a great companion to go right along with the John Wick films. And I, I wish there was some way that they could be in a shared universe of sorts. I think it would fit too, but they're different studios, so it couldn't happen. But if there's a way to do it that that isn't a, you don't need big, we don't need a team up movie with the two of them but some little wink at the audience of like, yeah, they're in the same universe with these these two guys, Hutch and, and Mr. Wick. That would be great. But man, what like when the trailer dropped, you're like, wait, Bob Odenkirk is doing an action movie. What is this? And it's with the John Wick crew. Yes. And wait, Christopher Lloyd is in it? Christopher Lloyd is in it and shoots a shotgun? Great movie? Or greatest movie. So, um, I, I, yeah, man. It's a movie that I, I really liked it when it came out. It was maybe a little bit, uh, 
not not I, I didn't want to overhype myself or like maybe felt maybe a little bit underwhelmed because I was so pumped for it, but really liked it at the same time. But it's like a movie a year later. It's like I, I said it hasn't tapered. It's like, yeah, I'm so man. It's awesome. That exists, man. He went for it. He did it. He pulled it off. And it's also a movie like I watched it and went, oh, yeah, he's got a TV show. I got to watch Better Call Saul. I've been waiting to do that for five years. And so watched through it, uh, binge through it last year. And then I'm doing that again right now currently. And I'm in season five while season six is airing. And anyway, I'm rambling about what TV shows I'm watching. No Country for Old Men, a movie I haven't watched yet. And I, I believe there's a twist ending or an ending of sorts that can be spoiled. And it hasn't been spoiled for me yet. So um, don't say anything in the comments. I don't know why I'm plugging my ears because you read comments, but I'm still going to plug my ears so you guys don't spoil it for me. Nonstop. We talked about this one earlier when, um, I don't know, what was the train movie? The Commuter talked about it from the same director guy that the guy that's actually doing Black Adam and did uh, Jungle Cruise. So he did a, he did like five or six of these Liam Neeson thrillers, and most of them are some of the better ones. But for whatever reason, he did this movie twice because this one is... He did nonstop, and they did nonstop on a train and called it Commuter. But uh, same kind of basic idea, same character that he's playing, basically. Same premise, same thrills, same everything. Same lack of logic in how they play out. Uh, this one's a little bit better because it did it first, and a plane is more fun than a computer commuter train, but whatever. The Notebook, uh, the Nicholas Sparks um, adaptation that uh, was a big gigantic hit and probably largely because it had the right people at the right times. So you got Ryan Gosling, Rachel McAdams right as they were about to take off and become very, very popular. And also, um, I actually have read the book. Uh, uh, it, was, it was one of those movies that came out right as I was you know, met my wife and so it was like the romantic movie that everybody watched at the time. So I ended up reading the book and the, the movie's actually much better because the book is about these people having a an affair over the weekend when she's about to get married and like the movies about this epic love story of these two people they're supposed to be together but they're torn apart and like stuff that the like, for there's a sec the like, 40 the first 45 minutes of the movie is just two pages in the book and so it plays very differently because of selection and emphasis so I thought this one handles it much better it makes this epic love story out of what's actually a weekend affair. <laughs> um, um, and somehow it works better than it probably should. I need to rewatch this one. Also, it was filmed around the area, not too terribly far from where I went to college. So my wife and I went out to some of the shooting locations and stuff like that and for little romantic getaways and stuff like that. So that was fun. The Nun, one of the totally generic conjuring spinoffs, maybe the most generic. I think this is when my rankings are the one I haven't last. It's just... It's just people for 90 minutes walking around a creepy castle and then something goes, ah! And then they walk around and something goes, ah! And just 90 minutes of that and then the credits roll. It is, the, it is probably the most confusing casting choice of all time because um, it's Conjuring spinoff and Vera Farminga is the main actress of the Conjuring movies. She's her, Patrick Wilson, and Vera Farminga. And... The nun stars her little sister, who's, and her little sister's like 20 years younger than her, but looks like like her daughter, looks like the younger version of her. They look very similar, and I didn't know when I was watching it that it was, was her sister. Like, I didn't know any of that. I was just watching the movie, and I, I, was try I was waiting for the twist that this is her, that it's the same character, and she changed her name or something like that, but it's not. They just cast, and you get to the end of the movie and it actually ties back into the first one and just like shows footage of Vera Firminga. And so you're watching it and you have this person that looks young and it's 20 years later and it shows Vera Firminga, but that's not the same person. It's not the same character. So it's just confusing because it's like, those clearly look like the same person. This clearly looks like the main character of this movie 20 years older. What is, what is going on here? So I don't know what they were thinking in that casting, but... That's only one of many problems with that. Oh, oh, oh. So we kick things off with Oblivion. Tom Cruise's team up with the guy that he's doing Top Gun Maverick with. I didn't like this movie all that much. Seemed like a pretty generic sci-fi film, but I'm hearing amazing things about Top Gun Maverick. So maybe I just need to give this one another chance. Maybe it's because the trailer seemed like it was going to be a cool sci-fi movie, and I just felt kind of bland when I finally saw it. Then this is, this is a pretty fun one right here. It's the Oceans Trilogy. Um... 
with like actually comes with playing cards, dice, and then the movies in there. So just like f- like a fun way to do collector's packaging. So much so that I left the cards in there rather than playing with them. The original Ocean's Eleven. I guess it's not the original. It's the remake. The original remake is a really fun heist film. Maybe the most fun heist film of all time. And um, then the other ones kind of had diminishing returns, but still great to see the cast having fun together. Office Space, a Texas office movie. shot A lot of it shot here in Austin. Some of it shot in Dallas. And I've looked up the shooting locations. Actually, recently, someone mentioned to me it was shot in Austin. And it's like all these places I've spent so much time. Even that art house theater that I mentioned where I saw Memento and Made, that is right near some of the shooting locations for this movie. But... I need to rewatch. I haven't watched that one in a long time. That's like a classic one. Uh, Old Henry got this one in my last fan mail. Haven't been able to watch it. Literally got it, you know, like two weeks ago. Then we got uh, the Omen collector's set. This is really cool. It's from Scream Factory. So amazing packaging, cool special features. I'd never seen any of these until I did last year's 31 on 31. And, um... Why well, I didn't really like the sequels, the original Omen, that was such a pleasant surprise. It's from Richard Donner, and the Omen was kind of how he got the job to do Superman, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. Watched the Omen, I was like, I get it. This is this is a really good horror film, and uh, th- this thing works. Uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Quentin Tarantino's love letter to Hollywood, and a hangout film that I just really dug. I love these characters. I love the fantasy of it. I love the insanity of the third act, the weird usage of um, Bruce Lee. Only the Brave, another movie from the director of Top Gun Maverick. Haven't checked this one out yet. I think I've heard good things about it, but I haven't seen it yet. It even came out while I had my channel, but I was just, I guess, busy when it happened. Olympus Has Fallen, the final movie in the Has Fallen trilogy of films, the original one, and the one that came out at the same time as White House Has Fallen. I always preferred this one to White House Has Fallen because it's just much more straightforward. Die Hard at the White House, Gerard Butler as our, our lone hero killing people. And great supporting cast with Morgan Freeman, Aaron Eckhart as the president in there. Over the Hedge, this one I actually did see in the theater when it came out. I actually saw it on a church trip. We were supposed to go to the beach. We're driving to go to the beach and it starts pouring rain and you can't go to the beach. So we went to see Over the Hedge instead. So I saw it when it first came out and uh, it was fun enough, cute enough. Not that remarkable, but I guess good enough. And finally, Oz the Great and Powerful, a movie I actually watched uh, within the last week to do my Sam Raimi ranking that we keep talking about in this video that will hopefully come out tomorrow if I'm able to wake up tomorrow and finish it and don't fall into a coma because uh, the sun is setting right now. It was lunchtime when I started filming and the sun is setting and I'm about to lose some of my light and uh, we're not even two thirds of the way done. So we got a long time left, but movie, it, uh, it, 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 it's so fun. It's fine. But considering Sam Raimi and his unique bat set of skills and how weird Oz is supposed to be, the movie itself isn't as magical as you'd expect. It's not as great, powerful, or, or wonderful as the title of these Oz movies would suggest this should be. And we are to the peas, kicking things off with our Pacific Rim duology. The first one being a fun movie about kaiju and gigantic robots from Guillermo del Toro, which that's kind of what makes him such a fun director is like he followed this up with best picture, like a best picture winner just a few years later. And then another one a few a couple years after that with um, you know, this last year's movie. But, like, he'll do Blade 2. He'll do Gigantic Robot movie. And then he'll be like, and, well, you know, let's go for some prestige in here. Then we got the second one that I... I Maybe it's because I I just thought the first one was kind of a, just a fun robot-punching monster movie that I had fun with the second one, too. And a bunch of other people were like, wow, well, this one didn't have the depth. And da, 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 da. I was like... I. I guess I see what you're saying. I mean, it's not as good. It doesn't have as touch. It's not the magic there, but... Same time, I still have big robots punching things. Oh, I'm cool. There are the Page Master, um, Macaulay Culkin's Harry Potter before there was Harry Potter. Um, at least that's what it looks like from the cover. It's not actually that. You also got Christopher Lloyd in there. Never seen it, though. Bought it to show the kids because they were excited about Macaulay Culkin and Harry Potter and then didn't watch it. Pan's Labyrinth. I've actually never seen this one. 
So, uh, yeah, one of the Guillermo del Toro films that everybody talks about, everybody raves about, and I have never seen it. Need to do that. One of these days. One of these days. Then we have Panic, another one of those movies I received in the uh, horror movie subscription service deal, but haven't checked it out yet. Parasite, the best picture winner from a few years back. And this is one that was kind of fun because I saw it at uh, Fantastic Fest a couple months before it came out. Same with The Lighthouse, same, same, not the same day, but the same week. And the, the fun thing about this one is that I um, was standing out in front of the theater and then a big limo pulled up with the windows all blacked out. And that's what the talent, whether directors or actors, would show up. And then this guy jumped out of it uh, and it was Bong. And this is before... Parasite had come out before it'd be kind of come this mainstream to movie fans here in the U.S. and you know, won Best Picture and is now everybody knows what he looks like that's in that watches videos like this and knows Best Picture nominees and stuff like that. But he was just standing. I was like, I bet that's the director of Parasite. I didn't know, but I just guessed based off of knowing the movie was playing and that the vehicle he got out of and then it was and now he's become you know probably should have done what some a little bit more with that moment than I actually did, but it happened and then the movie itself. Uh, just a, a neat movie that's entertaining. It's real funny before it becomes kind of terrifying. Patriot. Um, Roland Emmerich, Mel Gibson film with Heath Ledger in there too. And just uh, kind of like Braveheart. Little, quite a bit dumber than Braveheart, but still just as awesome as Braveheart. Certainly not as good, but awesome. Pearl Harbor, Michael Bay's. Pearl Harbor movie. I actually didn't see this one until just a few years back when I did a Michael Bay ranking. Apparently my wife had watched it a bunch of times. I was like, yeah, I've never seen it. She's like, what? How have you never seen Pearl Harbor? I was like, because it's Pearl Harbor, a Michael Bay World War II movie that's trying to kind of like Titanic, the Pearl Harbor, except not James Cameron, Michael Bay. That's why. And she's like, yeah, but. I was like, I don't know. I don't know where you're going with this one, but I haven't seen it. So I, I've now seen it, and it wasn't very memorable. Peanuts movie. What a great little uh, update of Peanuts that captures all the magic and the energy of Peanuts and the the humor, the characters, but updates it for modern animation while still feeling like classic animation. I mean, it has the same style, except it's in 3D, which is just a really cool thing to do. Piercy Jackson collection. I've never read the books, and so I have no point of reference to have any thoughts on whether it's a good adaptation. I've only heard it's a terrible adaptation. And so I watched the first one last year for the first time. Um, didn't have any interesting thoughts on it. It's like, okay, I have seen that now. People tell me it's terrible. I have don't have. I don't know if that's the case. Okay, we got we got a couple different versions in here. I guess we can I guess we can pull this one out of the mix. Perks of Being a Wallflower. Man, I've heard amazing things about this film. Ever since it came out, I heard people tell me it was really good. I just haven't seen it yet. And uh, it's got the Ezra Miller in there, so that'd be a fun one, given all the hijinks Ezra has been up to as of recently. So um, have to see him in something that where he's not a creepy wizard or uh, the Flash. Need to check it out. We have uh, Pet Cemeteries. Uh, th so I'd never seen the original one until like a week. I saw it just a few days before the new one came out. My buddy invited me over to watch it. So I watched it for the very first time and then watched the, the remakes. I had definitely nostalgia, so I was kind of fine with the remake. You know, a bit generic. It's like, okay, this exists. It's got 21st century slickness, but it doesn't necessarily have the spark that you want. So it kind of felt like it was kind of missing something, but I was fine with it. It didn't bother me, but I have no deep ties to the other one. We have Pig, one of my favorite movies of last year. It legitimately, on a certain level, is, on a plot level, very similar to John Wick. But there's also a terrible point of reference for what this movie is, because this is not an action movie. There's no action in it. But at the same time, it does have kind of this, the same like world building, this guy with a powerful name in a certain community um, returns on a revenge mission tied to an animal that the person was close to, but it's nothing like John Wick, but it's amazing. It is such a weird, amazing film. Pinocchio, a movie that, uh, I know it's a classic, but every time I watch it, I'm like, wow, this is dark. The message here is weird. 
this is a very strange message where you have like a naive child being taken advantage of by adults. And for some reason, the naive child is getting in trouble for this. I don't know. Weird movie that uh, I get. I know it's a classic, but some classics for people back in the day were harsh and brutal. Pirates of the Caribbean, Person of the, the Black Pearl. Great, great adventure film. A movie that you never knew you, you wanted a, a ride adapted into a movie. And then you saw the trailer, like, that looks really good. And then you saw the movie and it was like, that was even better than the trailer. Wow, what a special thing. And then for the next 15 years, all Johnny Depp did was play Jack Sparrow and different things. Pitch perfect. Didn't see the first one in the theater. About a year after it came out, we rented it. Cause my wife was like, well, let me check that out. And I, I think I fell asleep about halfway through it. Not because I didn't like it. I was just tired. I just fell asleep. And I woke up at like two hours later. And she, it was at the beginning again. I woke up two hours after it was at the beginning. And again, I woke up at two hours later. It was beginning again. And I woke up the next day because uh, I needed to go to work. And it was at the beginning. And I'm like, what just happened? She goes, oh, yeah, I stayed up all night rewatching the movie. I'm like, oh, you really loved it. Goes, Not that much. I didn't like it all that much. She did. She liked it that much. That was her musical of that year. So she's just started watching this movie every day for like a year straight. And then when the second one came out, she was like, yeah, I'm not that interested in checking it out. Like, really? You watched the... For two years straight, you've watched this every single night. You don't want to watch the second one? Eh, I don't really care. And then after it came out on video, she finally watched it. And she wasn't as into that one, but was into it. Actually, she watched it a couple days ago. I actually went to bed watching it. Then the third one came out and... Um, it is a movie that does exist. Uh, it's not memorable. It's only memorable for being a movie that shouldn't exist and shouldn't, certainly shouldn't exist as it is. And she has definitely never put this one on to go to bed. We own it. It's right there in our collection. And she, she's never put it on because it was just... I don't know, it's like, for some reason in these... like Same with The Hangover. Like the third one, they turn it into a like action movie for some reason. Weird... Weird flex. Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, the best Thanksgiving movie of all time. Great road trip movie. Hilarious film that, um, yeah, uh, just heart, much more heartfelt than you, you, always, you always forget how heartfelt it actually is. And then we got a couple things in here. We got, it's a little bit tricky because we got the full Planet of the Apes collection with all the movies in there right there. And that's, so that's, that's a special one that you want to, Keep that together. But then we also have the steel book for War for the Planet of the Apes. So I think we have to have that one in there too. So um, classic franchise and then the remake trilogy or prequel trilogy. So much better than it had any right to be. It was just an amazing set of films. Point Break. Um, classic 90s action film. One of the movies that established Mr. Reeves as an action movie star. Then we got a trilogy of Pokemon films. Got this one in my fan mail. Someone sent it to me because they knew my kids like Pokemon and they were right. And so you watched uh, a num these a number of times. Uh, I, I was a little bit looser in my viewing of it, but the kids were paying close, close attention. Got the Polar Express uh, Christmas classic. I've never actually watched this beginning again because the characters just creep me out too much. Like, uh, I, I never understood the appeal of the film, and it, it just looks super duper duper creepy. Then this is a cool one right here. This is a Criterion Collection edition of Jackie Chan's Police Story 1 and 2. And uh, Police Story 1 is one of my favorite Jackie Chan films. On a story level, it's very weird. They, very, they do stories. They did stories very different from martial arts films back there in the 80s. The action in it, I think, is his... That's my favorite style of Jackie Chan action, that it has a little bit of the prop foo, but it also has just kind of him at his physical peak and just did some, I love the way that he choreographed the fights and did the stunt work and incorporated it all together in it. And you got a Criterion Collection edition of it. Then another, <laughs> there's a sticky note on it that says Liam Neeson, Liam Neeson, Liam Neeson, and it's on Ponyo, which I don't, does it have Liam Neeson? It does, it does, it does have Liam Neeson in there. So, I guess it's a, uh, um, isn't this a Studio Ghibli? Is it one of them ones? Except uh, it got Liam Neeson doing some of the voices. And I was like, what, Liam Neeson, what does that mean? Oh, he did one of the voices. That did, oh, there you go. It's right there on the top, gigantic. You can tell my brain's a little bit fried by this point in time that I didn't see that. Um, so, once again, one of those ones, one of these days I gotta go through it, but that day has not come yet. Then we've got uh, our Predator movies, and I guess we can... Okay, yeah, we can pull this one out of rotation because we've got a 
4Ks of the first three films right there. Yesterday we got the teaser trailer for a new Predator movie that's coming in uh, later this year that's a set a couple years in the past, 100 years ago in the past. That's pretty cool. Love those movies. Pretty generic 4K set right there. Then we have The Predator, the movie I left my wife in the hospital after she gave birth to go check out. And uh, what a bad movie to choose to do that for because uh, that one... Uh, Kind of a disappointment. The Prestige, the Christopher Nolan film about magic. I've never been crazy about this one. It's never fully worked for me. Um, but the people that like that movie love it, and they are baffled as to why I don't like it. So uh, maybe one of these days I'll, I'll get the trick. As of thus far, like I watch it, I'm like, yeah, it's kind of good, great performances. There's some wit to it. But, man, these two guys are jerks. We got Prisoners. I had two Hugh Jackman movies in a row. Uh, Denny Villeneuve movie, watched it for the first time last year, great little movie about a kid that goes missing, like just really good, tense from beginning to end. Primal Fear, I think this is the movie that put Edward Norton on the map as this serious acting force. So one of these movies are like, did he do it? Did he not do it? You're watching the trial and everything, and twists and turns all along the way. I haven't watched it in a little bit, but I remember it being a good one. The, pro, uh, the Protégé, I was going to say The Prestige. We just talked about this. This is The Protégé, the Martin Campbell action thriller with Michael Keaton, Samuel L. Jackson, uh, and uh, Maggie Q in it. And uh, I was really excited to check this one out because it's Martin Campbell, a director I really enjoy doing an action thriller, a genre I really like with a bunch of actors I really like. And then it came out of one of those busy times last year, so I missed it. But finally picked, uh, finally caught it before the end of the year. And it wasn't as good as I'd hoped. Kind of, kind of weird. The direction it kind of takes things and the vibe that it has. Prince of Persia, the video game adaptation from Disney, that is kind of a fun adventure. Also, kind of convoluted and has way too much stuff going on. That, um, especially for all the cool, the the video games have a very parkour before parkour was a thing vibe to them, and there's not nearly enough of that in the movie, and so it just gets kind of lost in what it was trying to do. There's there's parts that are really cool, but as a whole, kind of lacks out. Another one of our Studio Ghibli films. There's I think it was one person sent me kind of all of these, and it's just someday we'll have I'll have my Studio Ghibli a thon and, and play catch up on them. But the day has not come yet. We have the Protector Two. I believe it's the sequel to. Um, well, not, I don't believe it. It is the sequel to Tony Jaws the Protector, but I don't think it's actually on a plot level has many connections to it. But um, Tony Jaws, one of these guys that had like did a couple of movies that were just jaw dropping in what he was able to do, and then he took a bunch of time, did Ung Bak two and three that are not really tied to the original Ung Bak, and he directed them but didn't quite have the magic, and then he just I don't know it just seemed like a guy that maybe it was a paralysis or analysis that just kind of too much too many thoughts kind of going into him. Here's a fun one. Uh, someone sent me a few years back in my early phases of my my fan mail. Um, the Prince movies, as well as a Prince Funko Pop and some Prince fan art of him as the Joker, as well as the soundtrack for Batman 89, which was done by Prince. And so I hadn't seen them before. So this was pretty cool to kind of kind of check out his movies and not necessarily the sort of thing that I, I naturally gravitate towards. But um, it's always sometimes fun to just see even if there's people that everybody likes movies and they love some movies and there's people that just love movies. And even in my kids, I could see the difference where Liam only wants to watch movies Liam wants to watch. And Chloe's just interested in seeing different things and watching movies because she likes movies. A little bit more like me. And so this one of those ones that like, it wouldn't naturally gravitate to watch it. I wouldn't think to rent it. But having it like, oh, let me check that. What is, what, is, what is a Prince movie? Like, what is a Purple Rain? And um, this is someone who loves movies experiencing something new. is was kind of cool. Princess Bride, just that classic uh, family adventure so quotable and a movie that on so many levels is weird with the nature of the score, the soundtrack, the film itself. It's all distinctly itself. It's unlike anything out there, but so accessible and has been loved for many years. And it wasn't like a hit when it came out, but it was one of those movies that just instantly people got caught hold of on home video. Prince of Egypt, I actually watched this for the first time just a couple years ago, which given the circles I'm in was a little bit strange, but it's interesting because it's like a, it's a, family entertainment film, uh, film that's very intense. I mean, obviously, The Exodus is a pretty intense story if you take it seriously, and so it takes it seriously. So it's an intense story. Um, next up, we have Leon the Professional, the Luke Besson action thriller. 
with uh, Jean Reno as the professional and Natalie Portman, a very young Natalie Portman as this person that she kind of takes in and a coked out of his mind. Gary Oldman is the villain and uh, used to watch this film all the time. It's, it's been a while. I need, to, I need to check this one out again. But um, Luc Besson did some great action thrillers back in the day there. Then we have the quadrilogy of Psycho. Now, I've seen the original one uh, many times, but I haven't seen the sequels yet. I've been meaning to do a Psycho ranking one of these days to check them out because I, I don't even I have no idea where the plot goes after the first one so very curious about this one but it just hasn't happened yet. it almost happened in 2020 multiple times and then well obviously it didn't happen Pulp Fiction one of my favorite movies of all time a movie that uh, you know generally speaking I'm a pretty mainstream kind of person that likes the classic structures classic everything and then there's occasionally those movies that just break all the rules and you love them anyway for it and that's what Pulp Fiction is then we have Three Punishers in a row right there. Four Punishers in a row right there. Okie dokie. First one up, Punisher 89. I actually put this on to go to bed last night, the Dolph Lundgren one. That um, It's a movie that's almost totally forgotten uh, that it exists. wasn't released in theaters here. And it's interesting because like it was written by Boaz Yakin, who wrote like and directed... Um, Remember the Titans, like, he's a really good filmography. The guy that directed it was a, is, a, like, one of the most famous editors of all time in Terminator 2. Um, I mean, he did, like, you could just list off his movies, but, like, all these classic movies, he's one of the most famous, prolific, high-level editors of all time. Hasn't directed any movies. One of them is this one. So, great screenwriter, a director with amazing filmography. Um, Robert Mark Kamen, who wrote The Karate Kid, was a producer on it. Almost no one's seen him. And then we have, uh, I guess we can pull this one out of rotation because I got the 4K Steelbook right now. This one actually came out only a couple months back. Picked this one up. And frustrating thing is that there's a director's cut for this movie that is significantly different. It's like 30 minutes longer. It actually adds like a subplot back into the movie. And then on it, there's like a, um, it's not cut into the movie, but they show an animatic an animated kind of version, not quite fully animated, like storyboard animation for a deleted prologue to the film that would kind of establish some of the relationships with Frank and his wartime era. And it's really cool stuff, but it's not, they didn't put it on this one for some reason. So I sent, mentioned that in the my Blu-ray haul video when I bought this and someone sent me in fan mail the DVD that has the director's cut as well as the animatic stuff like that. It was really cool. That is baffling. Why would you put out a 4K steelbook? after all these years and leave out the director's cut, the other version of the film and very cool special features. That's the, um, the release of home media that drives me crazy when they do that stuff. Then we have Punisher War Zone, the movie that was started out as being a sequel to this one. And even Thomas Jane talked about training for it and everything, getting ready to do it. And then it all fell through and they brought in uh, a different writer director that took everything in a different direction, gave it a more cartoonish tone, but like cartoonish in the realm of like, ultra violent that matches the car matches the comics themselves and so it, it's it's a bit of, like it's a movie it's the front a beginning is ultra violent action filled the end is ultra violent action mode it gets pretty slow in the middle there surprisingly but there's some really good stuff in there a movie that i don't maybe it needed a bigger budget to be able to have more consistent action sequences but it's almost there but not quite yet i don't think we've had We've got like all these different versions of Punisher and all of them have something that's interesting about them. And not, there's not the, the one that's like just in my mind, the definitive one. Uh, like Bernthal's really good in the role on in like Daredevil season two, but his actual show, I don't think the show matched the magic of him on Daredevil. We got close out this section with three Purge movies. We got the original Purge, which is took, it takes this great concept of the Purge and makes it a home invasion movie, which kind of wastes the concept. We have the Purge, uh, the first Purge, which gets a little bit too pro uh, political and preachy while talking about the Purge. And then we have the movie that I think balances all of it the best, the Purge, Anarchy, the one where I actually spend time in the Purge has a little social commentary, has a little bit of the politics. You get the idea, but you get it through the social, like it explores socioeconomic inequality through the purge. Watch out just telling purge carnage stuff, not preaching at you. So, all righty, at this point in time, we are now two thirds of the way through our adventure. The top two shelves are done, which means 
it is now nine o'clock at night. I've been filming for nine hours now, and we're only two thirds of the way through. Now I have paused multiple times to spend time with my kids when they got home from school and I've eaten and things like that. But we are nine hours into filming and only two thirds of the way through. Whoo! But as someone that has made it this far, put a green apple in the comments. If you can do it as an emoji or whatever that is, put it down there. If you can just can type green apple, that is your code word that you have made it two thirds of the way through this video. That is quite the accomplishment. Probably not as impressive as me filming this thing. Whew, I don't know what I was thinking doing this one all in one day. I don't. I think this is the last year it's being done in one day. It's not possible to continue what, to continue doing this in single sittings. But you've made it. Green apple down in the comments. Then we make it to a letter of the alphabet where I don't own very many movies. Q. First up, Quick and the Dead, the Sam Raimi uh, Western. I forgot the word Western there for a second. The Sam Raimi Western, I uh, actually watched it uh, just a few weeks back in prep for my Sam Raimi ranking that we keep talking about. Hadn't seen it in a long time. It was a, it was a nice little one because you got the Raimiisms in there, but you also have like a young Leonardo DiCaprio and a young Russell Crowe before, before either one of them moved to the A-list. So just a nice little pleasant surprise. Then we have a quiet place, uh, just a great little concept that makes for a suspenseful home invasion film about aliens invading a home, but it's also a family drama about dealing with regret and pain and things like that and co incorporates them all together and doesn't overstay its welcome. So just a nice, uh, I keep, I, someone needs to count the number of times I've said nice as well as the number of times I've rubbed my nose, but there we have it. Those are our cues. So now it's time for our R's. Kicking it off is Ragamuffin, the movie based off the life of Rich Mullins. I haven't been able to check it out yet. The gentleman that sent it to me in my fan mail asked me about that in my DMs recently, and uh, I forgot to respond back. But now that I'm looking at it, I can respond. I haven't yet. It's very much on my mind. Uh, Rich Mullins, like I listened to his music back in the day, well, sung a bunch of his songs back in the day at church. I guess still sing some of his songs still in church. And, um, then um, had a number of his albums and his story, his life is very interesting of kind of who he was, how he chose to live and then the tragedy of his, his death. And so I'm curious how that all kind of plays out. We have Raging Bull, the Martin Scorsese boxing film with Robert De Niro. Another one of those ones that uh, uh, hopefully I'll get watched in the next six months to that Scorsese ranking. But I have seen Raging Bull. It's just been a, a very long time. Then we have The Raid Collection. And when it's two movies, collection seems like an awfully big word for it. But whatever, it's The Raid Collection. Both Raid films, some of the best action movies of the last decade of just amazing choreography. And uh, immediately just took the, the main guy, Eco and launched him to action movie superstar. And you know now he's going to be in The Expendables next year and everything like that. Then we have my collection of... Rambo 4Ks, all of them in beautiful 4K fashion and all part of the same series too, so they all match each other, which I, I always enjoy. But uh, of course, love Stallone, my favorite actor of all time. And this is uh, one of his two premium franchises. So got to own all of those. So that, I didn't really, I, I don't even remember when I've completed that. I had them in different versions before, but now they're, they're all the right 4Ks. We have Rampage, another video game movie, but based off like a video game from a long time ago that nobody remembers. So a video game movie that nobody remembers is a video game movie also has The Rock in it, but mostly it's just The Rock in a movie with big gigantic monsters destroying a town, which I guess is the premise of the video game. Raya and the Last Dragon, a Disney animated film from last year that I thought was just a really cool epic with a nice, nice world building and conflict where you could see the faults of our hero and sympathize with our villain a little bit. And I just thought well-rounded characters in, a, in an interesting environment that you cared about. Ready or not, uh, a nice little film about a girl trying to survive her wedding night as her in-laws try to kill her as part of a ritual that they do. And um, I love this type of film. I love there was Samara Weaving and all the supporting cast are like, people like, oh, this person's in it, this person, this is it. Oh, very cool, very cool. And uh, then when these people, guys that did this one were announced as the team to do the new screen film, I thought, I'm on board with that. That 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 is a great fit right there, and I'm, I I would say they they pulled it off. Ready Player One, the Steven Spielberg adaptation of the book. I love the book, 
And um, this is one of the rare times where I read the book before I saw the movie. And uh, I'll be do do the cliche. The book is better than the movie. The book, the movie feels like the dumbed down version of the book, where everything is like, okay, we can't develop this whole subplot about the school system and why this would be here. So uh, a chase. Let's just do a chase. It's a race, or a race, shit, not a chase, it's a race. Oh, really? That's what you're going to do? So it, it's still fun, but it's a perfect example of how a movie that I probably would have liked more if I, I saw it before I read the book, but uh, I was disappointed. Then Red, which is actually a DC comic adaptation where mostly it's just a bunch of aging actors having fun, hanging out together, making an action movie. It works well enough as that. Uh, they're having fun, so you're having fun with them. Doesn't... Doesn't, it's not too memorable. They have Red Sparrow, a movie that um, was a, a lot more rapey than I was expecting. <laughs> uh, probably not something to laugh at, but wanted to, like it went into it kind of expecting to watch like this spy thriller, and then it's like very intense sexual violence in it uh, that ties into the plot because sex and espionage and all that, and like having to desensitize these girls, and it's like oh, wow, wow. Uh, so I haven't even finished it yet. So I can't even give you my thoughts, my review of it. I just say that whenever I went to watch it, I wasn't expecting that, so it was a bit much for me. We have Reign of Fire, the movie where Christian Bale and Matthew McConaughey team up to battle dragons that have taken over the earth. Isn't Gerard Butler in it too? It's been a while since I... Yeah, Gerard Butler's in it too before he kind of took off from 300. Actually, several years before he took off from 300. And uh, I remember when this movie came out, went to go see and had fun with it, but... Not as good as it should have been, given that it's a, it's a dragon movie. It's before Christian Bale was Batman, so before he became Christian Bale. In which case, now it's just kind of this thing that's out there where there's a movie where you can go watch it and Gerard Butler and Christian Bale and Matthew McConaughey hey, high-five each other and kill dragons. Reservoir Dogs, Quentin Tarantino's first film that, right out of the gate, had his style, his dialogue, his characters, his unique way of doing things. It's a really cool film. This is funny because it's the 30th anniversary Blu-ray. The movie now came out 30 years ago, so time for an update for this one. Man, the time just disappears. Then we have Respect, the um, Aretha Franklin film that came out last year. Uh, it came out actually during a month. I was like, right as I was going, I believe it was last August when I was going on a beach trip, so I just I just missed it. Uh, so I haven't been able to watch it yet, and so someone wanted me to, to see it and sent to me into my um, fan mail, but... Um, it's just, it's also one of those ones that, uh, of kind of old classic music, pop music, you know, I, I, of course, listened to a ton of Aretha Franklin, but wasn't one of the specific artists that I was distinctly interested in. Um, so maybe that's a reason to check it out because I don't know her story and I don't know, know any of that. So maybe that's a reason to check it out, but uh, it wasn't one that immediately like popped. And I hear a lot of buzz around it, a lot of people saying it was amazing or anything. So it just wasn't one that I felt the need to rush out to watch. Speaking of movies you need to rush out to watch, Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City is not one of them. It's a movie that got the aesthetics of Resident Evil right, but on a plot level, it's like they tried to mash together several of the games. And as someone that... And it's filled with Easter eggs for the games, but as someone that hasn't played the games through when I saw the movie, I've been playing through Resident Evil 2 since seeing this. And so I could understand some of the references now much better than I could then, but... Like, stuff happened, and I was like, I know this means something to someone. It's like an in-joke, and I am not in on the joke. But, uh, so, and there's also some just stupid lapses in logic in the movie. Where There's one part where, like, people are in a mansion, and a helicopter crashes into the mansion, and people on the other side of the mansion don't hear it. I've never been in a mansion when a helicopter crashed into it, but I'm pretty sure, no matter how big the mansion is, if a helicopter crashes into it, you hear that. Uh, then we have the all six film collection for the other Resident Evil films, and it's a weird franchise. It just kind of goes off the rails at some point in time and gets so lost in its own mythology of like trying to continue things that um, you you run into a problem when you you never want to you can't resolve anything. Okay, these are all out. Of, I dropped these right before as I was carrying them over. So these are out of order. We got The Revenant, the, what is it, Alejandro Irabantu, how is it, Inar, R N la, la. brain fried, Alejandro Inaratu, I, I'm, I'm always going to mispronounce it, but more importantly, I will definitely botch it when my brain is as fried as it is right now, but I haven't watched this one yet, I've, I remember when it came out and all the buzz chatter surrounding it, but um, 
uh, just one of those ones that's once again been on my radar. I know that I'm missing out on something, but it hasn't happened quite yet. Rise of the Guardians. I only saw what this one once. Fun little concept. Interesting idea. Um, had fun, some fun with the adventure of it. Um, of Wasn't crazy about the animation style, but fun enough, I, I suppose. Rio. Uh, never seen this one. So maybe someday. Hasn't happened yet. The Road to El Dorado. Now, I watched this one for the first time when I did my DreamWorks ranking. And maybe it's because I was watching 40 DreamWorks movies in a row, but it didn't stand out all that interesting to me and um so i had it pretty low on my ranking people were like how dare you not like that movie like i didn't know i didn't i didn't know i was supposed to like it more i don't apparently you guys had a different experience with it than me you have robin hood the classic disney animated one with talking animals i grew up watching this one's so i have a lot of fond memories just of my childhood of like yeah robin hood um I, I rewatching it this last year I, not one of the best disney animated films but still cute and fun we have Robin Hood. Now, this is the Robin Hood movie I still watch quite a bit, or watched a ton in my childhood and still enjoy as an adult. Maybe that's a better way to phrase it. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, with Alan Rickman as the Sheriff of Nottingham, just doing an amazing job. Uh, Kevin Costner doing a terrible job with his accent, but I don't care at all. And then this is the movie where I first saw Morgan Freeman. Um, obviously, he had a career before that, but this is the movie that kind of introduced me to him. <coughs> And uh, so <laughs> I've always enjoyed that movie. <clears throat> oh, I think we're, we hit that moment where my voice is dying. This could be rough. We got a lot of movies still to talk to. We made a lot of progress, but if my throat starts dying now, we are in big trouble. But I've always enjoyed this one. Um, an early PG-13 movie I could go see, and uh, I, I thought it was a good time. RoboCop. I don't have the classic RoboCop, but I do have the reboot right there. I didn't think it was terrible. It's not great. It's generic. It shouldn't be PG-13. And it, feel, it feels like a movie that was written and filmed to be two and a half hours long. And they went, mm, let's just make it two hours. And then they, they trimmed it down to two hours because they just that's what the producers wanted or the studio wanted. But I, it's not as bad as its reputation. It's just like a classic example of when you take a director from someone with such a distinct style as Paul Verhoeven that's so beloved by so many people and go give it to someone else. It's probably not going to translate well. The Rock, another movie in the trilogy of Nicolas Cage action films. This one from Michael Bay. And uh, just the Michael Bay film that almost everyone actually does like. is uh, just a solid 90s action film with Sean Connery, Ed Harris, and of course Nicolas Cage, and more. Um, that has all of his visual flair, plenty of quotable one-liners. And even just a little bit of mythology to it and fleshing things out. We have Rock and Roller, the Guy Ritchie film with Gerard Butler, or Jerry as his friends call him. And uh, it seemed like uh, after making a couple, uh, let's call them weird films, Guy Ritchie trying to get back to what he's good at and doing an okay job. It was uh, much better than those ones, but didn't quite capture the magic of Lock, Stock, and Snatch. Rocket Man, now... Uh, it's kind of like back-to-back -back years. We had Bohemian Rhapsody and Rocket Man. I liked Rocket Man a lot more. I just thought it had a much more creative way of telling its story that um, while taking license and all sorts of freedom with the story, it fit with what they were doing with Rocket Man, with the creativity, whereas Bohemian Rhapsody felt just a little bit to me like, this is just weird because it's not true. This is a lie. Then we have Rocketeer. Now, this is a fun one. I, I saw it uh, right... I thought like the I thought saw it, I went to Disney World. That's just for phrase. I went to Disney World the summer that this came out, and so they had all these Rocketeer presentations, and I met the Rocketeer. I was actually going through some photo albums recently and saw my picture of myself with the Rocketeer, the actual Rocketeer, the superhero from the '40s. He probably must have been very old by the time this happened because it was you know 50 years uh, later. But um, just a really nice little. It's actually a comic book movie. It falls into that category, but. Um, if you haven't seen it, I recommend checking that one out. Another one from Joe Johnston that uh, uh, he just captures that classic throwback Raiders of the Lost Ark vibe of adventure films. He's really good at that. I mean, he was part of the Lucasfilm crew, so it makes sense, but um, it was really good. Then, this is funny the way this plays out, we've got Creed and Creed 2. Why are they right here? Because I put them in the Rocky section, but apparently all of my Rocky movies have disappeared. So there's no Rocky movies in the Rocky section, but we have two C movies, two Creed movies. I, I thoroughly enjoyed both of these films. Um, and the second one worked... 
I, I was worried about it. I thought it worked really nicely. Um, bringing Dolph Lundgren back and continuing the ability for the Creed franchise to give legitimacy to Rocky IV, which is a pretty silly film. And they found a way to take a silly film and give it emotional, dramatic weight. But I love both those movies. I also love the Rocky movies, but I apparently don't own any of them on Blu-ray. Now, we got a Creed three coming out later this year, so I was almost certainly buy whatever the best Rocky set you can buy is and watch through all of them. Maybe I'll do a review series. I, I need to do that one of these days. Could cover all the Rocky movies in detail. That's tough when you have that much nostalgia for movies. Role models. I, know I've, I have seen it before, but I don't... It's been too long, so I can't say much about it. The big thing to say about this film is that I clearly got this from Blockbuster when Blockbuster was going out of business. And as you can see from the sticker right here, maybe you can't see it because it's too small. And so it's a funky shape. Well, we got a few of these ones that are funky shaped and one of them is role models. Then we have Room, the Brie Larson film. I haven't seen it yet, but that's the one where she got all of her awards and stuff and praise. And uh, that led to her getting roles in uh, Marvel movies and things like that. Rumble in the Bronx, Jackie Chan's movie where he crossed over to the U.S. markets. And it was, I mean, it was a Hong Kong film that they dubbed it and cut it and readjusted it. And so this is the movie for me where I saw the trailer. I was like, who is this guy? Look how cool this guy. I need, who, I need to check out his movies. And I wasn't able to see this one just yet because it's rated R and I couldn't drive yet. And my mom didn't take me. But I think, I, I think Operation Condor came out. I was able, that one was PG-13, so I was able to see that one. And then I, I went down the whole rabbit hole and became super duper into his stuff. Run All Night, one of the Liam Neeson action thrillers. And I think one of the better ones. And it is from that same guy we keep mentioning that I... I always miss, his name is a tricky one, Jume Colette Serra, who's doing Black Adam, just did Jungle Cruise, and did a thousand of these Liam Neeson action thrillers. This is probably the best of the ones that he did, that just has a little bit more emotional weight, better performances, better story, better kind of everything, while still having the director's unique style. Then we have the Rush Hour trilogy that was so happy when Rush Hour turned out to be a big hit because I had been tracking with Jackie Chan for a couple years by the time Rush Hour, Rush Hour came out. And it was like, that was an actual Hollywood film, not let's take a Hong Kong movie and adjust it. This was his first one where they went, okay, not his first. He actually in the mid 80s had some other ones too, but of the era that actually clicked and worked. Rumble and Blocks made some money. Operation Condor made some money. All right, let's give him a movie. And they teamed him up with Chris Tucker. And it was just really good and really entertaining. And then the second one was really good and really entertaining. I've actually never seen the third one, though, which is crazy. But this is cool packaging for it. Um, I, I need to do a ranking of these movies. Just watch them. Now I can watch them with my kids. And that'd be fun. And finally see the third one and see figure out if it's actually any good. But got fun packaging for it. Those are our R's. And now the S's, the letter where I own the most movies. This is by far the biggest section of my collection right here. So let's get to it. First up, we have a couple movies stuck together. We've got Salt, the Angelina Jolie action pick from, I like it feels like this movie just came out, but I know it came out over 10 years ago. What is the actual date? 2010. So it's a 12-year-old movie. But I was like, yeah, this movie just came... Oh, that was 12 years ago. I'm old. My concept of time isn't great. Never seen it. I've been meaning to. Like, I saw the trailer. Went, yeah, I think I'll like that. Still haven't watched it yet. However, Sandlot, I have seen many times. So Sandlot, um, I was in the fifth grade when it came out. So I was the target demographic for this movie when it came out. I was the original generation to love this movie and... It's one of these ones that kind of has connected with generations as go along. Of It's kind of has a timeless feel to it because it was a period piece when it came out. And just fun, fun cast about kids hanging out um, with some quotable lines to it. Just real good little movie about growing up and friendship. Saving Private Ryan, the Steven Spielberg World War II classic uh, I've actually seen this one, I think, well, I've seen it one time, I think it was on the theater. One of these movies that, like, a, a classic, but also, like, a pretty brutal experience as you watch the whole thing, because war is, is brutal, and this movie kind of demonstrates that. So, one that I, I really need to watch again. When he says I gotta, I need to do a Spielberg ranking, too. Like, Spielberg's my favorite director. Never done a Spielberg ranking, so... It's, like, an obvious one. Like, gotta do it, but when... 
Then our Saw 7 movie collection. Quite efficient. Slim little pack. Seven movies crammed into this thing. Sometimes you wonder, like, how do you fit seven movies into a thing like this? I've never seen any of these movies until I had my YouTube channel and then did a Saw ranking. And I was like, I gotta watch these. And it's it's a weirdly addicting franchise because it's like, you'll watch Saw 4 and it's like, that wasn't very good. But they end like with a cliffhanger. And like, how are they gonna tie this together with this cliffhanger? What's gonna happen to that guy? So you wanna watch the next one. It's it's, it's interesting the way that works. Wax. I'm not even saying words right. Like everything's turning into some f funny wax, wax. Not a good sign. Jigsaw, the... This is the second time in the history of my channel they tried to do a revivalist, or this one was the first one. They've done a second one. The other, second one was uh, last year, but this was the first of two times during the history of my channel they've tried to do a Saw revival. And um, I didn't think this one was as effective, but it was better than most of the later Saw films, at least in my estimation. Like, that was clever enough. That was that was kind of good. Um, not nothing like the original or anything, but smarter than some of that, some other ones. We have Schindler's List uh, Spielberg's other World War II film, this one being about the holo not not a war film, but being about the Holocaust itself, and just one of those movies where you go, that was incredible. I never want to watch that again. <laughs> like, that was amazing. It was so good at what it was trying to do that I never want to watch it. And the thing you always have to remind yourself of, because in light of his more recent careers, just so dominates your understanding of filmography, Schindler's List stars Liam Neeson as Oscar Schindler. And he'd been a working actor for, you know, 15 years at the point in time that he did Schindler's List. But, uh, you know, he he's in one of the great movies of all time that is as somber and serious of a movie as you can get. And he forgets that sometimes, like, he's Oscar Schindler because he's done, you know, Taken 3 and 1,000 movies knocking off Taken. Um, so... You know, but he, he when when the time is right, he can actually pull off these amazing performances. Oh, 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 what do we got here? We've got another Schindler's List, the 4K, so we can put keep the 4K in the stack, and our other Schindler's List can go in the pile over there. Gotta figure out what to do with the pile. I wish there was wish there was some easy way that didn't require me doing a bunch of mailing that I could think to giveaways and send them to you easily. Um, but I don't know how we would do that. Um, that doesn't turn into a bunch of administrative work for me that I want to do. Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Now, I, re I read these books when I was in grade school and remember them at the book fairs and things like that. And so they weren't like a major part of my childhood. I wasn't like obsessed with anything, but I you know, read them. I was familiar with them and, you know, all that fun stuff. Uh, the movie itself, I thought, um, and it's supposed to be kind of like that, like middle zone entry level horror. And I just thought it, it didn't quite work. I thought it was like a weird mix of being like, oh, that's actually pretty horrifying. I don't like that at all. And this is way too kiddy. Like I, I didn't, I thought it, it picked up the wrong, the wrong blend. So it didn't work for me, but a lot of other people seem to like it. Then we got a pair of Scooby-Doo movies. First one up, Scooby-Doo and the Cyber Jays. One of the fun things about Scooby-Doo is there's a zillion of these directed video movies he's done that tackle all sorts of stuff. Aliens, Cyber Attacks, all of it. Then Scooby-Doo, The Mystery Begins. The young versions of them where you had a Robbie Achmel, um, Stephen Achmel's um, uh, cousin that they're some people think they're brothers not they're cousins they're just cousins that act like brothers and hang out a lot both are actors um and they they could be brothers but they are in fact not but it's got robbie right there in this one as fred but never seen this one and i said so i did a scooby-doo ranking and a bunch of people like hey sean you left out the other uh, prequel ones i was like well they're they're not theatrically released that's why i didn't put them in there and that's normally the way i do my my rankings that's why they're not in there i, I didn't really forget about them it was a choice to not include them Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, the Edgar Wright adaptation of the Scott Pilgrim comics and a movie that is unlike anything you've ever seen. That it starts out as like this simple like guy working through his love life and loneliness, meets a girl that he likes, and then turns out she has a history. Which means he has to fight all of her crazy ex-boyfriends and all of them are masters of the martial arts. And has the wildest visual style and it uses um, visual onomatopoeia like words on the screen with like they did in uh, you know the 1960s Batman except super creative like a video game when words pop up on the screen just amazing 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 and a movie that didn't make any money <laughs> like lost a bunch of money because they gave him all this money to make this cr wild crazy film 
and then it, it couldn't make its budget back. But um, so glad that the studio gave him way too much money to make that film. Then we have the 4K for Scream. Finally, the 4K came out uh, just this last year. It's my favorite slasher of all time. And uh, of horror movies, I like the slasher genre, the simplicity of it, the survival of it. And these ones were funny, they're self-referential, but probably most importantly, the Scream movies in that type of horror film were the popular genre during my formative years when I was in high school. The first one came out in 96, that's when I was starting high school, and then the third one came out when I was a senior in high school, so those were the ones of my, my high school era. And I even own the soundtrack for all of them. And so these are the ones that meant the world to me. And I love the fact that the, the franchise is still going strong and never, like, I don't think the third one's great, but it didn't, it never went off the rails for a long period of time. We got The Secret Life of Pets 2. And, uh, you know, simple illumination, cute animal movies. I thought I think I thought the second one was a little bit better than the first one. Not terribly memorable, but entertaining enough whilst watching it. Then we got Seven, the David Fincher film that really put him on the map. Now he did Alien Three, and wasn't well received. Troubled production. Not really a David Fincher film. I mean, he's the director, but not in the same sense as his other films. So then a few years later, we got Seven, and just a great serial killer movie one maybe or one of the greats if not the greatest serial killer movie out there that uh sticks with you just memorable from beginning to end we got the seven samurai and this is cool this is the criterion collection like jumbo edition one where uh you know got the booklet in there all the fun stuff special features and just amazing packaging so the akira kurosawa film that uh inspired the Magnificent Seven. Magnificent Seven is just a westernized, western version of Seven Samurai. Same exact plot line. And that's true of a, lot, a bunch of these Kira Kurosawa films that he basically created all these, the best westerns are just remakes of his samurai films. And even Star Wars is a is a remake of sorts. Not really a remake, that's, oh, it's overstated, but heavily takes influence from The Hidden Fortress. And if you just watch The Hidden Fortress, you're like, really? What are you talking about? But when you see the comparisons of like the what clearly, and Lucas has said this, took from that movie, it's pretty clear what that is. And even The Hidden Fortress, the Death Star is a hidden fortress that looks like a moon. Nope, that is a fortress. But um, you know, Kira Kurosawa is just one of these incredibly influential filmmakers that both in his movies, he made great movies, and then the remakes of his movies are also great. It's like such great source material that they spawned greatness too. Then we have a shadow a film. I actually, uh, I checked out a few years back. I uh, got this one in my fan mail. I watched, it was going to do a review and I got too busy, but um, a movie that just is so visually so striking, so interesting. It, like right out of the ghetto, I was like, I don't think I've any, seen anything like this. It, like, I don't even know what I'm looking at because it's just the use of color and the way it was done was just... Uh, kind of jaw dropping to me, um, but it was a couple years back. So I wish I had something more specific to say. I forgot to. I should have done a review at the time, but I didn't. Then we have Shaft, the continuation of the series, where they found a way to, to continue the Shaft movie from 20 years ago, which itself was a little bit of a continuation of the one from before that, and they tied together all the ways in which the the characters are connected and everything like that. And uh, it, this one plays very much just like a comedy, and I, I had fun with it. It made me laugh. And then I forgot it existed and I own it, I guess, but I don't know the context in which I would rewatch it. Like sometimes it's tough because like when you like movies, you go and you're like, yeah, I had fun with that. Whatever we watch it, I don't know why I would rewatch it, but I had fun watching it the one time. We have Shanghai Noon, Shanghai Nights, um, the other Jackie Chan Hollywood buddy movie that he did with this one with Owen Wilson. Both are Solid franchises. I like this one just a little bit more because I, I like Owen Wilson and the um, so just I, I thought it worked a little bit more to my taste. But both of them are really good. Chris Tucker, Chris, I would say Chris Tucker in his prime, but Chris Tucker kind of stopped working after Rush Hour. It's weird. Like he's done almost nothing, um, almost nothing in the last twenty years. I guess he did Rush Hour 3, he did Silver Lining Plenty Book, and I don't know what else he's done. But um, anyway, anyway but uh, just 
the first one at least. Uh, Shanghai Noon, I think, is really good. Shanghai Nights isn't so good. But the first one of the Rush Hour and Shanghai movies, that's the best of them for, in my mind. And that one is not as good as Rush Hour 1 or 2. So if you average that out, I guess they're tied. Oh. I'm going to have two copies of this. Um, I guess that one can go over there too. This was even unopened. I don't remember where that one came from. Uh, moving right along, we've got Shawshank Redemption, one of the great movies of all time, and a movie that kind of got forgotten when it came out. It was kind of overshadowed by a bunch of other things, and um, came out in a year where there were a bunch of, bunch of great movies. Forrest Gump wins Best Picture, and then the internet was kind of where Shawshank became the legend that it is of the internet was like you got to check this movie out and then it became the number one movie on imdb and so then what is the number what is this movie what is the movie and it was kind of the internet that in many ways played into how the film I'm, now i'm repeating myself i don't need to say that again i was about to say the exact same thing i just said shazam big as a superhero movie and zachary levi is perfect to play the part got the 4k for it and we got a sequel coming out i guess at the end of this year which is pretty fun the Shape of Water, one more Guillermo del Toro film that I have not seen, so cannot comment on, but hopefully we'll get it watched and can do that ranking. Sherlock Holmes, we got one of them. Only one Sherlock Holmes film. Sherlock Holmes, the second one. Um, and the Guy Ritchie movies that, uh, um, you know, they're 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 fine. They're, I don't think that Guy Ritchie was the right guy to adapt Sherlock Holmes. His bag of tricks doesn't necessarily work well with Sherlock Holmes. I guess it's fun to see Robert Downey Jr. as Sherlock Holmes. This is an incredibly intelligent um, uh, investigator that also knows how to fight, which it does come from the writings, but they overplayed it in a way that seemed like they were re redefining the character a bit. Short Term 12. Now, this is the first film from Destin Daniel Cretton, who did Shang-Chi last year, and then also did a couple other movies, A Lesser Just Mercy. And I've said many times before, he makes movies that are just kind of like, designs movies that kind of resonate on my emotional wavelength. So I haven't watched this one yet, but like Just Mercy, I just thought was really good. So I need to check this one out. And apparently... Brie Larson is one of his go-to people because she was in, um, she's like the star of his first three movies or had significant parts in his first three movies and then does like a little cameo in uh, Shang-Chi. But I haven't seen this one quite yet, so I need to see it to see if uh, he, if he really, that's one I think I've heard most people say that's the best one that he's done and uh, it's the one I haven't seen. Then we have the Shrek Ultimate Collection and um, as I said before in here, I didn't grow up watching the Shrek movies. I was kind of late to the party and only really watched them from beginning to end a couple years back when I did my DreamWorks ranking. And so it was kind of fun to discover this thing that everyone else had been watching for 20 years and you're finally watching for the first time. It's like, oh, I can join the conversation. I know what people are talking about now. Then we have the Sicario movies. Um, you know, the first one being a Denny Nup Villeneuve film is just a world-class thriller, just really tense from beginning to end. And... Um, I, I thought the second one was good, too. Like, I thought it, it continued things well enough. I mean, is it as good as a Denny Villeneuve film? No, but he's one of the best, so of course it's not. Not everything has to top the original, so um, it, it worked for me. Then we've got The Shining in 4K, the Stanley Kubrick, Kubrick classic adaptation of the Stephen King novel that I've said it many times before, I'm not in love with it the way that, that most people are, but a lot of that comes from the fact that it's just a little bit trippy and weirder and than, than my brain is wired to, to resonate with, but still an amazing film. Signs, the third... Uh, in the amazing run from M. Night, the third film in that run, he, it's not his third film. He did one with Rosie O'Donnell, Wide Awake, before he did The Sixth Sense. But of the movies that when you think of M. Night Shyamalan, this is the third in that run and the third of just where he just kind of like knocked it out of the park. Some people don't like the fact that like the big twist and what it is and like, that's stupid. That doesn't make any sense. They can cross the universe, but they don't know that. Well, sometimes you, you, get, you don't know things until... You don't know them until you, you get there. Like you, you don't know what you don't know. This definition of ignorance. And so it's entirely plausible that you can travel very far and not know your 
something is dangerous to you because you've never experienced it on your planet. We have Sin City, which I've never seen before. I've never seen Sin City, which is, it's, it's crazy. I've never seen Sin City, but somehow I've managed to miss that one. So um, I own it. It's been on my radar since it came out. It looks like it's very cool and I've never seen it. Then we have Sing 1 and Sing 2. Um, these get, well, this one hasn't been played all that much in my house yet. Sing One has been played a lot because it's a musical, therefore my wife really likes it. And she's been trying to get us to watch Sing Two for since we bought this, which was like two months ago. And somehow it just hasn't happened because we've been busy and I always have lists of movies we need to watch. But she literally, can we watch Sing Two tonight? What about tonight? Can we watch Sing Two? So I'm sure that will happen very soon. Then we have Sing Street. Got sent this one in my fan mail. Checked it out. Just like a nice, just feel good film. Um, watch it. Uh, I got it. This is one of the early movies that got my, my, my fan mail. So it, it's been a bit since I watched it. So I can't say specifics, but um, did check it out. And I was like, ah, that's nice. Uh, a bunch of uh, people had raved about it to me. So maybe they'd overhyped it to me. And it's a little bit different from my traditionally what I'm super into. But just um, a movie that was just a lot of fun. And, and made you feel good. Skin Trade, an uh, action movie with Tony Jaw and Dolph Lundgren that has some moments, but uh, is just totally forgettable also. It's, it's, that's a frustration of the career of Tony Jaw that he, he spent one phase of his life overthinking everything and spending way too much time staging all these incredible martial arts films. And then he was like, I'm going to go prolific and just start cranking stuff out that just doesn't have any of the, the magic of his, of his early work. Then we have Sleepy Hollow, the Tim Burton take on the Sleepy Hollow narrative, the Headless Horseman tale that I have never seen and uh, need to check out one of these days. And then uh, Snake Eyes, the G.I. Joe movie about Snake Eyes that somehow managed to get Snake Eyes totally wrong. Uh, the guy that's known for not talking and always wearing his helmet, and then in this movie, he literally doesn't put the helmet on until the last 30 seconds of the film. It's like a generic ninja movie where our lead guy is a jerk, and Snake Eyes, the G.I. Joe, is like one of the most noble of the G.I. Joes, and then this guy is totally not noble. Weird. Hollywood, how do you keep messing this stuff up? Bizarre. We have Snatch, the Guy Ritchie movie that introduced me to Guy Ritchie and, uh, um, you know, was, I, was probably came out at the perfect time for me to, like, just love it as this super cool movie with an amazing cast, ultra stylized, uh, and then it, you know, made Guy Ritchie one of my favorite directors until his next movie came out, and I was like, what happened to this guy? This guy put out two amazing little gangster films and then made this terrible movie with his wife about being lost on an island. Snowpiercer, another movie from Bong. This one's starring Chris Evans and is just a, a, a simple concept about this revolution on this train that is the where the last surviving humans are at, where it has all kinds of economic inequality type stuff about while in this big sci-fi concept. Just real cool little little film. Social Network, the David Fincher movie about the cre uh, creation of Facebook with a script from Aaron Sorkin and um, really great character, character study. Just the best of Sorkin characters and dialogue with David Fincher directing about something that on the one hand isn't on paper all that interesting, but also something we all know about Facebook that has become such an important part of culture and society. And then adding to that, a young Andrew Garfield giving an amazing performance that for, is uh, too often forgotten. Got Source Code, a kind of time loop movie about Jake Gyllenhaal trying to save this train. Train, little, Very cool little film. Just type of film movie that I, 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 I enjoy. That'll bring us to our Space Jams. Actually, got, the way it played out, because we had a Space Jam movie come out last year, I had people send me multiple copies of the original Space Jam all at the same time. I was like, oh no! Ah, that's frustrating. I, I, w I wish... We should didn't play out this way, but like it was just everyone had the same good idea. Like, oh, send him Space Jam. And so then got a bunch of copies of Space Jam all at the same time. All at the same time. So one of them is 4K Steelbooks. So that's the one that's remained in the collection. Um, but uh, it was fun to watch the Space Jam movies with my kids. And we, had the, we watched the, all of them a bunch of times. And we got the Steelbook of the new one there too. Steelbook. Yeah, it's uh, for all the reasons that. 
normal people are like, oh, Space Jam, that one wasn't very good. All the people in our world that watch YouTube videos and review things and things like that. My kids are the age to actually just love it and be like, it's like everybody in one movie. It's amazing. Like the target audience, they had a lot of fun with it. Then we have Spartacus, the Stanley Kubrick film from many years ago. Haven't checked it out yet. Need to do that. Speed, the classic action thriller from the early 90s that uh, solidified Keanu Reeves as an action leading man and then gave us Sandra Bullock and kind of propelled her to the A-list. That was the movie that really kind of changed things for her. Just a great fun um, thriller and uh, you know it has the action that you expect but then also has real zippy dialogue and that's because um, Joss Whedon script doctored it he he was like did a last minute rewrite and rewrote all the dialogue to just make it punchy and fun and so it's just one of these movies that you like the the characters are solid the dialogue is funny and then has all the thrills that you want from that type of movie that'll bring us to our spider-man movies got this gigantic collection I believe it was sent to me by some neat in my fam nail and um just the right time because i was planning to do a spider-man uh, review series which i did last year and so got 4ks of the Raimi and garfield um, films, and then we got, of course, Into the Spider Verse right there, and we talked about the MCU films in the M section. We got the Spider Wet Chronicles. I uh, haven't watched these ones yet. Got to sent this one in my my uh, fan mail. I've never read the books. Don't know anything about the material. They have no no knowledge of it at all to be able to say anything. Then we have Spirited Away. This is the Studio Ghibli film that I have seen. My buddy Andy came over and watched it with me a few years back. He goes, oh man, this movie's so good. It's got so many metaphors. There's so much to it and it's about so many different things. I can't wait to talk with you about it. And we watched it and I was like, dude, this movie is not on my wavelength. I do not know how to process what I just saw. I don't know how to talk about it. That movie is above my pay grade. I, I can watch it and be like, wow, I can see why other people love that. I am just confused by it. So I, I I literally, I wish I could, I had more something insightful to deep dive into it and have the discussion that you guys want me to have about it. It's just not how I'm wired. Split the secret spinoff to Unbreakable. Not so secret anymore because I just told you about it, but movie I went into like having heard some good things about like, M. Night Shyamalan's back. It's another good one wait for it. And I was like, what am I waiting for? I don't know what I'm waiting for. And then it happened at the end. I was like, they're doing this. I've been waiting for this movie for 20 years. Yeah. That was a good day. We got Spy, the... Spy, the Paul Feig um, spy movie with Melissa McCarthy, Rose Byrne, Jude Law, and Jason Statham doing an amazing version of his he's play, making fun of himself as just like this version this action tough guy that's just a moron and it's it's amazing i love the movie spy um just i i, I know paul fee gets a bad rap because of his ghostbusters movie but he's really done some great work outside of that stand by me another one i almost watched a couple weeks back when i was working on that Stephen King top 10 I was talking about pulled this one off the shelves and everything to watch it and didn't watch it I've never seen it and it's one of those ones I know I should have seen it by now I've owned it for years and haven't watched it and we are so close so close it literally almost happened two weeks ago then A Star is Born one of my favorite movies from a few years back and I had never seen the original version so to me I was just watching a fresh story that I was new that was new for me at least and um, it was uh, just so emotional. It had such a broad spectrum of human emotions from love, success, failure, tragedy, all of it, while having some amazing songs and touching on some themes that are very personal and powerful for me. Then we got a big, gigant, uh, gigantic stack of Star Trek movies. So first one up is we've got a the... Uh, Blu-rays for Star Trek 1 through 6, that's the original cast Star Trek movies. So 1 through 6 right there in kind of a, um efficiency pack. And then a standalone one for the director's cut of Star Trek 2 The Wrath of Khan, my favorite Star Trek movie and one of my favorite movies of all time. Then we have a the 
Star Trek Next Generation films that take you know, take uh, that continue on after the original cast films in this fun package right here, less efficient in size. Then we have several movies right here where I think I can remove these three. So we've got the Kelvin timeline, that's the Chris Pine movies, the J.J. Abram universe, in 4K right there. So I can put this one right here, and I can retire my Blu-rays to the couch over there. Whew. But, um, yeah, so those are my Star Trek movies, and that brings us to the Star Wars films. So first up, my collection of the original saga and the prequels. And I actually bought this. Uh, whenever they announced the Disney acquisition that more movies were coming, I literally went immediately to Best Buy and bought uh, this this one right here, the, the collection that they had for it. So um, in, over the last 10 years, having kids and dogs and everything in the packaging has kind of gotten all chewed up and destroyed, but still a, a pretty cool little one. Then in here, we've got the Star Wars Clone Wars movie that is barely a movie. It's literally four episodes of the TV show edited together. And it's not what a movie is. That's editing together four episodes of the TV show. Not cool. Then our... We got Blu-ray for The Force Awakens, and it got this fun op book opening packaging for it. We got that version of it. Then our Last Jedi. I do not like these Disney packagings where they do just this very generic multi-screen edition. I do not like the multi-screen edition packaging for any of them. And then I have 4K for Rise of Skywalker. And then in here we've got the multi-screen edition for Rouge One and Solo. And then final one in there, the Star Wars Lego, the Padawan Menace. Just wanted a random Star Wars Lego movie that they put out direct to video. <sighs> then Storks, a movie I've never seen. I'm, yeah, haven't seen it, can't comment on it. Step Brothers, one of the Adam McKay, Will Ferrell team ups, one of my favorites of the bunch. Just so quotable, so much fun. Um, I think Talladega Nights is my favorite, but that would be my second favorite of the bunch. Then straight out of Compton, the uh, what was it NWA, the story, the real story of them, their backstory, where they got um, was it Ice Cube's actual son? Was it Ice Cube? Ice Ice Cube, yeah, Ice Cube's real son to play him. It's fun, fun times when you have a, a guy whose his son looks so much like him that you can cast him in the movie and it actually works um, and pull it off. So that one came out uh, a few years back. Um, man, I think my, my energy level has dramatically dropped during this last little section here. It's now 10 o'clock at night, so we are 10 hours since I started filming. Got Street Fighter, the movie. Now, I was one of the people that actually went to go see this opening weekend when it came out. And I had fun with it. It's campy. It's goofy. It's not good. But I think it has more charm to it than people give it credit for. Stuber. The uh, uh, Kumal Nanjiani, Dave Bautista, uh, buddy cop movie that I get a kick out of. It It's... Dave Batista, I think it, obviously Kumal Nanjiani's a comedian, so he's a funny guy. But Dave Batista is much funnier than um, you, you immediately think he would be, and and plays it so well and can do physical comedy as well as deliver lines in a comedic way. Uh, Stronger, haven't seen this one quite yet, so I can't comment on it. Uh, the string, we got a couple of these. The Strangers, also a couple movies I haven't seen yet. Um, so one of these days, we'll, I'll watch The Strangers, and I can comment on them, but I don't even know the basic premise of them. I do think it, I imagine, involves some people that are strangers to other people making the appearance. Then we have Sucker Punch, the Zack Snyder original movie that basically just feels like him recalling a dream. <laughs> it's just, he had a dream, and he went, let me make a movie out of that. Even as a film, it's like a dream within a dream in a loony bin. It's like three layers. It's like Inception, except not good or coherent. Um, and it's a bunch of amazing imagery that can cut into a very cool trailer and makes for a story that is unbelievably unsatisfying. Then we got 
a steelbook for the amazing Suicide Squad, the extended cut, not the air cut, because don't know if we'll ever get that, but it is an extended cut in glorious steelbook fashion. But we do get James Gunn's The Suicide Squad, a much better Suicide Squad movie that nicely combines comic book movie with 70s war film, 60s war film, like the Dirty Dozen, those types of films, and just makes for a, a truly James Gunn experience where rated R is a territory where he shines in dark, cynical stuff. So great combination. Speaking of James Gunn, dark, cynical superhero movies, super, which is super dark, super James Gunn. And it's hilarious that he made this movie and Disney went, let's hire that guy to do one of our movies. If you've seen it, woo! It is it is brutal. It is a the dark, sick mind of James Gunn. That some like that guy's been working for Mickey Mouse for 10 years now, and he got the job because of this film. If you haven't seen it, I can't say I recommend it to you, especially if you're not 18. Um, but wow, it is it is something. Then we have Super 8, the time that J.J. Abrams beat Stranger Things to Stranger Things. It is... Oh, I'm about to sneeze. <coughs> Woo! Woo! The, nit, the itchy nose is catching up with me. My nose is just starting to run now. My body is collapsing in on me. Super 8, basically, J.J. Uh, uh, Abrams is just a little bit too early to the party doing that, let's do the 80s emblem films, like a revival of them, in the same way that it did that, same way that Stranger Things did that. But just four years before that, we got Super 8, that if you like Stranger Things, if you like it, and that, that type of movie with you know, tween kids that actually act like tween kids and riff on each other and are a little bit crass, check this one out. Um, it's J.J. Abrams' version of that kind of thing. Then we have Super Bad, uh, one of the Get to the Party classic movies. I, I've said it many times before, I'm not a fan of the Get to the Party and Get Drunk, uh, uh, Do Drugs and Girls, that genre. I'm not a fan of it. Uh, didn't It's not what my high school years were like at all. And as someone that worked with teenagers, that's not necessarily the sort of thing that I want to celebrate in teenagers. But um, nonetheless, that's a really funny movie. Then we have this amazing Superman metal tin collection for the um, uh, Blu-rays. And um, I, I bought the DVD version of this and then I upgraded to the Blu-ray version. Actually, no, never mind. This is the DVD version of it. I was about to say it's the Blu-ray version. It's not. How, I'm not kind of crazy more I am. I am. I need to update this thing. This, at the time, before the invention of Blu-rays, was the definitive collection of Superman movies that you could get that ha went through um, Superman Returns and just has an amazing set of special features with all, like, for Superman the movie, there's three different cuts of the film. Like, three literally different, different cuts of the movie, <laughs> plus a disc full of just special features about it. A separate two different discs for uh, Superman 2 for two totally different cuts of the movie. And then there's a disc with it's like four hours of special features, including an amazing behind the scenes making of the 80s Christopher Reeve Superman movies, plus a thousand special features about Superman Returns. This is an amazing set right here. It doesn't belong in this video because this is about Blu rays, but I couldn't leave this one out because this is my collection of. Uh, uh, super movies, but this has reminded me that I apparently need to look up buying the Blu-ray version of this and see if that's a thing that even exists, because if it does, I need it right now. We have Sushi Girl, a movie I received in my fan mail uh, that has an amazing cat, or has a it has Mark Hamill and Tony Todd in it. So some familiar faces. F uh, interesting uh, title for it. Uh, I, I don't know what it is, though. I, I don't know what it is. Sometimes I get ones in family of movies I haven't heard of. Like, what, Tony Todd, Mark Hamill, Sushi Girl? What on earth am I looking at? What is this film? And it makes me curious, but um, I haven't been able to check that one out yet. But Sweet Home Alabama. Fun fact about this one. Whenever my wife and I first got married... We lived in an apartment in not the best part of town. It's kind of scary. And so to make my wife feel comfortable... She would put this movie on. It's kind of her comfort movie to go to bed every night for a year straight. And then we went out of town for a weekend, a week before our one-year anniversary, and we got robbed. Apparently, she actually wasn't just paranoia. It wasn't just her being overly nervous. We actually did live in a terrible neighborhood where, where uh, if we'd known better, we wouldn't have lived there, but got robbed. And we have the sword in the stone. Oh, and just, uh, this is a fun little 
Reese Witherspoon rom-com. I always enjoy it, too. But uh, then we got Sword in the Stone, a uh, movie I had... It seems like it should be so much better than it is because it's about King Arthur. And then it turns out, too, when you actually watch it, it's like he's learning a bunch of lessons. And then he he turns into a fish and learns a lesson. And then he goes outside and learns a lesson. And then in the last five minutes, he picks up the sword. Really? That's what you did with King Arthur? Of all the things to do with King Arthur, that's what you chose? Why? I don't, I don't understand. But that's what it was. And it's tea time with the teas. Probably could have guessed that. And that'll give us all of these Taken movies. And I think we can pull some of these out of rotation here because we got this Taken collection right here where we have the version... Well, this is tricky. This is tricky because it doesn't look like this has the extended cut for it. So looks like we got to keep the original one in there. And then this is unrated. We got to keep Taken 3 in there. So I guess we can pull Taken 2 out, however. But yeah, Taken movies. The original one. Great little, uh, great little Liam Neeson pivot for his career that uh, has histories with Luke Besson, the guy that did The Professional, just coming up with these concepts for these simple um, action thrillers that just have a nice hook. And that epic speech in the trailer got people to show up, and then he never stopped making Taken movies. <sighs> Taxi Driver, another Martin Scorsese film. I actually watched this one a couple of years back, just when... Um, Joker came out and was in the mood to see the movies that influenced so watched uh, Taxi Driver again. But, uh, yeah, just, uh, 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 I think I've reached the point where I have nothing insightful to say anymore. I just, I've lost all ability to say meaningful things. But Taxi Driver, a classic Scorsese film that just kind of had this certain just cynical worldview to it that was uh, kind of kind of special. Then we got some Teenage Mutant Min 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 movies. The uh, uh, first two Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movies were like a huge part of my childhood. Watched both of those ones on loop. And I think this one, the original one, still holds up great. The second one, much cornier. Not as good of a movie, but I still think it's a lot of fun. And the third one wasn't even good when I was a child. I even saw that one as a kid and went, Nah, oh, this ain't it right here. This is not how you do it. Then we got the second movie in the CGI Turtles franchise that were not directed by Michael Bay, but he did produce them. And that's a real weird misfire of a film. Like, a movie that feels like it should be much better than it actually is. Feels like it should be more fun than it actually is. And something just went terribly wrong in the whole process where, like, you have Stephen Amell as Casey Jones. Great casting. You got Bebop and Rocksteady in there. That's a nice touches. And then the story just doesn't kind of come together the way you would think that it, it would. Yeah, Teen Titans Go to the Movies, a movie I should hate, but it's actually kind of a lot of fun. Like, just so irreverent, so stupid, so chaotic, but like a fun version of all of that. So a, a movie that uh, I assumed I was going to hate, and I was like, I actually kind of dig this. This kind of works. Tenet, Christopher Nolan's last film, and the movie that was supposed to save cinema from COVID, and, you know, didn't quite save cinemas from COVID, but... Um, and it wasn't one of Christopher Nolan's better films, but, uh, you know, I always appreciate the ambition. There's a bunch of things that I like about it, a bunch of things that are really clever and fun. And then there's a bunch of stuff that's really odd, that the movie's just confusing. Like, on one hand, it's like just about a guy tracking clues and going to different locations. But even still, you're watching like, why are we going here? Who are we looking for? What's supposed to happen? And then you get to the third act and... It's literally one timeline going forward, one timeline going backward, and two different groups trying to do two different things in the same settings, in time going in two different directions. And I, you know, I've seen the movie two, three times now and still don't quite have any idea what's going on. I'm specifically watching, like, all right, let me try and figure this out this time. And it was unsuccessful. All right, it's a little bit tricky on this one as to which ones we hold on to because we got... Terminator Anthology. So we've got all the movies through Salvation in here in Blu-ray form. Simple enough. But Terminator 2, favorite movie of all time. Got the 4K. Got to have that one in there. And one of the frustrating things with this particular franchise is that you have 
so many releases of the Terminator and Terminator 2 that all have different special features and different deleted scenes, and that is frustrating when they do that. Okay, I don't know. Do we got? Do we have the director's cut? Okay, we do. We do have the director's cut in our anthology, so we can pull out one of our, our movies here. Whoa, whoa. Somebody's hitting the tripod. I haven't touched the tripod all this time. and finally start hitting it. Then we got Terminator Jenny Smith right there. Simple enough. Terminator Dark Fate. I actually like this one. Uh, it made a bunch of people mad. I get it because of my own feelings about Alien 3. I don't think it's the same thing, but I know why it could be for other people. I, I do get it, but um, I, 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 with my full understanding of why, I, how I interpret that movie in the Terminator mythology, I, I really enjoyed it, as its fault, but I, I mostly really enjoyed it. Uh, and I got to interview the, the new Terminator when he was in town for this movie, did the press junk and everything. That was pretty cool. Um, my only press junket I've done and embarrassed myself horribly, but it's still a, a nice memory to have. Okie dokie. So now we've got my collection of Texas Chainsaw Massacre films. These are sent to me by uh, some neat, and I'd never seen any of them before. I live in Central Texas. I live right where a bunch of these movies were shot. The original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, they're driving down this road 685 at the beginning of the film, like you can see it on the street size, it's 685. That's the road at the front of my neighborhood. Like it runs all across the these eastern suburbs of Austin. And all of this has been built out over the last 50 years. None of this was developed. It was just farmland. And so it's the front of my neighborhood. And then the place where they pick up the hitchhiker based off some people trying to do intense like studies of the where to... It's the the road in front of the high school. It's literally almost the exact same shot. That's one of the shots in the opening of the credits for uh, Friday Night Lights, the TV show, and it's right over there. You can hear the high school football games on Friday nights. That's how close it is to my house, and right in front of it is where they picked up the hitchhiker. And so they filmed them all right here. I'd never seen them before. And so that was real fun when the, the new movie came out in February. I watched all the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies and a bunch of the special features. And then I actually went out to a bunch of the shooting locations and I did a little vlog about it. And that was, that was really... I actually shot a bunch of my footage for the ranking on location where they shot the movies. That was cool. That was that was really cool. That was... Uh, this was fun. It was like... Um, it's just something about going to being a part of a shooting location and incorporating into your review and everything. But um, got a bunch of different um, versions of these. Most of them actually had some pretty cool special features. A lot of these Scream Factory ones. It's just a nice little deep dive for a franchise that you know is brand new for for me. Most people have been watching for a long time. I'm trying to get these in order. Where, where are we at here? Oh, and the one with Jessica Biel. That one was shot ten minutes that way. All these shooting locations, the, the house that was also in the beginning for the, the family, that one's about 20 minutes out that way. Just, it was so cool to be able to, to visit all the shooting locations like that. Um, and then th this one, 3D, Texas Chainsaw 3D, wasn't shot in Texas. They lied to us. And this one wasn't even shot in the United States. <sighs> well, moving right along, we've got There Will Be Blood. Ever seen it? One of those movies that uh, got all sorts of prestige people talking about it. I've seen the milkshake scene, but I haven't seen the movie. Oh, this is a fun one. Uh, they live in 4K. Got this one in my uh, fan mail, and uh, haven't haven't been able to rewatch this one yet. But uh, they live is a classic John Carpenter 80s film, and I, I watched it. Uh, I played this uh, video game Duke Nukem 3D in the late 90s. It came out at the same time as Quake, and Quake was the follow-up to Doom, and Doom was like this pivotal game, and then Quake was the more advanced game, Duke Nukem 3D was the more fun one, because it was filled with movie quotes, and it kicked off with a variation of the famous quote about chewing bubblegum from this movie. And we got uh, The Thing, another John Carpenter film right there. Classic, classic sci-fi horror film. that I hadn't, I hadn't watched it in 20 years, and then watched it again for my... Uh, 31 on 31 on Creature Features and rewatch. I was like, man, this movie is so good. I missed it whenever I watched it 20 years ago when I was first doing my, my James John, or James Carpenter, John Carpenter watch through and it was such a good film. And then we had the um, uh, revival uh, or um, prequel 
prequel. I was trying to think how to prequel reboot all requel something like that it's a whatever it is but they, they brought it back and kind of remade it but it's actually a prequel to the original one and works pretty well as that but they did cgi creatures they actually had good physical ones and then decided to cover the f creatures they've designed with cgi it was just such a weird choice this means war um little spy rom-com from mick g with uh like a tom hardy chris pine and reese witherspoon in uh, not as good as it probably should be, but I still get a, get a bit of a kick out of it. Um, works relies entirely on the star power. That's the only reason the movie works, because you have a bunch of fun people to watch in movies. Those Who Wish Me Dead. So this is a movie... Uh, uh, I'm blanking on his name because my brain's obviously fried. Uh, screenwriter Sicario and... Uh, um, uh, to Hell or High Water. So this guy that's written these really good kind of thrillers, and then he did this one, and it's just like a totally generic movie about fires breaking out and the firefighters trying to work while criminals are trying to track someone down and um, felt like many, many other movies before, and it's a movie just so oddly structured that Angelina Jolie gets struck by lightning, I think, twice in the movie. It's like, that What? That's not a good idea. Three Kings, another David O. Russell film. I haven't seen this one yet. So one of those ones that people have been talking about for over 20 years and haven't caught it yet. Till Death. This is a Megan Fox uh, kind of home invasion-esque thriller where she wakes up and she's handcuffed to the corpse of her dead husband and she has to survive. I thought it was really good. Now, I'm a sucker for home, in, home invasion kind of like closed environment, try to survive films. I just thought it was just really well done of just take this concept and you're like, what would you do? And you're like, we'd well, have to do this. And then, what? well, you think, why wouldn't she just do this? And then she goes to do that exact thing and you realize why she can't do it. Like the person that put her in the scenario thought through all the things that you thought through and then made it so you couldn't do that. And right as you're about to get bored with, okay, she's dragging around a dead body. Then the next thing happens that turns it upside down. So now she has to do this other stuff and just properly paced doesn't overstay its welcome and just thinks through all the things you're thinking like why doesn't she what what if that that happened then we have disney's tinkerbell i've never seen it but my daughter's watched it a few times and you know makes a lot of sense my daughter would like a tinkerbell movie and uh probably good that i'm not sitting around watching tinkerbell movies on my own and we got titanic james cameron's first movie that became the highest grossing film of all time and uh uh, uh Hopefully I'll be doing a James Cameron review series later on this year when uh, Titan uh, pfft, when Avatar 2, Titanic, was his first movie to become highest grossing. Avatar was his second, and Avatar's getting a sequel because if you do a sequel to Titanic, that's a stupid idea because Titanic actually happened. But uh, my wife was one of the people that made this one of the highest grossing movies of all time, going to go see it one bazillion times. Then we have Tolkien, the movie about the life of Tolkien. I haven't checked it out quite yet and didn't see it when it came out in theaters, even though it was during the history of my channel. But uh, I think it came out in May, and May's like kind of a busy time. Actually, what is it, 2018? If it was 2018, 2019, was it, it might have come out right in the... Uh, yeah, 2019, it came out in Endgame Month. I also went to a Comic-Con, spoke at my first Comic-Con, so a bunch of stuff happened that month. Then Tom and Jerry the movie, um, I've got kids, and so we went to go see it in the theater, and it was one of those same-day release on HBO. We went to see it. I went upstairs to record my review, and my kids watched it a second time in a row. I know a bunch of my movie reviewer friends watched it, and people in the comments section, this movie is stupid, how did this come out? But the actual children that this movie was made for, they, they ate it up. Take that as you will. Doesn't make up for the fact that it's weird that the movie focuses in on the human characters, not Tom and Jerry, and but it, it is what it is. Then we have our Tomb Raider collection, the Angelina Jolie ones that I actually, I didn't watch them back in the day when they came out, just kind of skipped them. And then we have the sec new one that came out just a few years back that I enjoyed well enough. I mean, it's not great, but it's a, I think it captures a lot of the aesthetics of the game pretty well. And so um, 
you know, it gets a little silly and get, when you get into the conclusion. But before I, before that, I think it worked. But one of the fun things about the the old Angelina Jolie ones is the first one has Daniel Craig in it, and the second one has Jerry Butler in it, Gerard Butler in it. So it's just fun to see these guys that have gone on to be these big movie action stars play side roles in an Angelina Jolie vehicle. Then we have Tomorrowland, the movie that Brad Bird directed instead of doing Force Awakens. He was my pick to do Force Awakens, and maybe if that's the world we lived in where he did Force Awakens instead of Tomorrowland, maybe the sequels would have turned out better. We got this movie that had its moments, but uh, overall, um, after how good Ghost Protocol was, was pretty underwhelming. Then we got Top Gun! In 4K, and I, I watched this one the other day to do a review for it that I was going to film yesterday and then didn't because I spent hours and hours filming stuff to get videos done before I leave town on Thursday. Not quite midnight yet, so not tomorrow yet, but leave town Thursday. And then I put in my 4K for this one, and the 4K made a loud humming noise on my PlayStation 5. And so I had to use just the Blu-ray. <sighs> Can you believe that? I had to use the Blu-ray, and my vision isn't good enough for me able to tell the difference between 4K and Blu-ray, but I was deeply offended. So I have the 4K, but my actual disc for the 4K made a humming noise on my, my machine. But anyway, I, this is one of the first movies I remember watching with my family and uh, whenever the um, love scene rolls around. Whenever Take My Breath Away started playing, my parents would kick me out of the room because we hadn't had the talk yet. I'm like, what's going on? What's happening here? Why are you kicking me out of the room? And then I grew up and got older. And I was like, I understand now what was happening. I know what my parents were up to. Then we have Total Recall. Uh, classic Schwarzenegger, Bear Hoban team up, ad adapting a Philip K. Dick uh, short story. And um, as I said before, when we were talking about Minority Report. He just takes these ideas of like, what if you could implant memories into someone's brain? And then if you could do that, how would you know which ones were real, which ones were false? And what if you replaced your identity? Just a great little sci-fi concept combined with the wild style of Paul Verhoeven, Schwarzenegger in his prime. And you just get a great sci-fi action movie that just sticks with you. And one that I'll be re-watching in the near future for a project we got planned for August. Then we have The Town in Steelbook. One of the Ben Affleck directed films. Haven't seen it yet. I, I, wanted, I saw the trailer. I mean, I want to watch that. And then 12 years have gone by and I haven't caught it yet. But like just everything about it. Uh, like heist movie. Ben Affleck with his directing career. Jeremy Renner. Blake Lively. All positives hasn't happened yet. Then we have a three-peat of these Toy Story 4K steelbooks. So Toy Story 1, Toy Story 2, Toy Story 3. Just an amazing franchise. I, I get in trouble all the time because in my rankings I have Toy Story 2 as the worst of the bunch. And in my mind, it's like the worst of the bunch is still an A. Whatever year, when it came out, 99, best animated film of that year. I mean, just top-notch franchise where all of them were the best animated film of the year they came out. I mean, maybe not. I haven't double-checked that. Fact-checked myself on that. But that's the worst one in my mind. Now, other, that, the other people, they get mad because they're low. They actually think, like, 4 is a bad film. And so they're, like, offended because, what, how dare you? The fourth one is garbage, and you have this one below that. You think it's garbage? Like, no. I think that all of them are A's. So... It's the lowest of the A's. But man, what a franchise. What a franchise. Then we got some Transformers movies, the original one. This is the one everyone's like, oh, the first one's really good, and it goes downhill from there. I, I was never like as into the first one as other people. I had fun with it. I like watching robots blow stuff up, too, of course. And I think that uh, uh, Shia LaBeouf, you kind of forget because he's had so many controversies over the last 10 years or so, but... He's, he's really good at playing a, kind of a naturalistic performance in these outrageous situations. He just kind of feels a little bit more like a person you know than most people in movies like that. We have Revenge of the Fallen, where people think it's garbage. And I, I didn't 
I didn't pick up on that when I first watched it, maybe because I just I didn't think all that much of the first movie. It was like, yeah, it's a fun robot movie. Uh, then in retrospect, when you kind of stop and think about some of it, like, some of this movie doesn't make any sense. This movie is very dumb. Oh, maybe I should have paid more attention to some of that earlier on. But uh, uh, they had a issue with a writer's strike with that one where they ran out of time when they were writing the script. So it was literally legitimately a movie that wasn't finished. Then we have the original Transporter, just a, a solid little simple action thriller. One of those Luke Besson premises where he worked on the story for it and someone else directed it. But the movie that transitioned Jason Statham into a solid action leading man where he's been for the last 20 years. Then we have the Tremors pack, the first four movies. And this is a real fun franchise. And the first Tremors is just a great monster movie. It's just great. A uh, great little creature feature. Um, like, it's a B-movie, but B-movie doesn't mean bad movie. It's just, it's a silly little movie, but a really well-crafted one where they just start, like, just set things up properly, like little, a, a malfunctioning device at a, at a gas station is very important for 30 minutes later in the movie, but they give you enough time on the malfunctioning piece of technology that you remember later on. And then there's, like, a, a bazillion uh, direct-to-video sequels to it. And, uh, like, the second one's actually pretty good. And some of them are, are stupid, but they're fun stupid. Like, it's just a movie, a franchise where even the, the stupid ones are fun. And we got The Train to Busan, a, uh, I believe, Korean zombie film that I haven't seen yet. But I have The Steel Book. Desperately, that's one of those ones I've almost watched so many times, but haven't yet. Then Twister, the tornado movie starring Bill Paxton that is takes this actually kind of terrifying thing, the idea of tornadoes tearing up a city or a state and makes it into a fun roller coaster ride blockbuster. Um, that's uh, magic of cinema that can turn something that's not fun at all into something very fun. Rewatched it, what, a year or two back. I don't remember if it was for the 25th anniversary. I don't remember what the reason was. I was like, I gotta watch Twister. And it's like, man, that movie's a lot of fun. Time for the use. We've got Uncut Gems. Well, the latest attempt by Adam Sandler to turn serious, and uh, it worked. Uh, that's the thing that's so fascinating about his career is when he goes serious, he's actually really good. He's a multi-talented performer, but he makes so much money doing cheap, lazy comedies where he gets to hang out with his buddies that it seems like that's what he's decided to spend most of his time doing. And I think with the success and praise he got for this one, it kind of pushed him to, to bit, spend a bit more time to do serious stuff. So he's got a sports movie coming out next month that I'm excited to check out. And he's working with the guys that directed uh, worked on this one before, too. But there's something interesting about him. Like, this guy's been wildly popular, successful for over 20 years now. Uh, you know, been in the, the mainstream for 30 years. And... You still people still root for him, even though you know he's been making all these lazy comedies that people trash. But as soon as he like tries something that's good, people are like, man, I hope he gets an Oscar nomination. Everyone roots for the guy because it seems like he's a legitimately nice guy. So you can be like, dude, make better choices. And then when he does, you're like, yes, yes, is this gonna be your day? Hope you win. Which is kind of fun to see. There's some videos that came out of him uh, from a year or two ago where he's like. A, Went to went to an IHOP and they had a waiting list and he he like walked up and was like hey can I get a waiting list and the person didn't recognize him and so then he ended up leaving because there was a line he's like all right well I just gotta go you know a little bit of hurry no worries gotta go and then afterwards someone was like did you know this Adam Sandler and then they they posted the footage and they're like yeah he was so nice and kind and he didn't do anything to like use his celebrity to try and get any privileges he just is like oh there's a wait well I I'm I'm in a bit of a hurry I guess I'll just go somewhere else but uh. Maybe next time. That, this is a fun story. Anyway, spending too much time on my use. We're we're like spent two two minutes talking about one movie, and we're at that point in time where I just need to finish this video because I am dying on the inside. This is cool. This is a fun one. I I can't say I'm like the biggest fan of the Underworld franchise, but Sony sent me the collector's ultimate collector's edition 4K release for the, the series. And my wife really likes them because she's into vampires and werewolves and things like that. And so then um, being Kate Beckinsale in the lead, she's got a little bit of a cross on Kate Beckinsale, throw it all together, and it's like a whole bunch of things that's right up her alley. And so they sent me the, the 4K collection in this collector set. It's just really, 
really cool. Um, nice packaging. Some of the perks of this whole talking movies for a living. It's sometimes they just send you movies for free in cool boxes. So that's what this one is right here. And if you like the Underworld series, that is the that is the the version to get. We got up one of the Pixar classics. One of these ones also, I always have like tw number 10, 12 on my Pixar rank. And people are, how dare you? That movie's great. I know, but it's Pixar. They've got way too many great movies. It makes it tough. The first 10 minutes of it, though, are, are just a master class in visual storytelling. Not needing to say anything and communicating everything that you need to know. Then we got Unstoppable. This is just a cool little Tony Scott thriller about a train <coughs> that is running out of control that they have to stop. And you got Denzel Washington and Chris Pine right in early in his career. Just a real good little film. And a blockbuster previously viewed movie. <laughs> Poor blockbuster. Upgrade. This is a great little Lee Winnell sci-fi thriller that came out the same year as Venom and did a lot of the stuff Venom was doing better. It's just a much smarter script and a movie where as you're watching it, I kept thinking, oh, is this where they're going? And then right as you're like, mm, that was awfully predictable. And, and it, you were supposed to think that and it throws you a curveball and it does a sec a twist on top of the twist. You're like, oh, oh. And just Lee Winnell is just on a, a hot streak of just writing really good movies. And so if you haven't seen Upgrade, check out Upgrade. Then we have us Jordan Peele's second movie. And when it was a home invasion film, I thought it was really well directed, tense and entertaining. And when it tried to go into whatever its final twist reveals were explaining who these copies were and <clears throat> whatever its message was, I thought it went off the rails. And um, it traded in all narrative credibility to try and communicate something. And it, just, it was just nonsense. Like, there's just no logic to, like, what takes place in the movie. Like, you, what? There's, What? Where did all these outfits come from? And who was feeding? How did nobody know about? There's no one guarding it. It's just, what? Huh? I, I just, it didn't at all, at all work for me. And, it just, and we've got our Vs. Not very many of them, but we do have our Vs. And most of them are titled Venom. But one of them is not. Varsity Blues, a movie that, if you've seen Friday Night Lights, is actually the same plot as Friday Night Lights, uh, except this came out first. And um, it's the, I don't know when the book for Friday Night Lights came out, so maybe the, this one was like inspired by that, but um, came out when I was in high school, so it's a high school football movie. I live in Texas, grew up in Texas, it takes place in Texas, and in fact, it was shot right around where I live, and so some people I know were extras in some of the football scenes in it. Even just a couple days ago, my wife was talking about when this was being shot, her and her friend, some of her friends went to go be extras in it, but she had something going on that day, so she couldn't go go and do it. So, um, but um, because it's so much a part of uh, where I live. Anyway, Friday, we're actually Friday night. We're, we're living. Man, you can tell my brain's losing it because I cannot hold a train of thought. Anyway, same basic premise as Friday Night Lights came out a few years before, but. This is the MTV version of it. It actually was a MTV produced film. And so it's just like this rock and sock em, uh, version of it without like all the mel without the drama, without the, the tension. It's just like same basic plot, uh, but like the dumb version of it. But dumb doesn't mean bad. Dumb normally or sometimes means a lot of fun. So I'm, I've always enjoyed that one. Then we've got a couple of Venom movies. First Venom, Venom Let There Be Carnage. And uh, my oddly enough, my wife really likes the Venom movies. I didn't even realize that until Let the, uh, Let, the, uh, Let There Be Carnage was about to come out. And I watched Venom without her, and she's like, why'd you watch it without me? I like that one. I was like, really? That, of all the ones for you to be like, I like that one. Venom? Where did that come from? Now, my kids love Venom. I don't know. I don't know if that's a thing that kids always have liked Venom, but um, they're very fond of the idea of this alien symbiote version of Spider-Man. So they're big fans of them. So they've seen those movies too. And uh, so Venom is a big part of our household. 
Then we got our W's, our last letter where there's a stack of movies, but uh, should move pretty quickly. We got Walk the Line, the James Mangold film. Haven't checked it out yet. I meant to check it out. I meant to do a James Mangold ranking and everything with Ford versus Ferrari, but came out during a busy month that didn't happen, so I haven't seen the movie yet. Then we have Warcraft, the movie based off the video game Warcraft, or the video game series Warcraft, uh, probably not based off the original game. I played a ton of Warcraft 2 back in the day, and that's that's my, one, one of the games I've played the most in my life was actually Warcraft 2 back in the late 90s, I got pretty good at it. The movie itself um, had some things about it that are pretty good, but in other senses it just was trying to do way, way too much, and went too CGI for something that probably would have been better to just put suits on people and so it just felt like you're looking at fake stuff all the time then we have Watchmen the director's cut and uh, classic Zack Snyder fashion the movie that they put out was the shortened version of it in fact there's a longer version and then there's an ultimate edition where it's not just deleted scenes but they also take the comic strip about the pirate and plunk it back into the movie. If you don't know what I'm referring to, in the graphic novel Watchmen, there's this whole graphic, uh, there's all this comic about a pirate that's intercut throughout everything that thematically ties into things and sets some tone. And then they made an animated version of that, and then you cut that in the ultimate edition. So there's three different versions of Watchmen, and so right there I've got the director's cut of it, and uh, it's it's because the movie's so long, it's tough to watch them like back to back to compare them because even the short one's two and a half hours long and then this one's three hours long and then the ultimate is like three and a half hours long so it's a lot of that the way back um the latest sports movie from gavin o'connor the director of warrior which we're about to get to and this one from ben affleck in his post alcohol recovery phase of life and it's about a person going through recovery so a movie is very personal of like a guy that had a lot of struggles trying to work through it and telling telling a using a story to, to go on that journey and as someone that has gone through alcohol recovery myself, it kind of really hit close to home on a lot of those levels. So a director that I love tackling thematically rich material with a, a, maybe the best performance that uh, Ben Affleck has ever given. I need I, I didn't watch it with my wife. It was, I had to go. I don't remember what the context was. I don't know why she couldn't go with me. Um, I don't think she wanted to go. I think it was because too personal. She wanted to see how I responded to it. She wanted me to just respond on my own because sometimes I can get real emotional about things like that. But we haven't watched it together yet, so I need to do that. I need to make that list of things I need to watch. Wally, -E, another Pixar classic. And this one has some amazing visual storytelling for the whole first 45 minutes of it because you just have Wally -E who just talks through like that. And then Evie, who also doesn't really speak. So there's almost no dialogue the first 45 minutes, but you have this cute little romance and you understand what's going on. So amazing storytelling. But that'll bring us to Warrior, my go-to movie that I recommend to people. One of the most under-watched movies, but everyone that I know that watched it has liked it. Most people I know that watch it have loved it. So uh, and I, when I put it in my top 20 favorite movies of all time, top movies of the decade, videos a couple years back I had a little stretch of time where for about two three months straight every day every single day I had someone message me saying I watched Warrior because you recommended it and you were right that movie was great every single day for about three months and I still get those messages but not every day anymore and that was pretty cool that's you know normally I talk about Marvel movies that movies that everyone has seen everyone knows about that's fun but there's something special about introducing someone to something they wouldn't have known about otherwise. And that's what hopefully I can do with the movie Warrior that it's just a fantastic sports movie that does what all sports movies are supposed to do, which is actually be about the human experience. And so it's really about a family drama that the sports are almost a, a metaphor inside the film for what's going on inside the characters and inside this family. And But on a sports level, the last hour is just nonstop payoff. Just tremendous achievement then war of the worlds the steven spielberg adaptation of the war of the world starring tom cruise i've only seen it once i only saw it in the theater this one time so this movie i desperately need to rewatch and see how it fits it, it didn't didn't uh, leave much of a mark when i first watched it in the theater and i don't know if i just watched it on the wrong day or if it was a movie that just maybe isn't wired for the way that i'm wired but it just seems like sci-fi spielberg tom cruise why wouldn't I love that movie? But it just didn't, didn't, I don't know, whatever reason, it didn't uh, click with me. Wedding Crashers, the big smash comedy from about 
now almost 20 years ago. Man, that's wild. The time flies by. But uh, another breakthrough performance from Rachel with Mac- McAdams. Like, this movie to me feels like it just came out. And it literally came out almost 20 years ago. That's when you know you start getting older, when you're like, oh, wow, that was a long time ago. Oh, this came out when I was like 22. And I'm 40 now. Woo! What year did it come out? It was uh, 25, uh, 2005. So it came out when I was 24. So it's 17 years old. And Rachel McAdams was like brand new rising star at the time. And, you know, now she's been established leading actress for 20 years. Ah, oh, where does the time go? Then we have We Are the Millers, Jason Sudeikis and uh, Jennifer Aniston in a comedy I have never seen before. I actually watched the trailer recently, watched it with my wife. I was like, hey, should we watch this? And I think I own it, and but I haven't seen it quite yet. And now that we're Ted Lasso fans, I don't know if that's a terrible idea since part of the, what she, like, she likes about Ted Lasso is how wholesome it is. And that's probably not the movie that's going to convince her of his wholesomeness. We've got Werewolf, Survive, The Dogs of War, another one of those ones that I got in the uh, horror collection box I have, but haven't watched it yet. Then uh, Willy Wonka and the Char- Char- Chocolate Factory. Blah, 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 blah. Cho- Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, the first rendition of this, the Gene Wilder version of it, the one that I watched growing up many, 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 many times. And apparently my uh, my kids watch it at their in-law, uh, my in-laws, when it, they, they stay at their grandparents' house every month. Apparently they've watched it over there multiple times, which I'm fine with, but I've never watched it with them. And I don't know if that's just because my mother-in-law watched it a lot growing up and she said that to her is like the one that she wants to share with them but I also watched it a lot I just hadn't thought to share it with them but I've got it right there so maybe she even let the kids know you know we have Willy Wonka we can watch that one here and I want to see if you get freaked out at the parts you know when that guy's trying to kill all the kids and when they're on that creepy little boat ride Wizard of Oz the classic classic film that um has been around forever and everybody's been watching forever and ever and uh um Watched Oz the Great and Powerful a couple weeks back. I guess it was just a week ago for my Sam Raimi ranking that I've now brought up one million times in the course of this video. But, um, yeah, uh, I don't have anything to say about it. It's just a generic version of it. The one you can just buy at Best Buy or whatever. Nothing interesting. Willie's Wonderland, the movie where Nicolas Cage works at like a Chuck E. Cheese-esque little place, except the animatronic creatures come to life and kill people and he has to battle them. Such a bizarre concept for a movie he doesn't say much but man Nicolas Cage what a fun performer it's just it'll just go for it with these wacky bonkers concepts what happens in Vegas I've never seen it but apparently my wife watches a lot when I'm not around she loves this movie and I don't think we've ever watched it together Whiplash a movie that takes the idea of competitive jazz drumming and turns it into a compelling, tense film. Once again, another one of these Damien Chazelle films, I would say the best of the Damien Chazelle films, about people pursuing greatness. That's like what is all of his movies seem to be about, people pursuing greatness. And this one finds something just so compelling in content that you would never expect to be really engaging. But it is. We got Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. Haven't seen it yet. Uh, not sure what this one is about was sent to me in my fan mail. Who Framed Roger Rabbit? This is the 25th anniversary edition. The movie's now 35 years old, so fun times. But uh, one of these movies I watched a ton in the 90s creeped me out so much. Uh, the dip, doom, and what happens to that poor little shoe that gets dropped in the dip. But groundbreaking film at the time of combining live action and animation, and now that's like easy. That's what, that's what every movie is with CGI, but back in the day that was a really big deal. Okay, we got a couple copies of The Wolf of Wall Street. One of them's 4K, so it gets to stick around in the collection. So Wolf of Wall Street, I've seen half of it. I put it on one day, you know, one day I was watching through it and I just wasn't going to be able to finish it and I've never finished it, but hopefully this is the year with that Martin Scorsese ranking and um, it was fun. It was interesting. I just uh, it, his movies are so long. The Wolfman. Haven't seen it, um, but I have it. 
Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman 1984. The first one was so good and a movie that was so much better than I expected it to be, so much better than I thought a Wonder Woman could be and having a lot more heart and a lot more thoughtful than I was expecting. And then the second one, when I first watched it, I was so excited about a comic book movie finally coming out that I think I convinced myself it was really good. And then as soon as I thought about it, I was like, oh. This movie's nonsense and weird nonsense. Like, of all the ways to do nonsense, why this? And kind of pretentious. What what is what is this movie trying to do? And why would you pick this? Like, this is this is a baffling film. Why why of all the directions would you would you go in this direction for your plot? We got Wreck It Ralph and Ralph Breaks the Internet. Wreck It Ralph is one of the best Disney movies of the last 20 years. Just such a fun concept that tells a fresh and new original story with new characters while having all these cameos from familiar uh, arcade games. And then the second one was such a disappointment. I was tracking along with it for the first half. And I thought, I was thinking for a little bit, maybe this is better than the first one. And then the, the back half of the movie resolves the main plot line too early. Then it introduces this whole other plot about Ralph's insecurities and a computer virus, and I just thought it was terrible. Like, I don't like it. I find it visually unappealing when that happens, and it's a movie that just goes off the rails. And we will close on out with the Wrong Turn franchise. Movies, I had never seen any of them before last year, and then in my fan mail, some neat sent me the whole series. And so I actually watched all, all of them. I guess there's seven of them with the remake last year. And the first one was a real pleasant surprise because it was like an era, reminded, it was just like a 20-year-old movie that reminded me of that, the horror films of that time period, and Liza Dushku, and then, uh, um, uh, forget the guy's name, was it Desmond? It was on Dexter. It was just like, uh, like, oh, this is a really good little survival film. I dig this. And then there was five direct-to-video sequels to it that was like, just descended into absurdity, eventually descended into like like heavy incest. I mean, the whole thing was incest, but had that incest vibe to it, but like just overt, like, what are you doing? Why, why would you think this is a good idea? And I, I watched all of them, like binged them in a week. So it was, it was a lot of wrong turn in one week. And then they, they did the remake last year that was uh, more of a reimagining than just a remake. Takes it kind of in a very, very different direction than the rest of them. And I, uh, I I dug it well enough. I mean, it wasn't great. It wasn't that good, but it was enjoyable enough. And if you're going to do another wrong turn, I suppose that's the way to, way to bring it back. And that will bring us to the X's. And these are exclusively X-Men movies. I suppose by next year, perhaps I'll own the movie X, in which case this will not be dominated just by X-Men movies, but we will have a movie that is the same letter as... Its title is exclusively the letter which it is in. But uh, our X-Men movies, these are fun ones because most of the... I, well, this is I might be a little bit trickier of a section. So uh, I've got to figure out what to do with some of these. So I've got a lot of steelbooks. They had a sale on them a few years back. So the original X-Men in steelbook. X-Men 2, X2. Ste Open it up and a wrapper for a Reese's peanut butter cup popped out. That's weird. Steelbook. X3, Steelbook, but also received in my fan mail the 4K of them. So that's a tough one. Do you go with the Steelbook? Do you go with the 4K? Let's keep everybody to keep me happy. Then we've got good old-fashioned Blu-ray for X-Men Origins Wolverine. Poor film. Then we have X-Men First Class, Steelbook. Then we have The Wolverine, regular Blu-ray. Uh, is this the is this the R-rated cut on here? Alternate ending. It is not. doesn't look to be the R-rated cut. There is an R-rated cut of this movie that adds some... Well, that's the Rouge cut. Um, what's going on? Why do I not have it? Yeah, it looks like I don't have it. There is... Oh, I don't have an extended... Am I missing something? What is this... I don't have it, the extendo cut. Yeah, just the PG-13, weird. Maybe I have it digital or something like that. But Then we have the Rouge cut for Days of Future Past where they added a, a whole deleted little sequence with Rogue in it, which so if you're gonna put film Rogue for your movie and not put her in it, that was a bit of an odd choice for the theatrical hip cut, but oh well. Then we have 
Steelbook for Deadpool. Another one where my kids love Deadpool, but obviously I can't show them Deadpool, so it's one of those tricky ones. They love his immaturity. They connect with it, but he also makes a lot of jokes that are not appropriate for the children's. Then we have X-Men Apocalypse, regular Blu-ray, no steelbook. Logan, regular Blu-ray, no steelbook. And then uh, two different versions of Deadpool 2, classic Deadpool 2, actually Super Duper Edition with some deleted scenes, and then Once Upon a Deadpool, the PG-13 cut of it with Fred Savage doing the uh, uh, Princess Bride little version of it. My kids have actually seen this version of Deadpool. <laughs> My wife went out of town and uh, went into full dad mode and showed them movies that she might not otherwise want them to watch. But uh, don't tell her that. This is buried deep enough in this that she won't find out about it. She, of course, already knows about this. But, uh, yeah, they, they thoroughly enjoy that Deadpool. And maybe someday they'll watch those other ones with me. Then we've got X-Men Dark Phoenix. Such a disappointing closeout to this. They, uh, st so many things about this are disappointing. Like closing out the first class storyline continuity with this film. Taking the Dark Phoenix material and then also doing Phoenix again, and once again just botching. Just like on every level, it's like, what? What what happened here? How did how is this such a blah finale for all of this? And then we got two different versions of New Mutants. One copy wasn't enough for me, so I've got two. So we'll hold on to the 4K version. And not that it's a great movie, but I think it is overhated. It was like a movie that because it had so many delays, so many rumors of reshoots, shuffling of studios and stuff like that. It just had such bad buzz surrounding it that I think a bunch of people went into it just ready to criticize it. And there's some stuff in it where you can see like something was going on with the editing and tweaking and shuffling around. But um, inside of a genre where we have so many movies, it, it's a little bit different. It does something different with the genre. And I appreciated that. A lot of flaws. There's stuff to appreciate in there, too. Oh, yeah. Actually, I'm going to do this next section together. These last fun... Because I don't have very many of any of these. So, yesterday... This was such a fun little uh, little rom-com fantasy movie where a movie got... Where a guy bonks his head, wakes up, and the no one knows who the Beatles are, but he remembers all their songs, so he starts pretending as if he wrote the songs. And um, it's a weird concept. Doesn't try to explain what happened or anything like that. That's kind of what what makes it kind of a fun little one. But I, I thoroughly enjoy this movie, and I can't wait to see the lead guy in more stuff. Like, he was in Tenet, but I haven't seen him in much, and he was just so good, at, and it just seems like a guy that should have a lot more more roles. Then we have uh, Yummy, another... I don't know what this movie is. It's another one of those horror movies from that uh, box set deal I got. Zath... I guess we made it to the Zs. We've made it to the Zs! We've made it to the final letter! Yes! Yes, we've made it. We're so close. We're so close. And of course, once we finish this, there's actually three more copies of movies, but those should go pretty quickly. Zathura, the um, John Favreau directed film that's actually kind of like a cousin to Jumanji. It's from the same author who did the books. And then it like it was promoted even as from the world of Jumanji. So same kind of concept, board game come to life, but this one in space and from John Favreau. And uh, so it's a fun little one. Kids really like all the Jumanjis out there where films watch them all the time. Zero Dark through the 30, the Catherine Bigelow little war film with a Chris Pratt. Had to get jacked for this one. I've only seen it one time. Need to watch it again. Uh, I say that a lot in here, don't I? But uh, yeah, just a real tense little film that kind of gives you a very different perspective on war and torture and really reminds you like torture's not there's not like a version of, like, I watched the show 24 and, and loved it. And there's a ton of torture in it. And it's like the romanticized version of torture of like, there's a bomb somewhere in town. That guy knows where it is. And if I torture him, he'll tell me where the bomb is. And so the guy gets tortured and it's kind of like, yeah, that evil guy is trying to kill a bunch of people. Torture him so we can find that thing over there. And then you watch Zero Dark Thirty and you're like, every time the heroes are torturing someone, you're like, Ugh, torture's not as much fun as I thought. I thought torture was supposed to be amazing. But torture, as it turns out, is awful. Who would have guessed? Maybe that's not the best way to get information from people. 
Then we got Zombieland, the um, zombie movie from the writers that went on to go do Deadpool. And when you realize the timeline of things that they they did Zombieland, and that's when Ryan Reynolds was like, "All right, let's do a let's do a Deadpool movie." And the script had been around for years and years and years and years before the movie got made because they didn't the studio didn't want to greenlight it, and it was like they those guys wrote it, and you you watch Zombieland, and you can see why those guys would be perfect to end up doing uh, Deadpool. And just self-referential, meta humor, just a lot of fun while playing into the trope. So just the perfect mix. Zodiac, the David Fincher movie about the Zodiac killer. And I hadn't seen it before until uh, when I did my David Fincher ranking a couple years back. And so it was a, a pretty cool little movie of just, uh, as it goes along, I thought it got better and better. And you got more and more invested in the the investigation and everything that was was going on. Related to it. We got Zola, a movie that came out last year. And uh, another one got sent to me in my fan mail from the Daniel Skinner. And uh, I saw the trailer and it didn't seem one, it didn't pop out to me as I didn't know what would make it appeal to me. So I, I didn't end up going. So I was probably invited to a press screen for it, but it just didn't didn't seem like it. Daniel Skinner told me that I would like it, but I asked him why. And he didn't, he didn't, he didn't tell me why I specifically would like it. And he told me, I don't want to spoil anything. I was like, okay, wait, you're not, you got to sell me on the movie though. You got to have some way to sell me on it. Then we have Zoolander. Oh, I didn't realize this got got to do my epic opening of it. This is the last time we're gonna do this for the video. I realize I got a I got a steel book right here that's still in the plastic. For one of my favorite comedies, Zoolander, fresh out of the plastic steel book. One last steel book for our video we've been watching. Uh, just one of my, what a great little comedy. Just a, a movie just jam-packed with energy that uh, so, so much fun. Actually, well, the, uh, that is our, our official last normal movie of the set. I'll call that the last movie uh, for our main section. We, we got a bunch of collections after this. We got more stuff we're going to talk about, but that's the last of the letters. Zoolander closed it out. <sighs> We are getting really close to finishing this video. Okay, for the last little section on here, we've got a bunch of collections and then TV show sets. So, my collections, I mean, three different movies in a pack together. So, Body of Lies, Edge of Darkness, Pride and Glory. Haven't, haven't seen these two. I'm not sure what this one is. Edge of Darkness is a Martin Campbell thriller this just uber, uber dark film that's uh, like a revenge thriller, but not a not little bit of action, but not really an action, just like dark, dark film that it was actually a remake of a series that he did for the, I believe, the BBC. Then we had a double pack of Bloodsport and Time Cop, two of the best Van Damme films, and showing the two sides of his career of when he did pure martial arts films like Bloodsport, a bunch of tournament fighters with a kickboxer, and then when he did more like action movies with martial arts in them, like Time Cop, and those are two of the best of each of those categories. And if you're looking for introductions to the Van Damme career, those those are two that I would recommend. Like, you want to check out, like, his martial arts tournament movies? Bloodsport's the one to go for it. If you want to see kind of his more kind of mainstream action movies that aren't just pure martial arts, Time Cop if you like sci-fi, or if you just want straight action, go with Hard Target, which was directed by the John Woo. Then we have a triple feature, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, and Freddy vs. Jason on the Blu-ray. And, um... I don't know if I remember. It was, it's the... What was it? Yeah, this has the extended cut of Friday the 13th as well. And I thought there was a, something special about... Maybe it wasn't in this set. I thought there was something special about Freddy vs. Jason, but that's my copy of Freddy vs. Jason. Then we got a four-pack with Ninja Assassin, Domino, Executive Decision, Blood Diamond. And Executive Decision, that's a, a fun little... Um, it's... It's like a movie about a plane that's taken hostage and people have to like sneak around to try and free the hostages and stuff um, with Kurt Russell. It was it, like it starts off like it's going to be a Seagal vehicle 
and then that's not what it is at all. And it was like the one of the few times it like teases the career that Seagal could have had if he didn't have such an ego and it could have been a much more like aging gracefully type thing of like, yeah, he can't do what he used to do, but he can still be in movies. And instead he decided to do something different. And finally, we the last movie of the trilogy of uh, Nicolas Cage action movies from the 90s. Face Off, the one directed by John Woo, as well as Snake Eyes from Brian De Palma. But Face Off was the one that falls into that action movie category. So got all three of them on the Blu-ray. We got three horror films, The Possession, Cabin in the Woods, and Sinister. I haven't actually seen these two. Cabin in the Woods is a fun one because it's like a send-up of Cabin in the Woods movies while being a Cabin in the Woods movie. And it was a... It start, they filmed it before Chris Hemsworth became... Chris Hemsworth movie star and so then he's in this movie that you would expect him to be in because they shot it like two years before it came out then we have a three pack of The Losers A History of Violence Jota Hex and Watchmen all four are actually comic adaptations from DC Comics and you know people know well none of them are like the high profile ones but all of them are actually released by DC and like even A History of Violence is actually based off of a comic book then we got a uh, double pack of uh, Mercury Rising and The Jackal. And I'd never seen The Jackal until this one was sent to me uh, by uh, some neat who I mentioned multiple times in here. I actually saw Mercury Rising um, in the theater when it first came out. Fun fact, on my first movie webpage back in the late 90s, when I was still in high school, I wrote a review for Mercury Rising on there. It's barely literate. Then we got a three pack of John Grisham adaptations. And uh, I don't, I don't, the client, I didn't think it was actually, it, it hasn't aged well, but the Pelican Brief and a Time to Kill are both really, really good. Uh, in particular, Time to Kill was a Joel Schumacher film. Joel Schumacher is infamous for directing those Batman movies with nipples on the bat suits, but he's actually just a great, very versatile director. Like when he did fun movies, they'd be campy and goofy, but then he did a drama, it'd be very serious. Then we got a double pack of Shooter and the Four Brothers. Shooter is a thriller, uh, just a, a Antoine Fuqua action film that is just right up my alley. Just nice. Like the type of movie, like I want to put something on simple to like go to bed movie for me. Shooter is one that I put on. <laughs> what helps me sleep? Sniper fire. That's it. Uh, and Mark Wahlberg's beautiful voice. Then we got a three pack of Entrapment, Broken Arrow, and Speed, all movies that are, are fun for very different reasons, with Entrapment being like a heist movie with teaming up Sean Connery in one of his last roles and with Catherine Zeta-Jones when she was on the rise, and then Broken Arrow, a John Woo movie with Jonathan Travolta right around when he did Face Off, right around when uh, you know, during that trilogy of Nicolas Cage movies. So, um, just a high energy movie and then with speed we've already talked about. And we got uh, double pack, two pack of El Mariachi and Desperado, the first two movies in the Mariachi trilogy. And uh, Desperado is just, that is a, that is an action movie right there. That is just like young Robert Rodriguez energy where he finally had a budget to kind of do what he wanted, heavily influenced by John Woo's Hong Kong work. Yeah, super stylized, fun music, very cool movie. This will, will ties us back to our original one about where we talked about Three from Hell, a movie I have not seen, as well as these other two movies in the set. Was it the Firefly Family? Family? What is it? I, I, I haven't seen it, so I don't know. But anyway, someday I got to watch these ones. I, I've heard good things about them. I, I think I have. Maybe I'm making that up. Maybe I'm just trying to be positive. Then we got four family movies Where the Wild Things Are, Legends of the Guardians. Space Jam and Yogi Bear. Haven't seen these two, but uh, those two we've already talked about in here. Woo! Then we got a couple of great Jim James Carey films. The Mask and Dumb and Dumber. I actually did a Jim Carey top 10 not too long ago, but man, those movies, both these movies came out in 94 when I was in middle school, and that guy just went straight. Like, everyone my age, everyone in my middle school, that guy went from, oh, yeah, that guy from In Living Cover 2. This guy's one of my favorite actors in the course of Ace Ventura in these two movies. Just whoosh, loved that guy afterwards. Then we have a pair of um, adaptations of horror classics with Bram Stoker's Dracula and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I've actually never seen either one of them. Movies, I've seen parts of both of them. Remember when they came out, but I have not watched either one of them from beginning to end. 
We got a three pack of seven. We already talked about that one. Devil's Advocate, which I have not seen yet, and Insomnia, the Christopher Nolan movie that is not based off a Christopher Nolan idea or a Batman movie, but a remake of a Ford film. It was basically his way to sh- prove to the studio that he can work in the studio system and work with big actors. And because Insomnia was good, they went, okay, we can trust you with Batman. That's kind of what happened. It's not quite that simple. It's an oversimplification, but it's kind of like that. Then we have uh, 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 Edgar Wright's Cornetto trilogy, three movies where he took on different uh, subgenres that he loved, zombies, action movies, and end-of-the-world films, and uh, played them through this set of characters. And uh, It's not a trilogy in the sense of it has the same characters, but all have the same vibe, all have Simon Pegg and um, uh, Nick Frost. And um, you probably have seen them before, if you know what, I'm, if you're familiar with these. Then we have a five pack of Van Damme films, like a totally random set of Van Damme films. And that'll bring us to the section where we get to mostly TV shows and a few other things in here. But Swamp Thing, the TV show, I've heard great things about it. I haven't had time to watch it yet. Just one of those ones of. Uh, a victim of its own cancellation of if it hadn't been canceled, I'd be more interested in checking it out because I've heard good things, but if it's not going to keep going, you kind of like, why am I watching this? Then we got, um, these aren't all in order. These got, it must've been dropped or kids messed with them. We got the whole TV show of Gotham and I've watched almost all of Gotham except the last season. And so, um, hopefully one of these days I can finally watch through the whole set of them finish the show but it's tough what's what's tough with some of these is that like I, I watched watch you watch it a show that's kind of serialized and builds off itself and it's not like I can just pick up where I left off because too many years have passed so I feel like I would have to restart from the beginning and then it turns into all right do I have time to watch 70 hours of Gotham just to finish it that's what keeps happening to me that stops me from finishing a bunch of these shows uh, then we got a couple of Arrowverse seasons with complete Arrow season four and the Flash season two, which feels very random to have those two specific ones and not seasons one and two. But sometimes that's the way the cookie crumbles. Then this is the first of two sets of Avatar that uh, Daniel Skinner sent me all of Avatar. And then the next month he sent me Avatar as well as Legend of Korra. So we'll get to the other one. Actually, it's right here. I can just grab it. Uh, so I've started to watch through this and I'm actually starting to write notes to do some coverage of it because it's uh, such a well-beloved show that so many people say plenty positive things about, but I haven't watched it. I, I haven't seen all of it. I've seen about season one and I've got notes, but once again, I watched it a while ago and I got busy and I couldn't finish watching all of it. So I, to finish it, I need to go back and start over again to, 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 to do it right. Then we got, uh, this one actually, I guess, belonged to that other section with the movies, but three-pack of Scorsese films, Aviator, Goodfellas, and Departed. I haven't seen Aviator, have seen these two, um, but uh, uh, Goodfellas in particular, it's been a long time since I watched so I'm looking forward to re-watching that one. And then, what do we have here? Okay, these must have been, kids must have played with these ones, but we got a double pack of White House down and Olympus Has Fallen, the two uh, White House invasion films. As I mentioned before, I prefer Olympus Has Fallen, White House Is Down. I've only seen it once. Maybe I would change my mind if I watched it a second time. I need to watch this one a lot. Uh, The Chosen, people have been asking me about it like crazy. And even my good friend, Durbin, uh, who I used to collaborate with quite a bit early on, um, he got a full-time job working on the YouTube channel for The Chosen, but I haven't I haven't watched it yet. So especially being in church world, need to make that happen. Then we have V for Vendetta, another copy of Watchmen Director's Cut. That's the third copy we found in here in Constantine. And this is another one I got sent in my fan mail. And when I did my um, DC all rank movies ranked last year, that was super helpful. Then we have a 10 pack of action movies. So just a whole bunch of random different action films uh, from Doom to Born... Uh, that's not born. Born Identity right there. Atomic Blonde, American Made, all over the place, but a bunch of them. Then we got Hancock, Hellboy, and Ghost Rider. Uh, these two we've already covered. Hancock is a movie that's like the first half is amazing, and then it's like the last third is like a bad sequel tacked on. Then we got two we already talked about before in here. Black uh, Hawk Down and Zero Dark Thirty, and then Fury, another one that I haven't seen. I think it was on another one of these multi-packs. Final stretch, if I can do this in, all, in my last minute and a half I have before my camera cuts off. We got this collection of Steven Seagal movies. I got in a Steven Seagal movie, I think, during like COVID lockdown. I was like, I need to watch some Steven Seagal. And so then it's like all the best ones. The Understage movies, Hard to Kill, uh, 
consecutive decision and above the law all in one little pack right there. So had a lot of fun with that a couple years back. Need to watch more of those. Oh, here we got we got more arrow. Com Okay, complete second season of Arrow, not complete. Okay, got scared there that I had two copies of season two, and that would have been horrifying. I would never want to own two copies of a Blu-ray. That would never happen, besides all those over there. Justified season one. This is a great little show, and there's apparently doing another season, so I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna, I'm gonna start rewatching all those to try and get caught up on all of it before the show um, kicks back up. Uh, I never finished it. another one where I, I watched the first season loved it but then too much time passed before like season five happened so i was like i don't have to rewatch the whole thing to be able to do this i don't want to do that so it didn't happen then we have person of interest season one and two this is a cool show christopher nolan's brother came up with the concept for it as part of the jj abrams movie so uh, uh tv shows great concept that i thoroughly enjoyed the run of that one and finally we have the final season of small Bill as the final collection in the set so you've made it to the very end of my epic Blu-ray collection. If you've made it to this point, join me down in the comment section with Watermelon as the final badge of honor that you completed the quest, watched the whole thing, post the image of a watermelon, write the word watermelon. If you've made it thus far, you've earned the right to comment watermelon down below to let me know that you watched the entire epic, epic thing that I don't know how long the edit will be for this, but it is officially over 12 hours since I started recording. Um, it is, is, I thought it was going to be eight hours. It turned out to be over 12 hours. It took much longer than I expected. I talked much longer. I don't know. It'll, and normally the edit down will be much shorter than this, and, but still also not short by any stretch of anyone's imagination. All right, I added up the total number of movies as I went along. And a total number of sets, discs, is tough to say, not discs. Because some of those, like, you know, Apocalypse Now had like eight discs. I counted those one. But other ones where they had multiple kind of discs in it, I did count it as multiple things, as uh, cases, multiple cases in a case. I might count that as multiple. So how do you count it? I don't know. But, uh, you know, Blue Season of a, uh, 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 you know, all those collections at the end, I counted those as one. Smallville Final Season, that's one. Those collections with 10 action movies, that's one. But how many total did I count with the way I decided to count it? I went with 892 total containers of Blu-rays in there. I did include the Superman set, which is DVDs. Cheated just a little bit, but it's too special to me to not include Superman all right, this is the end. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to track along with what additional Blu-rays I pick up each month, on my second channel, I do Blu-ray haul videos. So you can kind of see a mini version of this almost every single month that are more palatable at only about 10 or 15 minutes long. Also, I did a behind the scenes video where basically all day long I've been documenting this. Since an hour and a half before I hit record, I started documenting the way I reshaped my room in here, the way I collected the, the Blu-rays, what I was up to between the different takes, picking up my kids, playing Fortnite, a bunch of stuff like that. So if you want to see the behind the scenes of what it was like and my mental state when I wasn't talking about stuff, you can check that out right over here. Hopefully I'll have that up ready to go by the time this goes up. Thank you so much for watching all of this very, very long video means the world to me, in particular a video like this that is not easy to make. And so that you cared enough to watch all the hours, all the time that went into this. 